16. Trav, said Marion, her arm tightly around me. It was a new and wonderful sensation. Let's go ice skating. It sounded cold, and I'd just gotten warm after my dip in the West Bethel Pond. Ice skating? It's how I'd like to celebrate, she said. I'd never been ice skating before, and the very thought, well, chilled me. I'd done plenty of roller skating with my old youth group, and Marion insisted it wasn't that much different. I suppose she had visions of us skating in tandem like those Olympic figure skating duos, arm in arm, one leg stretched out straight behind us, and our smiling faces turned directly into a sixty-mile-an-hour wind while stirring orchestra music came out of the sky. I had serious doubts that vision would ever come true, but hey, I'd gotten her father's blessing. My folks were ecstatic. She was wearing the ring. I'd been thrown in the pond. What else was there? We went skating. We did skate arm in arm our first time out, mostly to keep me from falling and making a fool of myself for in front of all those little kids on the rink who could skate circles around me. The first half hour or so I tried to enjoy it. Marion was having the time of her life. After an hour I really did begin to have fun, and my progress earned me a kiss once we were safely stopped and gripping the side rail. After another hour and a cup of cider in the cafe, I stepped up to Marion, bowed with a flourish, and said, May I have this lap? She graciously accepted, extending her hand, and we managed to work our way around the rink several times, my arm around her waist and my other hand in hers. Kind of like dancing, but it was skating. And that's different. The music over the sound system was rock and roll and not very stirring. We weren't sticking one leg out straight behind, and I wouldn't say we were graceful. But I remember the moment it connected for me. We were coming around the turn near the cafe for the zillionth time. Her face was so young, so close. I was holding her hand. The cafe was passing behind her in a soft blur. There was a light in her eyes and a special smile that told me, I'm yours. It's going to be us now, you and me, and I couldn't be happier. When we stepped off the ice to sit down and rest, she thought I had something in my eye and I was too embarrassed to tell her I'd gotten all emotional out there. That look. I could actually feel the depth of her joy, the laughter in her heart. Our love became real in that moment. I could finally believe it. Ever since that night in the hospital waiting room, I never believed that such a lady as this would so gladly accept my love and love me in return. I just didn't feel that lucky or that blessed, and I still thought I had to be dreaming when I saw that ring on her hand. But that moment, when she gave me that one special look, I knew. I finally knew. She would give me that one special look the day of our wedding. I would receive it across the breakfast table almost every morning and from the front pew every time I preached, year after year. I would look for it and find it each night as she rested on her pillow and reached to turn off the lamp. I would always catch a glimpse of it when I took one hand from the steering wheel to grasp hers for just a moment. It spoke volumes without a word. It was life to me. To the end, it never faltered, and before she slipped away, she summoned it once again for one fleeting instant, grasping my hand. But this was the first time I saw it, and I can see it even now. Marion and I waited two years to get married. It gave us time to test the relationship and decide if we could really stick together for the long haul. It gave us time to finish our schooling, mine at West Bethel and hers at a business college. It encouraged discipline and diligence in our lives. It almost drove us crazy. It was a good policy, however, especially for me. Having been bowled over and burned by love before, I was able to think just a shade more clearly, even while I climbed the walls. Sister Dudley kept her eye on us, so we found times and places where God could watch, but she couldn't. Brother Smith didn't seem to worry, and we gave him nothing to worry about. She graduated in 1976 and worked until I graduated in June of 1977. A week later, we were married in the Baptist church Marion's family attended. The daughter of a Baptist marrying a flaming Pentecostal. She was giddy with excitement, and I wasn't even nervous. Marion's sister, Lisa, was her maid of honor. 
My brother, Steve, was my best man. By now, Dad was back in the ministry, and he performed the ceremony. With obvious pride, he pointed out to everyone that I was graduating, marrying, and taking my first pastoring position all in the same year, just as he did over thirty years before. As we stood in the reception line greeting our guests, it was like having my whole life pass before me. Two old friends from the mountain, Victrola, showed up. The mandolin player was pumping concrete for a living and had a baby daughter. The Dobro player was now a partner with his brother in the fruit and produce business. My old friend Vern had married Susan, the gal with the shrill voice, and they were still attending Christian Chapel. She was expecting, and his hair was getting thin. Mrs. Kenyon was still beyond plump, but had finally quit smoking and was attending a charismatic Episcopal church in Seattle. Her son, David, who first introduced me to the Kenyon Bannister praise meetings, was pastoring a small church in Chehalis, Washington, married and raising two kids. Carla Dickens, still wearing glasses, was married to an accountant and had a daughter. Andy Smith, the diabetic, was divorced and teaching at an avant-garde music school in Seattle. Clay Olson was about to leave for the mission field in Kenya. Benny Taylor was still a long, tall, nerdy-looking fellow, still brilliant, and hoping to get a job with a little garage-sized company called Microsoft. Harold Martin, our born-again purveyor of pot, wasn't there, and I couldn't find anyone who knew where he was. Brother Smith kissed the bride, shook my hand, and said, I'm at least as happy as you are. Sister Dudley gave Marion a gushing, loving hug. I expected she would just shake my hand and move on, but she grabbed my shoulders, pulled me into a hug, and gave me a peck on the cheek. Then she told me, You're gonna love it, and winked. She was right. We loved it. We took our honeymoon in two shifts, first in Ben's parents' cabin on Kameno Island in Puget Sound, and then in Victoria, B.C., after that, we moved into a little apartment on a busy artery in Seattle. On the first Sunday in July, we dressed up nice, walked into a struggling Pentecostal mission church in Seattle, and began our ministry. The year that followed was a greater education than the previous four. We learned things they never taught us in Bible school, probably because no one ever lived to come back and tell us about it. Did I say it was a struggling church? That's incorrect. The pastor was struggling. The church was content. The pastor was Olin Marvin, an old Bible school chum of dad's who contacted me only a month before graduation. Hey, come aboard, he told me. We need fresh blood, someone with vision, someone with the old Jordan fire. Marion and I figured this was the hand of God. The only other offer I'd had was from a church in Pocatello, Idaho, and that seemed so far away from our friends and family that we hesitated. When Pastor Marvin offered us a position with a good salary and an apartment right in our own neck of the woods, that sounded right. I would take charge of the youth program, he said. I would preach on Sunday nights, and he and I would be like partners in ministry. Marion wouldn't have to work so she could be as involved in the church as she desired. In the intense days before graduation and the wedding, Marion and I talked about our upcoming ministry as if it were a done deal a plan set in stone, the will of God. We would be married, we'd settle down in Seattle, and then be part of a marvelous move of God. Almost every night I lay in bed, imagining what it would be like to preach to a whole room full of young people. I envisioned hundreds coming forward to receive Christ while Marion played the piano, and everyone sang an invitational song, something like, Just As I Am. I could hear myself holding forth on Sunday nights, See myself helping Pastor Marvin lead his church into revival, awakening, and explosive growth. I had ideas, 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 and couldn't wait to implement them. We were going to take the city for Christ. On the first Sunday in July, there was no revival or explosion, but there was an awakening. Northwest Pentecostal Mission was a generally unheard-of little chapel nestled in the center of a closely packed Seattle neighborhood. Without detailed directions through that complicated grid of streets, you'd never find it, and I suppose there were many folks who never did. Pastor Marvin met us at the door, informed us there would be a board meeting immediately after the morning service, and then hurried away. It was Sunday morning, and he was understandably busy. The sanctuary was pretty standard. 
Dark, glue beams forming a sharp A-line roof. Red carpet running up the center aisle and down the sides. A soaring chancel with a big cross hanging over the baptistry. The pews could hold about two hundred. The Sunday school rooms were in the basement. The undersized parking lot was on one side. When the Sunday school hour began, everyone, adults, teens, and little kids, gathered in the sanctuary for opening exercises, singing songs like, Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. Hmm and hmm, hmm and hmm. There's a fountain flowing, hmm and hmm, hmm and hmm, hmm and hmm. There's a fountain flowing, hmm and hmm. Marion had attended Baptist Sunday School, and I had gone to Pentecostal Mission Sunday School. But we both knew that song and had friends from other denominations who also knew it. Our parents probably sang it in Sunday School, opening exercises just like we did. Now we were beholding the next generation of deep and widers, singing the song and doing the deep and wide hand motions. It boggled my mind to think that kids all over North America, maybe even the entire Western Hemisphere, were hmm and humming this very moment, or according to their respective time zones. It also occurred to me that adults and teenagers all over North America were sitting in opening exercises with the little kids, doing that song for the zillionth time and feeling silly. We were sitting in the back. I scanned the pews for the young people. The best place to look was either in the very back or as far as anyone could sit to the side. I counted about twelve, including two silly girls, two stoics, and three outsiders, cool guys making a statement by slouching together as far away from the proceedings as possible. We sang a few more standards, Stop and Let Me Tell You What the Lord Has Done for Me, and Climb, Climb Up Sunshine Mountain. Then the lady in charge brought out the big plywood figure of Barney Barrel. Barney, a wooden barrel, had long, skinny arms that formed a tipping scale with a coffee can hanging from each hand, and it was his job to collect the missionary offering. Today it would be the girls against the boys. Sister Marvin, the pastor's wife, played the piano. We all marched around the room. The girls put their offering in the pink can, and the boys put their offering in the blue. Today the girls won. I saw which one put in the roll of pennies. Clever kid. Finally, we dismissed to our classes. Pastor Marvin would be teaching the adult class in the sanctuary, but Marion and I wanted to check out the teenagers in their classroom in the basement. We followed the outsiders downstairs and into a small, windowless, echoing room with folding chairs, a low table, and a chalkboard. The rest of the kids straggled in, talking and giggling among themselves, but obviously a little quieter since two strangers were in the room. Not one of them said hello or asked us who we were. I wasn't about to let them get away with that. Hi, I said, jutting out my hand. Praise God, I'm Travis, and this is Marion. The first kid shook my hand and said hi back, looking immediately at the floor. What's your name? I heard him mumble something like, Burn. I leaned closer. I knew I was invading his comfort zone, but that was the idea. Say again? He spoke up a little. Brian? We went after the outsiders. Hallelujah! Who are you? Donnie and Steve barely got their names out, but Trevor spoke right up with his. Trevor seemed to be the leader. As soon as he opened up, the other two did. I found out what grade they were in and what some of their interests were. In the meantime, Marion had struck up conversations with the girls. It was going well when the teacher finally arrived. She was a young, curly-headed gal. She took one look at us and said, Hi, who are you? Praise the Lord, I said, reaching over some chairs and kids' shoulders to shake her hand. Travis and Marion Jordan. I'm Lucy Moore. It's nice to have you visiting with us today. Then she said with a chuckle, Are you sure you're in the right class? You bet, I said. I'm the new youth pastor. She looked at me blankly for a second, then smiled and shook her head. No, you're not. Then she dove into the lesson like a wind-up toy with the spring too tight and never made eye contact with us again. Marion and I sat there quietly, hesitant to say another word. I shot a glance at Trevor. He just gave me a shrug. And there was the strangest smell in that room. 
like someone left a dirty diaper under a chair. I saw a few noses wrinkle, but nobody said anything, and I wasn't about to. It was actually a relief when Pastor Marvin had us stand during the morning service so he could introduce us. I'd like you all to meet Travis and Mary Jordan, our new assistant pastor. They'll be helping us out with the youth program and whatever else his hand finds to do, so make him welcome. He got Marion's name wrong, but at least we knew we were in the right church. What's he doing here? A board member asked before Pastor Marvin even got his office door closed. Pastor Marvin sat down at his desk and answered like a cornered witness. Well, we did discuss this, Bill. Bill, a wiry, curly-haired man in his fifties, had veins that stuck out on his forehead. But I think his eyes may have been sticking out a bit, too. You didn't discuss it with me. I didn't know he was coming today, said a shorter, thinner, younger man. Bill glared at the younger man. So he told you about it? He said we might try someone out. That's all I heard. Well, I should have told you he was coming today, said Pastor Marvin. It's my fault. You shouldn't have even invited him without consulting with the board. Bill, said an older man with a lower lip that stuck out. We have talked about it. We've talked about it. We have not approved it. Pastor Marvin broke in. Gentlemen, before we start the meeting, I should introduce Travis and Mary to you. Marion, I corrected. Oh, I am sorry. This is Travis and Marion Jordan. Travis recently graduated from West Bethel. Then Pastor Marvin formally introduced us to Bill Braun, the angry one, Ted Newbar, the younger, thin one, and Wally Barker, the older one with the lip. Uh, where's Rod? Ted answered. He and Marcy had to go right home. Trevor messed in his pants again. Bill rolled his eyes. Oh, great, Wally explained to us. Trevor's a weird kid. He messes in his pants. He doesn't need to know that. Well, he does if he's taking the youth. Well, what about Lucy? Has she been told about this? No, I thought. Ted answered. She was pretty upset when I talked to her. She said he came into her class and tried to take over. What? I said. We did no such thing. Marion objected. Ted continued. She's the one in charge of the youth right now. Nobody told her these two were coming. Nobody told anybody anything. Bill snapped. See? Now you've hurt Lucy. Well, said Pastor Marvin, why don't we open in a word of prayer? Dear Lord, let us live, I prayed silently, clutching Marion's hand. The moment Pastor Marvin said amen, Bill spoke the first words of the formal meeting. And you announced his appointment from the pulpit before we've even met him or got to know him. I knew your dad, Wally told me with a smile. How is he doing anyway? Does he have another job? Bill asked. We'll get to that, said the pastor. This was something we talked about. Remember, Wally, you're the accountant. Tell him. Again. Wally's face turned sad as he told the pastor. We can't swing a full-time salary, especially since we've lost the Cravens and the Johnsons. We told you that, Pastor Marvin defended himself. I think we can do it, if he has another job. Bill reiterated, and then he looked at me and cocked his eyebrows, expecting an answer. Now they were all looking at me. I... I understood that this was going to be my job. What skills do you have besides Bible college? The question stung, not only because it was mean-spirited, but because of how I had to answer. I don't have any. Get some. Now, Bill, the pastor tried to admonish. Bill came right back. I'm being honest. He can't work in a church this size and expect a big church salary package. That's the truth of it. Who's paying for the apartment? Ted asked. Bill's voice approached a squawk. What apartment? We discussed that as part of the package, said Pastor Marvin. He has an apartment? It went on and on, with Marion and I cowering in our chairs, while the pastor and the board argued right in front of us. I've never had such an experience before or since then, watching my hopes dash to pieces while almost laughing at the absurdity of it. Finally, I suggested, Why don't Marion and I leave so you can discuss this freely among yourselves? Yeah, fine, said Bill. 
Okay, said the pastor. We got up to leave. Bill didn't even watch us go. If he can get another job, then maybe we can work something out. My shift began at 9 p.m., as soon as the mall closed. My first task every night was to scrub and shine all the public restrooms. The toilets came first, then the sinks, then the stalls, walls, and floors. My supervisor said each restroom shouldn't take more than an hour, but after a week on the job I had yet to cut my time down to less than two. I was working four nights a week and making five bucks an hour. The toughest toilets to clean were the ones that got clogged sometime during the day, but patrons kept using them anyway until the bowl was full. Then the only way to clean them was to ladle the stuff into a bucket, get the toilet unclogged, and ladle it back in again, flushing it down in smaller loads. When I finished, I headed outside to get some air, laughing at the sign on the back of the restroom door, Employees must wash hands before returning to work. This toilet in the North Men's Room was the worst I'd seen all week. I flushed the last load and grabbed the toilet brush out of my tool cart. Under my meticulous care, the porcelain bowl would soon be white again. With her business degree, Marion had landed a good job as an accountant and office manager for a small firm that manufactured hydraulic valves and couplings. Suffice it to say, she was making better money than I was, and providing the bulk of our living, including the apartment the church decided it couldn't afford. What skills do you have besides Bible college? I wanted to slug that guy. Did he think four years of college counted for nothing? Well, apparently it qualified me to scrub toilets and sinks, refill soap containers and towel dispensers, and mop the floors. Come on, let's go, let's go. Let's get it down to an hour. I moved to the next stall. Ah, the last patron's mother had taught him well. This wouldn't take long. My emotions and thoughts kept shifting back and forth from minute to minute. First I felt okay about it. As weird, disappointing, and even maddening as it seemed, I accepted this as God's calling. He was using this time to humble me. I needed to accept and embrace it. I needed to stay put and see it through. Then I thought of Minneapolis and the well-dressed man with the curly hair and the lady in the white silk blouse and navy skirt. After so many years, the image still made my stomach hurt. I felt like I was standing in that office again, unqualified, unfit, inadequate, a loser. What skills do you have besides Bible college? The answer was the toilet brush in my hand. Come on, Trav. Two more stalls to go. God was in control. He knew what he was doing, and he knew what I needed. Then my heart sank and my arms went limp. I'd failed again. I'd married the most beautiful woman in the world, given her high hopes, and let her down. She was the one supporting us, not me. I thought I was going to take the city for Christ, and now here I was, alone and scrubbing toilets in the middle of the night. My position at Northwest Pentecostal Mission remained undefined by the pastor or the board. I wasn't associate pastor or youth pastor, I didn't preach on Sunday nights, and Lucy Moore still had charge of the youth Sunday school class. I did whatever was left to do. It was up to me to think of what that was, and I got paid fifty dollars a month plus a gas allowance to do it. I think Pastor Marvin tried to apologize once, but his expression of regret quickly shifted into a short homily about the Lord using all this to show me the importance of sacrifice. It seemed rather convenient for him to find a lofty, inscrutable purpose of God in his foul-up. But I held my peace. The church in Pocatello, Idaho, had found someone else for that position. I checked. 17. It was Marion, God bless her, who helped me turn it around, or rather, turn myself around. I still remember the evening I lay on the couch with my head in her lap. I had tears in my eyes, but she just stroked my hair and told me, Travis, you're a man of God, and this is your calling. Don't worry about me having to work. Just be faithful. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. God will do the rest. She tilted my head toward her and I looked up into her eyes. And I will always love you, TJ. You're my man. 
and don't you forget it. I called Lucy Moore and apologized for all the misunderstanding. I didn't want to take over, I told her. I just wanted to help. Could I? She said, sure. At work that night, I finished up each restroom in less than an hour. Wednesday evening, one of my nights off, Marion and I showed up to help Lucy with the youth meeting. I played guitar and helped lead the singing. We goaded and challenged the kids during discussion times. We did anything we could to help while letting Lucy be the boss. It clicked. Before long, we were all team teaching the Sunday school class. We worked together planning a camping trip to Corral Pass, and it came off without a hitch. After I'd been on the job two months, the boss let me try my hand at the big mall sweeper. Now, that was fun, driving that thing up and down the vast floor, buzzing past all the store windows and around the big central pillars, singing praise songs only the Lord could hear. How many shoppers ever got a chance to visit the mall as I did? For the first month, I took care of mowing the church lawn, and then Lucy, Marion, and I organized a work day for the youth group to mow, weed, and fix up the church grounds. The kids did a great job, and we were proud of them. I rewarded them by taking them all swimming. Sister Marvin heard that some of the girls wore two-piece swimsuits and walked right by the groomed lawn to give me a stern rebuke. It was the first feedback I'd gotten from her. The Sunday school class was perking up. We got into heavy discussions about morality, sex, authority, respect for others, honesty, and what the scriptures had to say about it all. The kids opened up about school, friends, parents, hopes and fears, what was cool and what wasn't. We talked about Bible prophecy and how it could apply to happenings in the Middle East. Even Trevor and the outsiders got wrapped up in it. They talked about inviting their friends. When they didn't invite their friends, I asked them why not. They said they didn't want their friends to have to sing deep and wide and climb, climb up Sunshine Mountain and march up front to put money in Barney Barrel. Well, that seemed an easy enough problem to overcome. I told Lucy, hey, why don't we just have them come straight to class and not sit through the opening exercises? They never get anything out of them anyway. Lucy balked. Um, we'll have to talk to Sister Dwight. She's the Sunday school superintendent. Sister Dwight didn't jump at the idea either. You'll have to bring it up at the next Sunday school teachers meeting. The meeting was after church, the first Sunday of the month. We were there and we brought it up. And that's how I got to know Sister Roggenbeck. She was an ancient lady who taught the primary class, and by the look on her face, you'd think we suggested denying the virgin birth and the resurrection. She scolded me as she answered, The children are to be together for the morning exercises. Being young and inexperienced, I tried to reason with her. Well, that's okay for the little kids, but the teenagers don't have any interest in that stuff then they can learn to have interest. You think kids who listen to the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin are going to want to come here to sing deep and wide? She crossed her arms and looked toward the front of the sanctuary. They belong in the morning exercises with everyone else. From her body language, I gathered she thought the discussion was over. It wasn't. Do you agree with her? I asked Sister Dwight. Sister Dwight gave me a deep, slow nod, as if the word of the Lord had come down from Mount Sinai. But aren't you the Sunday school superintendent? She was mildly offended. Of course I am. I turned to Sister Roggenbeck. So what are you? She didn't answer, but just kept looking forward, her arms crossed. Look at me. Marion tugged at my arm, but I ignored it and demanded, Look at me! Sister Dwight became indignant. Travis, I don't think this is appropriate. Sister Rockenbeck's head and eyes turned toward me only as much as necessary. Are you the Sunday school superintendent? I asked her. Sister Marvin's indignity surpassed that of Sister Dwight. Travis, Jordan, that will be quite enough. Are you? No. Do you hold any elected office whatsoever in this church? No. Then who are you to sit there and dictate policy to the rest of us? Trav? Marion whispered, tugging at me. My question was addressed to the Sunday school superintendent, and I expect the decision to rest with her. I looked straight at Sister Dwight. It is your decision, isn't it? Well, Sister Roggenbeck huffed rather loudly. They belong in the morning exercises. I was asking Sister Dwight, I said. But Sister Marvin answered, 
Travis, that's the way we do things. I stayed on that merry-go-round for another twenty minutes, going round and round, hearing the same tune over and over and getting madder and madder. In the end, I accomplished nothing more than getting everyone upset, including myself. I was permanently angry with Sister Roggenbeck and permanently in the gun sights of Sister Marvin. I never did get an answer from Sister Dwight. And our Sunday school class continued to sit through deep and wide and march to put money in Barney Barrel. It was, after all, the way we did things. But the Wednesday night youth meeting held great promise. The time was all ours. We could lay out our own format. We painted posters, made announcements, and got the kids making announcements. I visited the junior high and high school as often as I could just to make contact with the kids. Marion and I attended the games, the concerts, the plays, anything that would get us close to them. The meetings began to grow. We were singing, worshiping, getting excited about Jesus. The fellowship hall began to fill up, and we ran out of chairs. The kids brought pillows and sat on the floor. Shy Brian turned out to be a pretty good guitar player, and I got him up front to help me lead worship. Then a kid named Robbie joined us on electric bass. As soon as they were clicking, I switched to doing fills on my banjo, which I plugged in for volume. We got into the Word, and the kids started praying. And then Sister Marvin called a meeting. I think you can find instruments more appropriate for worship, she said archly. We were sitting in Pastor Marvin's office, just the Marvins and me. I could tell she'd already had a pre-meeting with her husband to get him in line. There's nothing wrong with our instruments, I said. The kids are into it. I've even got two of them playing up front. Playing rock and roll in church. It isn't rock and roll. It's contemporary worship. She rolled her eyes in disgust. Well, I don't believe that. I saw the electric guitar. That's a bass. We could hear you clear upstairs, Pastor Marvin ventured. At least they were singing. It was very bold of him. She stared a few daggers at him and then conceded, well, I might be able to put up with the guitar, but the banjo? Then she rolled her eyes again, sending a loud and clear message of disdain that I took personally. Pastor Marvin offered, Why can't Marion play the piano? We don't have one down there, I answered. The only piano this church has is in the sanctuary. Then maybe you should just join the adults upstairs, said Sister Marvin. I thought of all those kids finally coming around finally getting excited because something new was happening, something just for them. I thought of them having to listen to Sister Marvin play the organ and sit through one of Pastor Marvin's sermons. That's not going to happen. Bullseye. I hit her primer and the powder exploded. Excuse me? I was angry enough, and just plain right enough, to face her down. That's not going to happen. I turned to the pastor and said, Our youth group has grown from a dozen to over forty, and I expect it to grow even more if we can just be left alone to do what we're doing. If that's agreeable with you, then I'd like your approval. We don't approve, Sister Marvin answered. Not at all. I leaned over Pastor Marvin's desk, looking him right in the eye and effectively blocking out the participation of his wife. I would like your approval, sir. He looked at her but I could read her signals in his face. Well, you're doing a good job, but you need to be careful, Travis. He glanced at his wife. No doubt he would have to say more if he wanted dinner tonight. We'll have to talk about it. We'll work something out. The banjo stayed, as did the guitar and the electric bass. Pastor Marvin declined to confront us, and the youth group grew to over 60 on a Wednesday night. Sister Marvin derived no joy from that fact. Sister Roggenbeck wouldn't look at me even if I was standing right in front of her. Bill Braun, the board member, demanded I turn in every gas receipt directly to him, and then he grilled me for any and all details. Two girls, Cindy and Clarice, along with Shy Brian and Robbie, the bass player, had formed a nice quartet and volunteered to sing a special number for the Sunday evening service. Because they were there, about twelve of their friends were there as well, so we had sixteen teenagers willingly turning out for church on Sunday night. I was sure Sister Marvin would be pleased. When their turn came, 
Cindy, Clarice, Brian, and Robbie took their places in the front of the sanctuary, nervous but excited. The two boys started an introduction on their guitars, and Amos Roggenbeck, Sister Roggenbeck's husband, growled at them from his reserved, exclusive, usable only by a Roggenbeck place in the pew. Young people, I'll thank you not to stand in front of the altar. The musical introduction stopped cold. The kids didn't know what to do. They looked at each other. They looked at me. I got up from my seat on the platform and showed the kids a better place to stand over in front of the piano. Shy Brian whispered, What did we do wrong? Nothing. I whispered back, Just sing for Jesus. I'd heard them sing before, and they were great. This night, thanks to Amos Roggenbeck, their song fell apart and they sat down humiliated. The incident was not wasted on their friends. After the service, I scrambled to talk to as many kids as I could before they all left bitter and disillusioned. Some got away, and I knew it would take weeks to repair the damage. But Brother Roggenbeck didn't get away. That would have happened over my dead body. I pulled him aside for a discreet private confrontation. Brother Roggenbeck, you embarrassed and hurt those kids tonight. They should show respect for the altar. They meant no harm by it. They were nervous. They just wanted to sing for the Lord and minister. Young brats don't have any respect. You should be teaching them that. I grabbed his arm and got right in his face. Now you listen to me. These kids mean the world to me, and they just want to glorify Jesus. If you embarrass them again, are you listening to me? I'm going to embarrass you. We're having a private meeting now, but next time it'll be in front of everyone. You understand? You need to show respect. I would have had more fruitful conversation with a grapefruit. We were pushing sixty in attendance, almost filling the fellowship hall. The worship music was great. Cindy, Clarice, Brian, and Robbie finally got a chance to sing their number and do it right. The kids spoke right up during our sharing time, telling the others what the Lord had done in their lives over the past week. We had some new kids attending. Everything was going great until the night we discovered a mouse behind the door. The fellowship hall had restrooms and a stairway at one end, a kitchen at the other, and doors to the Sunday school rooms on the sides. As I stood up to speak, I thought I heard a noise from the room directly behind me and glanced at it. That door, like all the others, was closed. I went on teaching, telling illustrative stories, cracking jokes, getting laughs. And then I heard the noise again. A squeak. Some rustling. Two girls sitting in the front row started chittering to each other, pointing toward the door and apparently seeing movement under it. Pretty soon, five in the front row were looking. Finally, one of them squealed, There's a mouse in there! Announced the presence of a mouse to thirty teenage girls sitting on the floor and thirty teenage guys who would love to catch it, and you will have a room full of kids who aren't interested in the triumphal entry. I went to the door. Don't open it! A girl shrieked. All right! said the guys. I jerked the door open, and everybody screamed. It was Sister Marvin, sitting just inside the door with a notepad in her lap. There was no other way into that room except through the fellowship hall, so she had to have been sitting there for over an hour. Her face was so red I thought she'd pop a capillary. Oh, I said. I'm sorry. We thought you were a mouse. And then I closed the door again. It took a little while to get the kids calmed down. Some gave no thought to the pastor's wife lurking behind the door, taking notes. Some thought it was perfectly, classically funny and couldn't stop laughing. I just went on with the Bible study and finished up the meeting. The kids went home, and Lucy, Marion, and I cleaned up. I don't know exactly when Sister Marvin finally came out of that room, but it was after we were gone. I left the hall light on so she could see her way out. After six months, the board voted to raise my salary to a hundred dollars a month. Brother Bill Braun was adamantly against it, but the other board members voted against him, and that sealed Brother Braun's opinion of me. I confess I didn't help matters. I failed to wear a tie one Sunday night, which got me into trouble with the Roggenbecks, Peelys, and Schmitz. These formed a cadre of big givers in the church, a group you wouldn't want disgruntled. Pastor Marvin offered to buy me a tie, but I took the hint and never came to church again without one. My hair got a little too long for their liking as well, 
but I let it grow longer just to stretch them a bit. They didn't stretch. About eight months into the ministry, Marion was sitting in a pew, praying quietly while I prayed with some of the kids up front. Sister Peely and Sister Schmidt sat down on either side of her and asked if she had any needs they could pray about. Well, she said, you can pray for those kids up there. Isaac is from a broken home, and Diane is coming out of a Satanist group. Anything else? probed Sister Peely. I'm witnessing to a girl at work, and I hope you'll pray for her. Her name is Susan. But what about yourself? they asked. Is there anything we can pray for? Marion already knew what they were after. Lucy had attended the women's ministry meeting at which Sister Marvin shared her concerns about Marion. Marion seemed overly occupied with a career instead of her husband, she'd said. Marion seemed a little hesitant to let the spirit flow in her life. And Sister Marvin asked, Has anyone ever heard Marion speak in tongues? The women compared notes and were a bit stunned to find that none of them had. Isn't she from a Baptist background? someone asked. Lucy said it wasn't right to be talking about Mary in this way, but Sister Marvin replied, We have a problem, and we need to discuss it. Now Sister Peely and Sister Schmidt wanted Marion to remain while they laid hands on her. Marion and I already had an understanding. She scratched her nose. I got her signal and stepped in. Pardon me, I told all three. Marion, I think Lucy needs some help praying for Diane. Marion rose with her usual grace. Please excuse me, she said, and went to pray with Lucy and Diane. Sister Peely and Sister Schmidt opted to pray between themselves, but they didn't stay long. Marion was teasingly jubilant as we drove home. Well, now I have a reputation, too, she announced, patting my hand. Why should you be the one who gets all the attention? My ministry position at Northwest Pentecostal Mission lasted one year and five months, growing and dying at the same time. I got along grandly with the youth, and by the end of our stay we had about eighty coming out on Wednesday nights. The death of our ministry was something that built over time, grievance by grievance, misstep by misstep, and finished with a loud bang. At the 1978 Christmas banquet, I threw the scales so out of balance that no amount of devoted ministry would right them again. The church had rented a banquet room at a local hotel and decorated it to the hilt. The adults were decked out in their finest and sat at formerly decorated tables for a candlelight dinner. Lucy, Marion, and I brought a youth choir made up of twenty-four kids, the girls in long dresses, the guys in white shirts and ties. Marion played a rented piano. Shy Brian and Robbie played guitar and bass. I directed, and those kids sang some terrific arrangements of traditional carols as well as some fun, upbeat songs. The evening was going great, up to a point. We'd just finished a comical rendition of Children Go Where I Send Thee, with costumed kids portraying four for the four that stood at the door, three for the Hebrew children, two for Paul and Silas, and one for the little bitty baby born, born, born in Bethlehem when Brother Roggenbeck decided it was time for a loud, growling admonition. You'd better change your direction, young people. We're not here to listen to this nonsense. We're here to worship the Lord. I was facing the choir with my back to the room, but I knew who it was. I had my hands up, ready to start the next song. But my arms wilted, and I could feel my temperature rising. There were moans all over the room. I could see the hurt in the kids' faces the embarrassment and fear. Cindy and Clarice had been through this before and weren't hurt, but angry. As for shy Brian and Robbie, Why don't you just shut up? Brian cried. I turned. I could see Sister Marvin about to step in. No, I said, looking at her and then all the others. No, he's absolutely right. These kids have worked hard and done it prayerfully, and they don't deserve this kind of treatment. There were amens and expressions of agreement from some corners of the room. The rest just stared at me, aghast. I caught a quick glimpse of Marion at the piano, expecting her to give me her usual cautionary expression. Not this time. She was on her feet, her eyes on fire, and on the very brink of saying something if I didn't. Brother Roggenbeck, I said, 
The last time you pulled a stunt like this, I told you if you did it again, I'd correct you in front of everybody. Well, here we are. He just glared back at me through his thick glasses, his jaw set and his face like stone. I stepped closer to him, demanding his attention. What there was of it. Apparently in all your seventy-some-odd years of life, no one ever taught you as simple a thing as common courtesy. Well, sir, I'm going to teach you, so you listen carefully. When these kids are up front doing anything for the congregation, and I don't care what it is, you are to sit quietly and keep your mouth shut. That's the courteous thing to do. You may think it's holy and righteous to spout off and hurt my kids' feelings, but you're not being holy, you're being a jerk. I could see Sister Marvin seething out of the corner of my eye, but I also saw Pastor Marvin nodding in agreement. I felt vaguely aware that I was about to torpedo my ministry at this church. But by now, after so much of this stuff, one thought washed like a tidal wave over all the others. To heck with it. I took another step toward Brother Roggenbeck. You keep quiet, Brother Roggenbeck, you hear me? Because the next time you open your mouth and hurt my kids, before God and this congregation, I promise I'll personally knock you right on your stage eyes. Is that understood? My kids applauded and cheered. There were gasps of horror all over the room, and a few cheers. But apparently three out of the four board members weren't cheering. Wally Barker was the only one who thought I should stay. The banquet took place on a Friday night. Pastor Marvin and Wally Barker came by to give me my last paycheck on Saturday. The board had trouble deciding whether I should be paid for my participation at the banquet, but Wally finally prevailed, and they agreed to prorate my December check for the first two weeks. I got fifty dollars. Pastor Marvin told me in several ways that he wasn't unhappy with me, and then he asked me not to show up at the church again. It would only stir up the hornet's nest, he said. I never went back. Lucy kept the youth group going, but finally married and moved away. The youth ministry dissolved, and the older folks got their church back just the way they liked it. I had never forgotten that year and five months, nor have I ever been able to settle in my mind how I could have done better. I could have been less feisty. I could have submitted more to the leadership over me. I could have kowtowed to sisters Marvin, Roggenbeck, Peely, and Schmidt. Maybe rebuking Brother Rockenbeck did set a bad example in front of the kids. I was young and headstrong back then, I admit. But still, there was so much good that happened during those days. So many things that I know will last. Some of those kids came from home situations that never would have gotten them saved, to put it mildly. But they're still serving the Lord today. Somehow, Trevor Nielsen got the kinks out of his mind and quit messing in his pants. His mother sent me a thank you card. And there were goodbye and thank you cards from the kids, too. Hey, Travis, you okay? Kyle was driving back from Missoula. I guess I'd gotten a little too quiet. I'm... I didn't expect my throat to be so tight. I swallowed. I'm okay. I was just thinking about things. Thinking about... Yeah? My wife used to say something to me that you might benefit from hearing. I said at last. Kyle, you're a man of God, and this is your calling, so don't worry. Just be faithful. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. God will do the rest. Then I added. And Kyle, don't let anybody put out your fire. You hear me? Kyle hadn't been inside my mind or privy to my memories for the last hundred miles so he looked a little quizzical. Okay. Thanks for that. The highway blurred in front of me. I rubbed the tears out of my eyes so I could see the mountains and the blue sky over Idaho. 18. At Our Lady of the Fields, Arnold Kowalski, his hat in his hands, moved slowly down the center aisle passing through the squares of sunlight on the floor and looking up at the crucifix on the wall. He was the only one there, the only one who still believed. The pilgrims were gone, along with the reporters and their cameras. The fame had moved to the Macon Ranch. But Arnold's faith was here because the crucifix was here. The stranger at the ranch he didn't know 
But this image had been a part of his life for years. He dusted it, polished it, straightened it, respected it. It had touched his pain and taken it away. His faith was here. He looked around to be sure he was alone, then walked slowly toward the platform, his head bowed in humility and reverence, counting twelve steps between each genuflection. Every step hurt just a little. His joints were complaining again, but it wouldn't be for long. He still believed. He was wearing a tie today. He'd combed his hair before leaving home and once more after removing his hat. He'd blessed himself with holy water before entering the sanctuary. He'd recited twelve Hail Marys and twelve Our Fathers. Father Vendetti had mentioned taking the ladder down and putting it away, but Arnold had put off doing it, knowing he would need it as soon as he had prayed enough to be worthy. He stepped on the first rung, feeling the pain, then climbed slowly, his eyes on the carved face crowned with thorns. When he had climbed to the same level as the wooden Christ, he reached into his pocket and pulled out the small crucifix that had hung on his bedroom wall for decades, a gift from his mother. With great care and reverence, he had drilled a small hole in the top and threaded a neck chain through it. See? he said, holding it before the wooden eyes. I have you at home, too. He extended the crucifix until it touched the one on the wall. Nothing happened. Everything was safe so far. He pressed the smaller cross flat against the larger, then rubbed it up and down as a child would rub a nail across a magnet, reciting the Lord's Prayer and another Hail Mary. Then he said, I know there's plenty of blessing in there. I know you won't mind. Satisfied after a few final strokes, he hung the little image around his neck and blessed himself before the image on the wall. Thank you. He descended the ladder, then put it away as Father Vendetti had asked. The blessing was close to him now, and would go with him everywhere, every moment. There would be no more pain. I couldn't believe Brett Henkel was actually pulling us over. I was the kind of driver who obeyed the law out of my love for the Lord, and not for fear of punishment, and therefore I never went over the speed limit, even if there were no cops around. Well. That little policy didn't work this time. As soon as we passed Judy's Eat Along and Tavern, Brett was behind me, his lights flashing. What'd you do? Kyle asked. I felt rather snide. Went to Missoula to trace that car. Kyle glanced backward. You think so? We'll see. I rolled the window down as Brett walked up alongside, noting how he kept his billy club in his hand until he was right outside my window. Hi, right, Travis he said, slipping the club into the loop on his belt. In a little hurry, aren't you? I spoke politely. I was going less than twenty-five miles per hour, and twenty-five is the posted speed limit. He leaned against the car, his hands on the windowsill. My radar told me otherwise. I glanced at Kyle. I have a witness. He stooped in close, his eyes invisible behind his gold-rimmed sunglasses. Okay, I'll come right to the point. I know where you've been and I know what you've been doing. I shouldn't have to remind you that's my job and none of your business. I thought I might reason with him. Brett, come on. We've known each other for years. He put his finger in my face. This isn't a discussion, Travis. This is a heads up for both of you. I'm watching. You make things difficult for this town, I'll make things really difficult for you. Those are the rules. Don't we have to break the law first? He almost smiled. That'll be my call, won't it? Now, let's have your license and registration. I clocked you going forty. We met in Morgan Elliott's office. Both Kyle and I had qualms about it, but she insisted. Michael is my son, she said. This Brandon, or Herb, or whoever he is, already knows he has to deal with me. We told her about our trip and what we had learned. We also told her about our encounter with Brett Henkel on the way into town. She cocked an eyebrow at Kyle. Looks like you were right. Nichols is out to make friends, Kyle observed. People with power, people with money. Like Mrs. Macon, I added. And the business folks like Norman and Matt, said Morgan. 
and as many of the local clergy as he can muster to his side. Armand Harrison, for one. Absolutely. And as many of the other ministers Armand can guilt-trip into joining. Burton Eddy is almost a confederate by now. Sid Maher and Paul Daly don't like Nichols slash Johnson, but they aren't going to say a word against him. She sneered. They don't wish to seem intolerant. So where do you stand? Kyle asked her. I almost objected to his forwardness, but Morgan answered directly, That man is not Jesus. Kyle was not rude in tone, but he was still being Kyle. What about the real Jesus? Have you met him personally? She paused to consider the question, and then answered, No. Then she added, But that can change. We can pray right now, at the proper time. She shifted her focus toward me. So, what now? I think it's time I had a little talk with Brandon Nichols, I said. I'll go along, said Kyle. Uh, no, let me do it. He and I have talked before, and it's always been just the two of us. Are you sure? After what Abe and Hattie told us? I don't know. Even Morgan seemed uneasy. I'd be careful not to be alone with him. He came to me first, as if he wants me in his confidence. I told them. I think we could talk freely. There might be a way to get through to him, maybe unravel whatever his problem is. I haven't told you yet, said Morgan. Nevin Sorrel is dead. Kyle took the news badly, but I was only vaguely familiar with the name. Who is that? Remember the guy I told you about? Asked Kyle. He was there at the meeting in the garage. He's the other guy who tried to take pictures of Nichols. Now I started taking the news badly. You're kidding. He used to work for Mrs. Macon before Nichols came along, Morgan explained. From what Michael tells me, Mrs. Macon fired him and hired Nichols, and Nevin was not happy about it. He broke up the meeting. Then Kyle added with dramatic force, and he said Brandon Nichols was not Brandon Nichols. He said Nichols was lying. He was right. What happened to him? I asked. Nichols hired him back, said Morgan. Michael told me he was working with Nichols on a water project, developing a spring up in the hills somewhere. Apparently, Nevin was riding his horse back from the project when he fell off and hit his head. His foot was caught in the stirrup, so the horse dragged him all the way back to the corral. At least, that's the story. Nobody actually saw it happen. He was working with Nichols? I wanted to verify. According to Michael. Nichols hired him? Kyle asked. After that scene in the garage, he still hired him? Michael says Mrs. Macon was against it, but Nichols wanted Nevin to live on the place and work for him. You can draw some nasty conclusions. Kyle shook his head at me. I wouldn't go up there alone. He and Morgan waited for my answer. I thought it over and said, You two just pray for me. I'll be all right. Saturday. At least three hundred people from almost as many faraway places filled the folding chairs under the blue and white striped big top, and Brandon Nichols slash Herb Johnson held forth in a glorious manner. It was the first of his meetings I'd ever attended, and I could quickly see why Kyle got so upset and wrote that letter to the paper. This guy could sell snow to an Eskimo. The healings were dramatic, to say the least, and all the wonderful talk of love brotherhood, peace, safety, a new world, just went on and on, and the people ate it up. I recognized several familiar faces. Matt Kiley was in the back, apparently an usher. Michael Elliott was helping direct traffic and bring prophetic comfort wherever needed. D. Baylor and Adrian Folsom were present, but not sitting near each other, which was a little unusual. Don Anderson, the appliance dealer, actually went forward with the other petitioners, wanting a special blessing for his business. Before Nichols preached, several went to the podium to give testimonies. All I had to do was mentally substitute a few key names and words, Brandon for Jesus, for example, or Follower for Christian, and the testimonies could have come right out of a Sunday night church meeting. My life used to be a mess, said a young professional from Colorado. I had a great job running a resort in Vail, and I was making plenty of money, but it just didn't satisfy. Something was missing. Then I found Brandon, and that's made all the difference. I became a follower two weeks ago, said a young woman from Redding, California, and my life has never been the same. 
I used to be on drugs, but now that's over. Brandon? Then she giggled and said, I like to think of him by his real name. And everyone chuckled at what she was implying. Brandon has brought real meaning to my life, and I love him dearly. Then Andy Parmenter, the retired executive from Southern California, stood behind the podium and said, Brandon has dramatically affirmed what I have always believed, that whatever it is, I can do it. There's no mountain too tall to block your path if you just believe in yourself. I think this little town is going to become a world-renowned showplace for exactly that principle. We are here. We are strong. We have what it takes to build a better world. So don't miss out. Get on board. Let Brandon touch your life and believe. He sat down to whoops and applause. Nichols sat on the platform listening to all this and obviously enjoying it. Sitting to his immediate right was, of all people, Sally Fordyce. One look told me she was a total 100% follower. And maybe more. She was wearing a long white dress that matched his white tunic, and the shawl and sandals made her look like a biblical character. There was an obvious affection between them. They touched and held hands frequently. Their eyes met as they shared the laughter. When someone praised him, she would stroke his shoulder. My guess was that she no longer went home to Charlie and Mag at night. Sitting to Nichols's immediate left was Mary Donovan, the Catholic friend of Dee Baylor. I didn't know her very well, only that she tagged around a lot with Dee. She was wearing a long blue dress and a shawl over her head, like every statue of the Virgin Mary, and she seemed to be acting very, shall we say, icon-like. Nichols gave her a kindly, playful nudge, and she giggled with embarrassment. The audience picked up the idea. Mom! they called. God bless you, Mom! She rose slowly, gathering her shawl about her head and taking small steps with a fluid, dancer-like gracefulness. She approached the podium, and then both hands extended, said airily, Blessings to you all. Blessings, they echoed back. Today the Lord has done great things, and holy is his name. He has touched the weak and made them strong. He has brought wealth to the needy and courage to the faint-hearted. Be thankful, one and all. Be thankful. Thank you, rippled through the audience, and Nichols nodded back. From the earth comes water, from the water comes new life. Be thankful, one and all. Thank you, they repeated. And Nichols smiled and nodded again. They have a regular liturgy going here, I thought. But just who is Mary Donovan supposed to be? They're calling her mom. The mom? I had to wonder what D, Mary's former mentor, must be feeling about all this. Mary was getting the attention now. This was too much. I noticed Nancy Barron standing in the doorway of the tent with Mrs. Macon. The two were talking quietly, but Nancy didn't appear to be acting as a reporter today. If I learned Nancy had become a follower, I knew I would scream. The moment Nichols rose to speak, he told the crowd, Turn to someone and say, This world needs someone like you. Go ahead. Someone turned to me and said it, but I didn't even turn. I had made up my mind long ago I'd never turn to anyone and say anything ever again. But mostly I was stunned. Where'd Nichols pick up that little routine? Folks, I'll have you know we are now officially county approved. Everyone cheered. The spring is developed, the water system is upgraded, the storage tank is in, and we have our permit for the new headquarters. The porta potties will soon be a thing of the past. More cheers. But wait, I see something, said Nichols, closing his eyes, seeing spiritually. I see a spirit of doubt in this place, clinging to minds spreading a poison of fear and anxiety. Do you feel that today? Do you? Several muttered affirmatively. Be gone! His shout made me jump, as it did others. There was a wail from the crowd as, supposedly, the spirit of doubt departed. More cheers and applause. I had to do some praying. This whole thing was bigger and moving faster than I had imagined. What in the world was I doing here? Would Nichols even have time to talk to me?
Two hours later, Brandon Nichols and I were walking along the white fence that bordered a large horse paddock. As it turned out, he saw me in the audience as soon as the meeting began, and couldn't wait to take this walk with me. We weren't necessarily alone. We could talk privately, but Matt Kiley and two other men stood across the paddock to keep an eye on things. He was giddy with excitement. Things are moving right along, Travis, faster than I'd hoped. So I see. I replied with a lack of enthusiasm. I was surprised. I really was. Give the people what they want, they'll come. It's quite a show. He paused and leaned on the fence. It always is. Everywhere. Every Sunday. He looked directly at me. Am I right? I saw no need to get into that. We need to talk about Herb Johnson. He only smiled. Maybe we should talk about that speeding ticket you got from Brett Henkel. I took a breath and made a decision not to get angry. I'll contest it in court and probably get it thrown out. I wasn't speeding. I have a perfect driving record and a witness. I know the judge, and the judge knows me. There. We've talked about it. I waited. Then I prodded. Herb Johnson. Herb is a plant you grind up and put in soup. Call me Brandon. I talk to... To Abe. And Hattie, I know. They have terrible memories if they can't even remember what my name is. So you do remember them. Well, they remember you. And Abe remembers the car. Now he got impatient with me. What did I expect? Travis, you are way behind and way off. You sat through the whole meeting. Didn't you learn anything? People are people, and they always will be people, and people don't care what I am or who I am. They care about what I provide. Give them what they want, and they'll think what they want. You can go to Missoula. You can go to L.A. You can dig up whatever you want, but it'll only make you the bad guy, not me. I frowned. What's in L.A.? He looked away and laughed. Travis, please tell me you're not a hypocrite. Are you going to answer any of my questions? I'll do better than that. He turned toward me, his elbow on the fence. I'll tell you my intentions. I was skeptical and made no effort to hide it. Knock me over. He gave a sly smile. I intend to take this town for Christ. I knew what he really meant. It felt like a hot needle going through my heart, but I tried not to flinch. I can't believe the gall you have. Travis, come on now. You've tried the same thing. Be honest. Outreaches and bus ministries and youth evangelism. Anything to bring the people in. It's all a big game, Travis. It's called building a kingdom, having followers, changing the order of things, and I'm better at it. You got some. But I got more. It took you fifteen years. It took me a few weeks. Argue with that. It's a big lie, Brandon. He slapped the fence and rolled his eyes in a circle that could be seen for miles. Travis, Travis, how many times do we have to go over that? It doesn't matter. I produce, I provide results, I get things done. While your God is stalling and hem-hawing and forcing you to make excuses for him, I'm right here, right now. You can't compete with that. He got close and pointed his finger at my heart. And you can't stop it either. People will let you define their beliefs. Did you know that? Give them a homey feeling. Give them security. And they'll give you their minds and hearts. That's how I'm going to control this town, Travis. First the adults, and then their children. He leaned back against the fence and stretched his neck. It's scary how easy it is. He snickered. I see a spirit of doubt. As soon as I saw it, so did they. And you're saying you didn't? He gave me a comical shrug. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. But how's anybody going to know? Then he pointed at my chest again and said with wild eyes, Turn to somebody and say, I do everything he tells me. Go ahead. I turned away, disgusted. Travis, Travis, don't go hypocritical on me now. You've had the same doubts about this whole racket that I have. Or are you sitting alone in your house on Sundays because you still buy all this stuff? Stuff, I muttered. The word had a private meaning for me, at least until now. Stuff, he agreed. The game. He gripped the fence tightly as anger filled his eyes. Heard them in, 
herd them out, brand them, shear them, butcher them. He hit the fence with the heel of his hand, a snarl on his lips. He recovered, calling himself. Travis, I hope you realize we're both angry at the same things. We've been in the same places, felt the same pain. We're different, Brandon. Way different. He wagged his head. No, we're not. Not at the core. You're mad, and I'm mad. He thought a moment, then suggested, If there's any difference between us, Travis Jordan, it's that I'm doing something about it while you're still trying to make up your mind. So let me be as friendly as I can. Make up your mind and do it soon. I'm going to own the people of this town, their wills, their money, their children. They're going to give themselves to me because I'm a better messiah, and I play a better game. Now I've let you into my circle of confidence because I know you really do see things as I do. I know we could work together. But the opportunity won't last. I can't let you do it. I am doing it. With his hand, he signaled across the paddock. You know Matt Kiley, of course. Now that his legs are working so well, he can help you find your way out of here. I drove to the bottom of the driveway and through the big stone gate. Kyle was sitting on the ground across the road, his back against a fence post, waiting. I parked the car, got out, and sat beside him. How'd it go? he asked. But I could tell his face was already mirroring mine. Quite unhappy. We need to pray for this guy. We sat there together on the bank beside the road, a pasture at our backs, and the Macon Ranch on the wide, gradual hill before us, and prayed. My emotions were a swirling mixture. I loathed the man's evil and cunning, but felt so deeply sorry for him. It angered me to hear him suggest we were so much alike, but I knew he was dredging soil from my soul that he recognized in his own. And as much as I knew my own heart, I knew his. And knowing his heart, I feared for those who followed him. Don Anderson was a gadget guy. He sold appliances, CD players, VCRs, remote controls, stereo headsets, radio-controlled models, radio-controlled doors and light switches, keychains that chirped, bedside environmental sound machines, and ultrasonic pest repellers, just to name a few. Because he loved that stuff. A sign hung in the front window of his Pepto-Bismol pink appliance store, Better Life Through Creative Technology. The store was his own little world where he could surround himself with myriad little plastic boxes that beeped, blurped, lit up, entertained, informed, and did zillions of other amazing things. It was a wonderful kingdom to rule when he could. But sometimes his subjects would get the better of him. Once a customer brought in a VCR that ate tapes, he fixed it, the customer took it home, and that very night, the thing ate her collector's edition copy of Gone with the Wind. Once a remote control for a customer's television wouldn't switch the channels, but would open the garage door. He knew how to lick that. He just switched the frequencies around. This time, when the customer tried to change channels, the lights in the house dimmed, and the FM radio started searching for another station. Right now, he was having to deal with a CD player that wouldn't go around. There was no other problem with it. It just wouldn't go around. He couldn't make it go around, and that vexed him severely. A radio scanner that wouldn't scan also vexed him, and if he couldn't get a decent solenoid for Mrs. Bigby's washing machine, he'd have to refund her money. Don's sovereignty over his little kingdom was far from complete. Even the gadgets in his home could be wayward and noncompliant, and his wife Angela never missed an opportunity to remind him about it. Just as a plumber's wife will complain about her clogged sink and running toilet that never get fixed, so Angela often reminded him of the stereo that only played on the left side, the hair dryer that didn't turn on at all, and the television that kept blinking in and out. Don had trouble remembering the stereo or the hair dryer, but the television got his attention almost every evening, and especially this evening. There was a prize fight coming in live over the satellite dish, a fight he'd paid forty dollars in advance to view. Now, as he sat there with his dinner on a TV tray and his wife looking for something to read, the tube blinked out. No! he wailed, almost knocking his dinner over. Too bad, Angela said with a curt little smile, thumbing through her house and garden. 
He set aside the TV tray and approached the big television with the massive oak cabinet, 44-inch screen, and surround sound. He stood before it. He spoke to it. He gestured. It only hissed and threw a snowy picture at him. Got you stumped? Angela said. No, he growled. It was just that problems like this took precious time to figure out, and he didn't have time. The fight was going to start in a few minutes, and knowing the champ's record, it would only last a few minutes. Come on, come on. He banged the television on the side. That didn't work. You have tools, don't you? No time, no time, too much trouble. He could feel Angela on the couch behind him, enjoying her magazine and trying to pretend she wasn't really enjoying this. Nuts. He'd been up to that Brandon Nichols character and received some kind of magical touch from him, something to help his business. Angela didn't think much of that either, and maybe she was right. Nichols gave him a touch on the forehead. He felt a tingle, went home. His television didn't work. End of story. So it was mere impulse, and perhaps a little sarcasm, that caused him to reach out and touch the television in the same histrionic Brandon Nichols fashion. He felt the tingle again, and the picture tube came on with a flash. The champ was winning thirty seconds into the first round. Yes! Angela looked up. What'd you do? He ducked behind his TV tray, his eyes glued to the screen. Uh, just tweaked it, you know? Adjusted the doojiggy. She went back to her magazine. He saw the rest of the fight, all four rounds, and then stole into the bathroom for a little appointment with Angela's hairdryer. This is nuts, he kept telling himself. But he pulled it out of the drawer by the sink, plugged it in, and gave it a little touch. He felt the tingle again. The dryer came to life. All right, all right, one more time now, just to be sure. He walked, if he hurried, Angela might notice, into the den, strolled nonchalantly by the stereo, and gave it a tingly tap. Without his having to touch the on button, it came to life and played beautifully out of both sides. Don looked at his trembling hand. This is, this is incredible. He looked around the room, counting all the gadgets. The implications were staggering. I can't lose, he said. People were coming from miles around to have Brandon Nichols touch their bodies. Would they do the same for their gadgets and appliances? This could be the dawning of a new day for Anderson's furniture and appliance. Angela came into the room, pleasantly surprised at the full stereo sound. She even had to speak loudly. You fixed it, you genius you. Yeah, he said, awestruck at his new ability. Pretty impressive, huh? King of Gadgets. That was Don Anderson. Adrian Folsom closed her eyes and listened for the voice of the angel Elkazar, her pen poised over a sheet of stationery. Sally Fordyce sat nearby, unconsciously wringing her hands in nervous anticipation, waiting to hear a word from the Lord. Suddenly, Adrian smiled as if listening to a voice on a telephone and began to write. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was that again? Mm-hmm. Okay. Sally was in Adrian's home with Brandon's permission. Let Adrian tell you, he said. Let her bear witness. Adrian finished writing and turned towards Sally, the letter in her hand. You'll like this. Sally leaned forward, still nervous. Adrian, her reading glasses on her nose, began to read. This is a mystery of my true church, that all God's children should be one, with no sense of other. As my servant is in unity with the Christ, so you are in unity with him, and the oneness that you are in spirit you portray in your bodies. Fear not to submit to him, and let your body be his, for this is higher than flesh. This is spirit, and all that is spirit is one. Then Adrian grinned, anticipating what she would read next. Just as my servant is in unity with the Christ, and you are in unity with him, so your friend Mary Donovan is in unity with the Virgin Mother, Michael Elliot is in unity with John the Baptizer, and you— Adrian smiled teasingly at Sally— are in unity with Mary Magdalene, whom the Christ loves as his own flesh? Sally was not so thrilled and made a face. Mary Magdalene? Adrian glowed. Isn't that incredible? Sally only looked at the floor, her head quivering little nose. That's not incredible, it's crazy. I'm not Mary Magdalene. Adrian tried to explain. Well, remember how Jesus said that John the Baptist was Elijah? This is the same kind of thing. 
Brandon yelled at me last night. That doesn't sound like Jesus loving Mary Magdalene. Adrian puzzled over that one a moment. That's possible. Even God got angry with Moses. Sally didn't buy that either. I was too tired to have sex, Adrian. Brandon got all mad over a stupid thing like that. That doesn't sound like God or somebody at unity with the Christ or whatever he's supposed to be. Adrian gasped. Oh my, what? It's Elkazar. He's speaking again. She turned to her table and started writing. Oh my, oh my, oh my. Sally looked over her shoulder. What? What's he saying? She could read Elkazar's words as Adrian wrote them. Remember the fate of Korah and Miriam. Who's Korah? She asked. Adrian's voice was hushed with fear. Korah led a rebellion against Moses in the wilderness. The earth opened and swallowed him up, him and his followers. Sally was about to back away, but Adrian grabbed her arm. Miriam stood against Moses and the Lord struck her with leprosy. Sally sank to her knees, weak with fear. I thought he loved me. Brandon loves you. This threat is from God. Sally thought it over. It didn't take long. I'd better get back. Brandon will receive you. You'll be safe there. Sally kissed Adrian on the cheek and hurried out the door. Adrian stared at the paper before her with its cryptic message. Elkazar, I've never known you to be so harsh. She felt an icy breath of wind at her back, though the curtains at the window did not stir and the house plants did not waver. She felt it again. Her skin crawled as she turned and saw nothing, but felt something there. Is that you? There was no answer. Alcazar, is that you? He had never hidden from her before, never lurked like a prowler, but now she could feel him watching her just out of sight. I gave her your message. She's going back to the Christ right now. You saw her go, didn't you? She felt as if cold, heavy lead was filling her stomach. She began to tremble. Elkazar, please don't tease me now. It was the eerie stillness that scared her. The deadness in the air, the chilling cold, the waiting. He stood there somewhere, his presence like a poison. The pendulum on the wall clock swinging away the seconds. Adrian's short, frightened little breaths, the only sound. At last, without a word, he turned away. She could feel him retreating slowly, taking his own time, letting the effect linger as hideous terror seeped out of the rooms and hallways in small, agonizing degrees. Several minutes later, only when she was sure it was safe to do so, she stirred, turning once again to the paper on her desk. Now it read, so also for Adrian. Jack McKinstry was having doubts, but neither he nor his wife, Lindsay, dare say anything for fear of jinxing business. The supermarket was doing well. Max was still the prime location where the denizens of the Macon Ranch got their groceries, and Michael the Prophet came through almost every day to post flyers and announcements of coming meetings. Brandon Nichols and his followers always plugged the store to the pilgrims coming through, just as they talked up the other businesses in town. It was best not to tamper with a good relationship, but just keep sacking up those groceries and filling the tills. But how were they supposed to handle a visit from the Virgin Mary? Sure, they knew who Mary Donovan was. She'd been a regular customer, and they knew her by name. She was a friend of Dee Baylor. Since she was a young divorcee, it was safe to assume she wasn't a virgin. But here she was decked out in a robe, shawl, and sandals, pushing a cart up and down the aisles, grocery shopping for Mrs. Macon and her son. Oh, he used to love this when he was little, she exclaimed, taking a box of Cap'n Crunch off the shelf. Then she'd stroll past the bread and bakery shelves, recalling, Oh, these are just like the ones he multiplied on the shores of Galilee. I was so proud. She picked up a jar of tartar sauce. My son will provide the fish. Jack had a good guess that, if she had a grocery list, she wasn't following it. Mrs. Macon wasn't going to be happy about this. He hurried to join Mary near the frozen vegetables. How you doing, uh, Mary? My soul doth magnify the Lord, she replied. And behold, these peas are on sale. He opened the freezer door to grab some. Yeah, they sure are. How many packages do you need? She giggled. Jesus can start with just one and take it from there. He put one package in her cart and then craned his neck to see her grocery list. 
You finding everything okay? He leadeth me beside the still shelves and restoreth my memory. He could see the list and the contents of the cart. Uh, you sure you need all these olives? She looked at the dozen cans strewn in the cart and mused. Blessed is he whose quiver is full of them, for we lack oil and our lamps have gone out. Well, yeah, your list says olive oil. That's on aisle twelve. Oh, thank you. I will turn aside and see this great sight. She stopped when she saw bags of popcorn. Jesus was such a creative child, he could pop popcorn by the breath of his nostrils. She threw four bags into the cart. He'll be so excited. Jack hurried back to the checkout counter, ringing up groceries he could deal with. Mary as Virgin Mary was a little out of his realm. Should we call Mrs. Macon? Lindy asked from her cash register. He thought only a half second and then shook his head. Don't meddle, he thought. Don't mess things up. Jim Baylor was in his basement sharpening the lawnmower blades when he heard the front door slam and the heavy footsteps of his wife thumping and creaking over the floor joists. She had been to another meeting up at the Macon Ranch. She was getting to be a regular Nichols junkie, always going back for more spiritual happy pills. Yep, she was laughing again. She laughed from the front door to the kitchen, and then from the kitchen to the bathroom. After the toilet flush rushed through the black pipes over his head, he could still hear her laughing in their bedroom and then back in the kitchen again. He hated when she was like this. Now he heard smaller thumps leaving the living room and going into the kitchen. That would be their daughter, Darlene, roused from her place in front of the television. Was a funny, came Darlene's voice, coming through the floor. What's so funny was a bit muffled. Jim figured out that Dee said, The spirit's trickling through me and it tickles. She started laughing again. A chair squawked over the floor, and thump, Dee sat down. Well, is she going to cook this time? Jim wondered. He figured he'd better make sure, much as he longed to keep his life as simple as sharpening a lawnmower blade. When he got to the kitchen, Dee was doubled over the table, red in the face, eyes full of tears, laughing herself silly. What's so funny? he asked. She couldn't answer, not then. Not ten minutes later. It was much worse this time. She'd been giddy before, tittering and giggling, praising the Lord and seeing something humorous and everything. But tonight she was out of control, maybe out of her mind. He couldn't handle it, so he returned to the basement. Mower blades he could handle. He could hear her moving around up in the kitchen, still laughing, but calming down to intermittent giggles. She was opening cupboards and drawers. Good. She'd come down from her spiritual high long enough to fix dinner. Then the joists started creaking overhead, and he could hear her feet shuffling about as she sang. She was dancing up there, shuffling in circles. The door at the top of the stairs opened, and Darlene hollered down the stairs, Dad, would you make Mom stop? Is she cooking dinner? I don't know. Well, see what you can do to help her. He could hear Darlene walk into the kitchen. The shuffling stopped, although he still heard some giggles. Then he heard water running, and Darlene screaming. He bolted up the stairs and ran for the kitchen, passing Darlene coming the other way, drenched. He got into the kitchen in time to see Dee dancing in circles, waving the sink sprayer over her head and drenching everything, including herself. Thou hast turned my morning into dancing for me, she was singing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth. Dee! He grabbed the hand holding the sprayer and got a good dousing before he wrested it from her. Are you crazy? She calmed. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. He put the sprayer back in its place. Look at this mess. He grabbed a towel from the rack by the sink and started wiping. Gonna get the french fries now? She tittered and sang, dance stepping to the refrigerator. She opened the freezer side, took out a bag of frozen french fries, zipped it open, and dumped the french fries all over the kitchen table. Dinner's on! She thought that was funny and collapsed into a chair, hysterical with laughter. Darlene stood in the kitchen doorway, her wet hair matted to her forehead, her expression pathetic. You want me to order out again? Jim was standing in a puddle of water, and the towel in his hands could hold no more. Dee was still laughing, starting up again each time she looked at the french fries strewn on the table. Yeah, I guess so. What do we want, pizza? How about Chinese? The Wahing ought to be open. 
Dee looked at him. Chinese, she cackled, then exploded with more giggling. Jim envisioned chow mein, rice, sweet and sour ribs, and fortune cookies all over the floor. Make it a pizza, something plain and simple. Matt Kylie, if you ever show your ugly face around here again, I'll rearrange your nose and mash it into the highway myself. Judy Holliday could take quite a bit of irritation before she got riled, but now she was threatening and cussing a blue streak and had a frying pan in her hand to back up every word. She was standing over Matt Kylie, and he was lying in the front doorway, half inside and half out. And don't you get none of your blood on my carpet? Judy's granddaughter, Gildy, brought a towel for Matt to dab his face and head. I think you better leave. Judy turned on Irv, the trucker, the winner in this particular brawl, even though he didn't look like it. Go on, go in the washroom and wipe that blood off before you drip on something. Greg, go with him. And Linda, there's some iodine and bandages above the freezer. Go on, all of you. She turned back to Matt, still lying at her feet in the doorway. I don't see you moving. He tried to move and got as far off the floor as his knees before he teetered forward again. At least now he was a few feet farther outside. He's out far enough. Judy observed. Gildy, get my towel back. She knelt gently and took the towel from Matt's swelling face. Sorry. Mm, he said with swollen lips. He rolled and managed to sit up, looking up at Judy standing in the doorway. Why does Irv get to stay? Because you're the ornery cuss that started this whole fight and you know it, she answered. Dumb cluck. You knew how Irv feels about that truck of his and you called it names anyway. He had it coming. Used to call me Little Four Wheels, and I couldn't do a thing about it. Well, my late husband's got more brains than both of you, and he's been dead twenty years. Now get! Matt struggled to his feet, his face still smarting, as if Irv's big fist were still buried in it. This hadn't turned out the way he had planned. He should have been able to whoop Irv, whoop him good. It should have been Irv staggering out of Judy's and not him. His legs felt weak, and he had trouble standing. But it wasn't just because Irv had made a milkshake out of his brains. He'd been wondering about himself even when he went to Judy's. He just didn't feel the old strength. He expected a good fight would bring it out. Well, he expected wrong. It used to be there, but not tonight. The power had faded when he wasn't watching. He stumbled and almost fell. My legs, he thought. My legs. What happens when all the guys I've whooped find out? I gotta see Nichols and get this fixed. Kyle and I spoke often by telephone or in person over the next few days and prayed for the people who came to mind, Don, Adrian, Mary, Dee, and Matt being among them. We also discussed a hunch that kept nagging at me but seemed terribly far-fetched. He thought I should check it out, but I kept stalling. It would be hard enough just for me to make the phone call. I really did not want to talk to those people again. Once I got someone on the line, what in the world would I say? How could they have any idea if Nichols slash Johnson had ever been there? Still, I couldn't shake the notion that our local messiah wanted me to make that call. He had mentioned L.A. and gave me the turn to somebody and say routine. He was too subtle, too cunning for that to be a blunder. We're both angry at the same things, he said. We've been in the same places, felt the same pain, heard them in, heard them out. He was dropping clues. He had to know I'd been down there, just like him. On Thursday, nearly a week after my conversation with Nichols slash Johnson, I got the number from information and placed a call to Los Angeles. Hello, said a cheerful female voice. Thank you for calling the Cathedral of Life. Our Sunday morning services start at 7, 8.30, 10 o'clock and 11.30. Our evening service starts at 6 p.m. Our Wednesday evening service begins at 7 p.m. Child care is available for all services. If you know your party's extension, you may enter it now. For a ministry menu, press 9. I press 9. For nursery and Sunday school, press 1. For youth ministry, press 2. For college and career, press 3. For young marrieds, press 4. For family ministries, press 5. For seniors, Press 6. For singles, press 7. For weddings and funerals, press 8. For more options, press 9. I could feel my throat tightening up. 
I often had that problem when Marion and I lived down there. I pressed nine. For men's ministry, press one. For women's ministry, press two. For children's ministry, press three. For counseling, press four. A counselor may have known him. I pressed four. For marriage counseling, press one. For addictions, press two. For financial counseling, press three. For other counseling, press four. To learn how you can begin a new life in Jesus Christ, press five. I banged four. A lady's voice came on the line. Norm Corrigan's office. Hello, my name is Travis Jordan. I'm calling from Antioch, Washington. And are you calling for counseling? No, I'm... Well, this is the counseling department. Did you dial the right extension? It's all right. I wanted the counseling department. I'd like to speak to one of the pastors or counselors. Are you currently attending the Cathedral of Life? I stifled a witty comeback and answered her question. No, I'm living in Antioch, Washington. Are you attending a church there? Um, listen, I'd like to speak to a pastor. Are you currently receiving counseling from a minister at your own church? I am not calling for counseling. I need to speak to a pastor. Somebody in charge, please. Well, you've called counseling. Then how about connecting me with Dale Harris's office? Thank you. Praise music came over the line as I waited. Great and mighty is he, great and mighty is he. Great and mighty, great and mighty, great and mighty is he. Pastor Harris's office. Hello, this is Travis Jordan. I'm calling from Antioch, Washington, and I'd like to speak to Pastor Harris. Is he expecting your call? No. Pastor Harris is unavailable. I can connect you with someone on the pastoral staff. Okay, sure. Great and mighty in the morning, great and mighty at noon, great and mighty in the evening, great and mighty all the day through. Norm Corrigan's office. Hello, this is Travis Jordan from Antioch, Washington. I'd like to speak to, uh, the name escaped me, the pastor. Well, this is Norm Corrigan's office. Did you wish to speak to him? Is he someone in charge? Oh, yes. Then I'll speak to him. He's out of the office right now. Would you like to leave a message on his voicemail? I don't know why I fell into it. All right. Hello, this is Pastor Norm Corrigan. I'm away from my desk right now or on another line. You can leave me a voicemail message after the beep or dial 1220 to speak to my assistant, Joanne Billings. God bless you and have a great day. I decided to try for Joanne Billings. One, two, two, zero, I muttered as I pounded out the numbers. Hello, you've reached Joanne Billings, Pastor Norm Corrigan's assistant. I'm away from my desk right now or on another line. You can leave a voicemail message after the beep or dial pound star nine nine for an operator to assist you. Pound star nine nine. The Cathedral of Life, how may I direct your call? I sighed and actually groped with my hands as I tried to think of what to say next. Can I talk to someone in charge, uh, preferably a pastor? I can connect you with our counseling department. No, no, I was just there. How about, is there a pastor I might talk to? Great and mighty is he, great and mighty is he. Hello, this is Pastor Norm Corrigan. I'm away from my desk right now or on another line. You can... I slammed the phone down and sat there quaking with an old, familiar anger. Things hadn't changed much at the Cathedral of Life. If anything, they'd gotten worse. I'd have to go down there. But I didn't want to. Didn't want to set foot in the place ever again. The very idea dredged up painful memories for me. Memories I'd rather just forget. Nineteen. My first crack at the ministry, and I'd blown it. After we were cast out of Northwest Pentecostal Mission on our ears, I spent at least a month wallowing in self-doubt, self-pity, and self-flagellation. I never heard a peep from anyone, but still I imagined the talk circulating through the denominational district. Look out for Travis Jordan. He's a hothead. He's cantankerous, disrespectful, and big-mouthed. I would have agreed. Well, I asked myself, what can I learn from this? What's the Lord trying to teach me? I suppose the Lord was trying to teach me to be more cool-headed and cooperative, more respectful. I had some repenting and changing to do, most of which took place on my knees, scrubbing toilets. No more of this young ruler conquering the world for Christ stuff. Next time, if there was a next time, 
I'd be thinking more in terms of what it meant to be a servant, in submission to the authority God placed over me. After all, God loves a servant's heart. Fortunately, Marion stood with me. Travis, you don't think I knew what I was marrying? I don't have any misgivings. A few bruises, sure, but I got them by standing with you. I remember her resting her arms on my shoulders and looking at me with admiration, and maybe a little mischief in her eyes. When you stood up to Brother Roggenbeck, she drew in a breath and let out a deep sigh. A little more patience might have been a good thing for both of us, she admitted. But that didn't mean Sister Marvin wasn't an old busybody. As for Brother Roggenbeck, the only reason his head is wrinkled is because it's low on air. Thankfully, our loss of the ministry position did not have a significant impact on our monthly income. Marion still had her job at the hydraulic valve and coupling company, and I still had my janitorial job at the mall. Even so, we were restless. We'll try again, she said. We'll trust God, and we'll try again. If God will have me, I retorted. I'm not worried, she said. He knows you. It's typical of the Lord to close one door only to open another. A month after Northwest Mission threw us out, Marion's company offered her a higher-paying position with the parent company in Los Angeles. Hey, she said, you could go to school down there and get your teaching degree. That seemed prudent. I'd always felt that were I not a pastor, I would just as soon be a teacher, and I minored in education at West Bethel. With the credits I had earned so far, I was within easy reach of a teaching degree, a safety net, should I get booted out of the ministry again, or be unable to re-enter the ministry at all. We saved our money, applied for some grants, filled out some paperwork, and went through that open door in the spring of 1979. We found a small apartment, I enrolled at UCLA, and we settled in for a two-year stint. That's how we started attending the Cathedral of Life. According to the Christian grapevine, it was the place to be. Pastor Dale Harris was reputed to be an incredible teacher. Anybody was anybody went there. Actors, recording artists, spirit-filled billionaires who flew Learjets. I don't know what I was thinking when I decided we should go there. I guess I expected I would learn something from such a godly man. Perhaps I would gain new wisdom and insight into the ministry. Maybe I'd get my spiritual cobwebs cleared out just by being shepherded, nurtured, and pastored by someone so highly respected. I was ready to submit to good leadership. I was ready to do it right. While getting my degree and widening my skills, I could submit to mature, godly leadership and deepen my spiritual walk. Looking back, I think I did learn things I never would have known otherwise. It just didn't happen the way we expected. When we showed up at the cathedral for our first Sunday, we discovered church as we'd never experienced church before. We were accustomed to arriving for church, greeting our friends, shaking hands, and jawing with the pastor, casually finding our way inside and sitting down. We had never worried about finding a place to park, never seen full signs on the first, second, and third parking areas, never been directed down side streets by parking attendants in fluorescent orange vests with walkie-talkies. We'd never been to a church where the congregation worshipped in shifts, and you had to be early for your shift or wait for the next one. We'd never had the church door closed in our faces and locked by a polite usher who placed a sign in front of the door. Service full, next service at noon. Doors will open 1145. There were four Sunday morning services. We arrived entirely too late for the 7 o'clock and 8.30 services, but on time for the 10 o'clock, which was still too late. Enough people had already gathered on the front steps and down the sidewalks to fill the sanctuary before we could get through the front doors. We ended up standing on the front steps of the church, under the mid-morning sun, with a few hundred other people we didn't know, not yet aware that none of these people knew anyone else, either. Little introductory conversations started up throughout the crowd. Marion and I met the people immediately around us. Hi, I'm Travis. This is Marion. They were Bob and Joan, Mike and Carol, James, Ronnie, and Andre. Marion told them how she worked for a company that manufactured hydraulic connectors and valves. I told them I was going to UCLA, working on my teaching degree. They told us how they sold real estate, custom-painted expensive cars, managed a Taco Bell, went to school. After that morning, we saw one or two of them from a distance, but never met or talked with them again. At 11.45, the rear doors opened. 
The third shift flooded out onto the streets, sidewalks, and parking lots, combining their numbers with the fourth shift still arriving and throwing the main avenue and surrounding neighborhood into gridlock. As for those of us already waiting at the front door, we poured like flood water into the sanctuary, moving down the aisles and filling the pews to the music of piano, organ, worship leader, and three-voice worship team. Folks all around us knew the drill. They were taking up the song even as they moved along the pews to sit down, making melody in your heart unto the King of Kings. They were raising their hands, getting into the worship. The place was already cooking. Marion and I joined in. She wasn't a tongue speaker, but she was a God lover and a hand raiser. We knew the songs, and we were enjoying it. The good things we'd heard about this church were true. The worship was robust, joyous, and heartfelt. Emotion was natural and flowing without excess. The song leader at the pulpit was a handsome, articulate man who sang with gusto and displayed his joy with dignity. The worship team standing to one side, two women and a man, were polished and well-dressed, each with a color-coded microphone. The pianist and organist were polished and coordinated. They even had an intercom between them. This church seemed to cater to the educated. Anyone who spoke from the platform spoke well, using words like problematic, specificity, pedagogical, well-orbed, and even college-brewed hybrids like distantiate. You never heard a double negative, and I never caught anyone using where and at in the same sentence. There had to be teachers in the congregation. Cool. Pastor Dale Harris lived up to our expectations and then some. A man of medium height and broad build, he was animated, personable, and articulate, and he loved to work the audience. The psalmist says that praise is comely for the upright, which you can take to mean that praise and worship lift the countenance. When you praise more, you look better. Turn to somebody and say, you look like you've been praising the Lord. Go ahead. Marion and I turned to the people on either side of us and said at the same time they did, You look like you've been praising the Lord. And then we all had a pleasant social laugh about it. Pastor Harris taught out of Ephesians that morning, and we hung on his every word. It was great stuff, insightful and eloquently presented. When he was finished, he gave an altar call, and even that had a nice touch of no-nonsense sophistication. We offer you two questions. The first is, Do you know Jesus? The second question is simple and direct. Would you like to? If you'd like to know Jesus, after the closing prayer, just slip through this door to my left and our pastoral staff will meet with you, pray with you, and show you how to find him. We're not set up here to argue or debate. You know the answers to the questions I've offered. You know what to do. We sang the closing song, and I saw six or seven people go to that door. Souls finding Jesus. What a feeling. At the close of the service, I decided I'd like to go to the front and greet Pastor Harris. Just let him know who we were, where we were from, and how happy we were to be in the service. We stepped into the aisle and had to swim against the current. Everyone else was heading in the opposite direction. I looked around all the heads, returning smiles as I tried to see up front. I couldn't see him anywhere. I think he's gone, said Marion, holding my hand so we wouldn't get separated. I kept going anyway. I'd never been to a church like this, and I didn't know any better. We broke into the clear near the front of the sanctuary and found one man standing near a door to the right of the platform. He was either an associate pastor or an usher. He had that man-in-charge look about him. Good morning, he said. Good afternoon, I said, aware of the time. I shook his hand and introduced us. Miles Newberry, he said, associate pastor. We just moved down from Seattle. I'm going to UCLA, working on my teaching degree, and Marion's working for... I went on. I thought it would be okay to be conversational. An usher came up. Miles, did you check with Ron about the alternate scheduling? I don't think we're reading off the same page. Miles said to me. It's good to have you with us this morning. Have you filled out a visitor card? Oh, we had. I dug it out of my jacket pocket. Yeah, here you go. But Miles was talking to the usher. The page is right. Ron is wrong, and I told him that. He saw the visitor card in my hand. No, nope, don't give it to me. It's supposed to go in the offering plate. Were you here for the offering? Suddenly I felt a little stupid. Uh, yeah, sure. We just didn't have it filled out in time. He shook my hand again. Well, next time just drop it in the offering plate. It's nice to have you here. Then he turned to the usher. Henry and Al have it squared away. Let them handle it. Marion tugged at my hand. 
I thought I was still having a conversation with Miles Newberry. I'd like to say hello to Pastor Harris. Miles Newberry smiled. I'll tell him you said hello. He went back to the usher. We're implementing it this Sunday, but locking it in next Sunday. That's the mix-up. Marion got the hint long before I did, and tugged at my hand again. I finally followed. Elvis has left the building, she said. I looked again toward the empty platform and toward every door where people hurried to join the gridlock. No Pastor Harris. As a matter of fact, no pastor at all. This wasn't the chatty, leisurely after-service leaving we were used to. This was an evacuation. Please keep moving toward the doors, said another usher, his hands extended to press upon our backs if need be. We need to clear the building. Well, I thought, this is how they do things in L.A. I have a lot to learn. Because we were in the last shift, we could go out any door we wanted. Marion and I chose the front door again and walked several blocks back to our car. Pretty neat service, I commented. They move you through there quick, don't they? She replied. Yeah. At the moment, I wasn't sure whether that was good or bad. He snubbed us. Huh? Who? That Miles Blueberry or whatever his name was? Well, I don't think he meant it. He was busy. The usher was more important than we were, didn't you notice? Well, I did notice, but I didn't want to fuel any negative feelings by saying so. It's a big church. They have to keep things running smoothly. Then the church is more important than us? I wanted to try the church for a while. This was Southern California, I told her. People down here are used to standing in line two hours for a three-minute ride at Disneyland. They did hours of business by cell phone, just waiting for a chance to pull onto Ventura Boulevard. Everywhere they went was far and through traffic, so they described distances not in miles, but in minutes. There was more to do than time to do it. Churches could get so big that the pastor couldn't possibly stick around to greet everyone. We could learn to live with that. We could get used to it. It was a different world down here. I gradually talked her over to my side. That was in the days when I prided myself on my logical, empirical way of viewing things, and figured she responded too much from emotion. Actually, she had already seen the end from the beginning. We made the Cathedral of Life our church home, and just as I was raised, we never missed a service. We were there Sunday morning for whatever service could fit us in. We turned out Sunday evenings and always got in, even if we had to watch the service on closed-circuit television in an overflow room. We were there every Wednesday night without fail. We planned our day in order to make it to the young married Sunday school class, one couple among fifty other couples. When there was a business meeting, we were there, on time, thoroughly studied, and ready to vote. This was a deeply religious matter for me. It was time for me to humble myself and submit to God-appointed authority. If the man of God was sharing the word, it was our duty to be there. So we were always there, humble and submitted. For ten straight months, we waited on the front steps for the ushers to unlock the doors, entered praising the Lord, and got out fast so the ushers could lock them again. In every service, we stood when told to stand, sat when told to sit, raised our hands, clapped our hands, said amen, and turned to greet those around us the moment we were told to do so. Every Sunday, the pastor told us to turn to someone and say to them whatever catchy phrase he wanted us to say, and we always turned and said it, laughing a social laugh at the cuteness of it. If Pastor Harris warned us against being Prideful and self-willed, we repented and prayed that the Lord would help us be more childlike and submissive. When he said he saw an ugly spirit of pride attaching itself to members of the body to make them rebellious, we believed him. When he spoke about laughter being good for the soul, we all broke out laughing. We even did what we were told when sitting in the overflow room watching Pastor Harris on television. The image on the screen would tell us to stand clap, greet one another, say something to somebody, repent of this or that, and say amen if we agreed and we did it. It was a little bizarre at first, responding and talking to a television image that didn't see or hear us. It seemed odd to turn to a total stranger at Pastor Harris's prompting and bear our souls, what we were feeling, what we were hearing from God, what we wanted to change in our lives, what temptations were still a snare to us. But we did it, and we got used to it. We were new to the young married Sunday school class, 
Fifty couples wearing name tags and setting their own trend in polyester. During the brief coffee and fellowship time, we tried mingling. I stepped up to meet two young urban professionals, nose to nose in a theological discussion over styrofoam cups of coffee. Don't you think the Pauline approach is epistemological, at least in part? said one. Well, only if you bring epistemology to bear on the order of the list, said the other. But I'm not talking about the specificity of the order. You can't force the specificity. Oh, no, not at all. I think Paul intended a general well-orbed presentation. Otherwise, the whole list becomes problematic. We're distantiating election and free will. But there should be a distantiation. That's what I'm saying. Should I say hello? Would that be interrupting? Should I wait for them to notice me standing there? Should I stick my name tag on my forehead? They never noticed me standing there and never paused long enough for me to enter in. They just went on with their discussion, talking like Pastor Harris and oblivious to my presence. Perhaps I needed to learn the vocabulary. Perhaps I needed to comb my hair straight back and get a pair of white shoes and a white belt. Marion tried to join a conversation between three mothers. Well, sometimes I spank her out her bare bottom, said one. But you're talking heavy logistics. The second shook her head shamingly. But you have to deal with that spirit of rebellion. The correction has to be felt. I tried the Gerber peaches, but they gave Jamie the runs, said the third. I'm going through more diapers. Try the peas, said the first. Buddy loves the peas, but Jamie hates peas. The second lady leaped on that one. Ah, uh -uh, rebellion, deal with it. Marion decided it wouldn't be courteous to introduce herself. Kids were the subject here, not hydraulic valves and couplers. No one asked her who she was anyway. We met back at the refreshment counter and picked up a cookie for each of us. Well, said one gal to her friend, I can't tell you the details or I'll speak it into existence. It depends on how you phrase it, I think. We headed for our seats. How often do you make love? Miles Newberry asked another couple as we walked by. He could have been a doctor asking about their frequency of bowel movement. Conversations in that class were a little hard to get into. But you could get into a program. The Cathedral of Life had programs, conceived and administered from the top down, and no program, event, or activity ever materialized without a logo. The morning service had a logo, the sun rising with little Y-shaped people praising the Lord in front of it. Wednesday night's logo was a long, winding trail with a glowing mountain in the middle and on each end. The young married's class had a Y-shaped father and Y-shaped mother with little Y-shaped kids. Every class, every activity, every age group had a logo. Our young married's class was a program with its own program, Young Married's Fellowship Night. Once a month, someone at the top would sort through the roster cards and assign each couple to a group of four couples. That group would then go out together and fellowship, go to dinner, play miniature golf, whatever the group coordinator decided. We all wore T-shirts with a classy-looking YMFN logo on the front and a scripture, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, on the back. The next month, someone would shuffle the cards, so we never went out with the same people twice. To hear Miles Newberry tell it, this was to ensure a well-orbed relationship with the rest of the body of Christ. We went along with it tapping colored golf balls through windmills and past waterfalls, and carrying on superficial conversations, all the while stifling suggestions from Satan that the church was picking our friends for us. I really had a hard time getting it through my head that the Cathedral of Life did not need nor desire my help. Every church I had ever been a part of always needed help with something, whether it was teachers for the Sunday school or volunteers to clean the building once a month, or just greeters to stand inside the doorway and pass out bulletins to people arriving. I was ready to be a servant, to do things the right way, to humble myself and be useful somewhere, somehow. We already have a trained staff, said the youth pastor. Thanks, anyway. The banjo, said the music minister with a half-smile. Why? The chief usher shook his head. I've got all the greeters I need. You'll have to complete a greeter program anyway, and that would require a year's membership. We'll talk about it, brother, said Miles Newberry. And we never did. They did everything and had no procedure for dealing with two unknown faces emerging from the multitude and wanting to do something. 
So month after month, we continue to show up, hurry in, praise the Lord, hear the word, and hurry out with the thousands. We put our tithe check into the offering plate and supported those highly trained, hand-picked folks who ran all those programs with all those logos. Surely we could get used to feeling unknown and unneeded every Sunday. Someday we would conquer the cynicism we felt every time we turned to greet those around us, knowing the likelihood of ever seeing them again. After all, this was our role as members. The role of the pastoral staff, apparently, was to create and maintain the proper image. Pastor Dale Harris took full advantage of video, which seemed reasonable given the size his task would have been without it. The drawback for us was the subtle awareness that crept in as we sat with hundreds in an overflow room watching his image. To all the thousands, whether in the sanctuary or in the overflow room, an image was all he was and ever would be. When we joined the church as members, we gathered in the overflow room with about thirty others for a new members' orientation and welcome meeting. Pastor Harris came in to greet us, and I'd never seen him so close. I'd never heard his voice unamplified. I'd never seen the natural color of his face or the blemishes on his jaw. He said a few words of introduction, and then we watched a video recording of him speaking to us about the duties and obligations of church membership. Unity, 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 he said. As God has brought us together to be stones in his temple, so we must be set in place by his Spirit and mortared to one another by love. We are a worshiping church he said. And in our meetings we strive to touch the throne room of God in our praise of him. Oh, dear, he said, pardon me, but if this is not your heart, if you do not wish to enter the presence of God with us in this way, please don't join the church. We are to be of one mind, he said, an army marching together. These were fair and honest words, and on their face they were agreeable enough. It was only in the months that would follow that we realized the prerequisite for such unity. The abandonment of our wills and judgment to the organic will of the thousands, which in turn was controlled every Sunday by the man at the top. The man we did not know. When the video ended and the screen went to snow, he returned to extend to us the right hand of fellowship and welcome us into the congregation. I can still see the face of one young man weeping, embracing, Pastor Dale Harris. He was home now, part of the family. He'd found a shepherd. Months later, I would reflect on that moment and wonder, did that young man know that this was the only time he would ever embrace his pastor? Did he consider that his pastor would never again touch or look him in the eye? This pastor would never turn aside to greet him by name or return his smile from the platform. After this evening, his face, his name, his very existence would drop from the pastor's memory, and the pastor would retreat once again behind his phalanx of associates who spoke his jargon and kept the machinery running from behind those dark, cherry office doors. After this evening, Pastor Dale Harris would once again be a face, a voice, a two-dimensional, unknowable, untouchable image, and all of us would become unseen, unknown, nameless faces in the sea of thousands, all marching in step. I don't suppose that young man thought of such things at the time. When I embraced the pastor, I wasn't thinking of such things either. But I think Marion knew it all along. It took my sister, Renee, to hit us over the head with it. She'd been hitting me over the head with her big sister wisdom ever since we were kids, so she had no qualms or hesitations. She came to visit us in the spring when we'd been at the cathedral for ten months and been members for six. When we took her to church with us on Sunday morning, it was the first time she'd ever been there. We got to the sidewalk at our usual time, but for some reason the main sanctuary filled up before we could get in. The ushers, standing in a long, tight line like traffic cones, directed us downstairs into the overflow room where the television was set up. We and three hundred other people went through the Sunday routine in front of that tube, worshipping, greeting one another, saying things to each other, asking the stranger on either side a personal question about their spirituality, hearing the message, and then getting out of there, walking along another line of living traffic cones. Renee wasn't much of a participant that morning. She just sat quietly, listening, observing, and being a courteous guest. 
Sunday evening, she didn't become difficult, but she did ask with wonder, You're going back there again? I knew Renee wasn't an avid churchgoer. Our strict church first upbringing seemed to have had the opposite effect on her. Well, I said, it's how we do things. It's part of our covenant with the Lord and with our local church body. If the man of God is sharing the word, it's our duty to be there. She looked horrified, but said nothing. She came with us to the Sunday night meeting, and this time we got into the main sanctuary, but had to sit up in the balcony. I was a little nervous because she was new and hadn't had a chance to learn the balcony rules. Make sure you keep your purse tucked under your seat. I instructed her, talking close to her ears so she could hear me over the worship music. We have to keep the aisle in front of us clear. We managed to find some seats at the very front of the balcony. Uh-oh, there were a lot of rules here. Um, uh, make sure you keep your Bible beside you, not on the railing. She moved down the pew ahead of me toward the wall. No, don't sit there. You'll block the television lights. And don't touch the brass railing. The fingerprints dull the shine. She sat down slowly, looking at me and giving me time to stop her in case that was a wrong thing to do. I nodded to her that it was okay. An usher hurried up. Pardon me, we're trying to keep this row clear. There were already thirty people moving down the row behind us. He called to them, We have to keep this row clear, folks. Sorry. We backed all the way out and found the next row up. It was a thirty-foot pew, and there were enough bottoms to far exceed that capacity. Renee sat across the aisle from us and got out her pen to jot something down. I tried to warn her, but... Too late. An usher tapped her on the shoulder. Excuse me, we can't allow fountain pens in the balcony. She put her pen down, stroked her forehead a moment, and then looked up at the usher. The worship singing was full and spirited, but I imagine half the balcony could hear her question. Is there anything else I'm not supposed to do? Do you have a list I can read? Is there a class I can take? Is there any way I can save you the trouble of harassing me? I had seen people get booted out of the balcony before. I started across the aisle. A second usher stopped me, his hand on my chest. Sir, please sit down. You're disturbing the service. I sat down. My sister was going nose to nose with an usher and about to be removed, and I sat down. Marion gaped at me. What are we doing? Renee's in trouble. Renee was gathering her things. Travis, I'm leaving. She stood and waved to the people in the balcony. Goodbye, everyone. Happy churching. Marion and I got up. An usher held up his hand at chest level in front of us. Please sit down. Marion maintained a mature dignity and poise. Stand aside, she told him, or I will scratch your eyes out. He stood aside. Marion followed Renee, and I followed Marion, cringing to think how grieved the Holy Spirit must be. We tried to keep up with Renee as she stormed down the sidewalk, heading for our car and parking area, too. Knowing Renee, I was aware she'd been patient to the point of sainthood, but now her time had come. She'd seen it all, heard it all, digested it all, and she was ready to comment. Why, oh why, do you subject yourselves to this? Well, it's a big church in a big city, I started to say. That is religious, God-tripping, cockamamie. I won't complete her full description of my excuse. Have you lost your mind? That's not a church. It's a Christian factory. They have to control. She stopped and looked back at the building, pointing. Do they even know who you are? Well, it's, do they? Does anyone at that church know who you are? Marion answered, her own pain showing. Not really. You say it's your church home. Does it know when you're home? Does it even care? I tried to shrug it off. You get used to it. No! She grabbed my arm, on the verge of tears. Don't get used to it, Travis. Don't you ever get used to it. Don't let them do this to you. We went back to our little apartment, had soup and sandwiches, and talked until close to midnight. To summarize the whole evening, we were hit soundly over the head by an outsider who still had eyes to see. We broke down and wept finally getting in touch with the pain we'd been trying to suppress for ten months. We concluded that the cathedral did not attract people like René, and accepted the truth that the cathedral could never hold much attraction for us, either. We never went back. But more than a year later, we continued to receive a monthly calendar and letter from Pastor Dale Harris, telling us how much we were loved and how he appreciated our continuing participation and support. We found another church, also well spoke of, 
and were astounded and relieved to find that there was nothing seriously wrong with us. We weren't in the wrong. We were just in the wrong church. We met the pastor the first Sunday, and he remembered our names the next Sunday. We could easily join conversations with people just like us and made friends immediately. We got to know the pastoral staff, the way people get to know people, and we didn't even need name tags. And we could serve. When the pastor announced they needed help carrying in folding chairs, we leaped at the chance and just about cried from the joy. Next, we handed out bulletins at the door and welcomed people coming in. I got out my banjo and helped with the worship at our Wednesday night home group meeting. Three months later, I was leading a home group myself. So we grew in the Lord. We learned, we matured, and when we finally left Southern California, we had made friends for life. After the cathedral, it was surprising how easy it was. I don't consider myself scarred or wounded by the cathedral of life experience, but I admit I picked up a few quirks. I never believe anything just because a big-named Christian leader says it. I never do anything I don't want to do just because a pastor, presuming to be the voice of God, tries to coerce me with guilt or threats. I no longer respond to visions God gives to others about what I should or should not do, think, or be. And since the cathedral, I have never, and will never again, turn to someone and say something the pastor tells me to say. Never. 20. When I told them about my telephone encounter with the Cathedral of Life, Morgan and Kyle laughed, then apologized for laughing and offered to help me out with airfare to L.A. So, with teeth gritted, I called the Cathedral one more time, got bounced all around the premises by secretaries and answering machines, and finally, miracles still happen, got an appointment to see Associate Pastor Norm Corrigan on Tuesday, June 9th, at 10 in the morning, for one hour. Tuesday, June 9th at 9.30 in the morning, I was there, dressed in suit and tie and ready to go nose to nose. The new building was spectacular. Stone, brick, and acres and acres of tinted glass. Fountains, walkways, trees, shrubs, and tons of beauty bark and lava rock. Inside, miles of rich carpet and fine woodwork. Sitting areas the size of major hotel lobbies. Fine furniture, high ceilings, and massive chandeliers. A huge brass plaque bearing the names of all those who gave $10,000 or more to the building project. The receptionist in the front lobby sat inside a circular reception desk the size of a ten-person hot tub. She pulled out a map and traced a route for me to follow to the administrative offices. I thanked her, and holding the map before me, set out. I took a brief side trip to peek through one of the ten rear sanctuary doors. The sanctuary reminded me of some of the finer performing arts centers around the country. It was capacious, high-tech, and very, very nice. I moved on, guided by the map, walking down one hallway, then making a right turn into another, fascinated by the mixture of emotions and attitudes churning within me. On the one hand, I felt dazzled and excited. What a success story! On the other hand, I still had a chip on my shoulder. If anybody tried to play the bureaucrat or hassle me, I wasn't going to take it. Was anyone going to recognize me? My eyes darted about, looking for familiar faces or pictures on the wall to tell me who was still there. How about the usher who harassed my sister, Renee? Hopefully he'd let me read the list of don'ts for this building before asking me to leave. I wondered if Miles Newberry was still there, still teaching the young married Sunday school class. It would be the middle-aged marrieds by now. I envisioned the logo, the letters M-A-M, -M, resting in an empty nest. And what if I actually bumped into the pastor of this place? What would I do? What would I say? The answers that came to mind betrayed my attitude. You'll never bump into him because he gets in and out of here through a secret tunnel. Even if you did see him, he'd be flanked by at least two associates and on his way somewhere important. I rebuked myself, asked the Lord's forgiveness, and pressed on. I could see a wall of glass at the end of this hallway, with two glass double doors and an office space beyond. As I approached, I could make out the bold gold letters on the glass. The offices. I went through the doors. Beyond the reception desk were six office cubicles and six secretaries, and beyond the cubicles was a hallway with lots of dark cherry doors on either side. 
I told the receptionist who I was and with whom I had an appointment, and she directed me to a long, overstuffed couch where I could wait. From where I sat, I could see down the hallway with the dark cherry doors and make out some of the brass nameplates. The names I could read I didn't recognize. It had been almost twenty years. As for those big double-paneled doors at the end of the hall with their own secretary sitting at a desk nearby, they could only belong to the man who was unavailable for telephone calls and would take three months to see if I made an appointment. Pastor Dale Harris. I held a black leather valise in my lap. It contained every scrap of information I possessed about Brandon Nichols, alias Herb Johnson, alias whoever he claimed to be when he had been here. If he had been here. That was still a strong hunch, but not a certainty. This whole visit could turn something up, or it could end up a waste of dwindling time and scarce cash. I still had fifteen minutes until my appointment. Fifteen minutes and another hunch that might expedite my visit. There was a water fountain between the hallway and me. I rose casually from the couch, helped myself to some water, and then walked casually down that hall past all the closed cherry doors. Most of the names were new. Richard Drake, Ben Montesquieu, a few others. Ah, here was Norm Corrigan's. I kept walking. Miles Newberry, he was still around. Then I stood before the desk of Pastor Harris's pleasant, middle-aged secretary. She looked up. Can I help you? Hi, I'm Travis Jordan from Antioch, Washington. I have an appointment with Norm Corrigan in 15 minutes. She indicated the couch I'd just come from. If you'd like to take a seat, Pastor Corrigan will be right with you. Oh, I've already checked in. I opened my valise. I thought while I was waiting I might see if you could help me out. I read the nameplate on her desk. Uh, Mrs. or is it Miss? She smiled. It's Mrs. Mrs. Fontanelli. A man has come to our town who, in certain ways, is claiming to be Jesus Christ. That raised her eyebrows and, I hoped, piqued her interest. We're trying to find out who he really is, and by certain hints he dropped we think he may have attended this church at one time. Have you been here at the cathedral for very long? Ten years or so. I handed her a photograph of Nichols slash Johnson. Have you ever seen this man? This gal would never win at poker. Her reaction was so strong you could read it a mile away. Um, my word. She looked down at her desk and would not look up at me. This was one of those silent, awkward moments, but it gave me time to consider. If Pastor Harris's secretary instantly recognized one face out of thousands and had such a strong reaction, that said a lot. I take it you've encountered this man before? Yes. She volunteered nothing beyond that. Have you been Pastor Harris's secretary for very long? She seemed glad I asked her a question she could easily answer. Oh, um, five years. And was it during that time that you encountered this man? She tried to compose herself. Um... Who was it you were here to see? Norm Corrigan. She tapped the photo lying on her desk. Were you seeing him about this? I sure was. She made a little O oh with her mouth and nodded to herself. Then she picked up her telephone. Could you? Excuse me. Please, have a seat on the couch? Sure thing. I took back the photograph and walked slowly, hoping, even praying, I'd be able to overhear what she said into the telephone. All I could make out was, Tammy? Talk to Norm. We need Miles. I sat down on the couch and watched the little stir my photograph and questions caused. One of the six secretaries at this end, her name card said Tammy Orenfelt, was stealing little sidelong glances at me as she and Mrs. Fontanelli spoke in hushed tones. Yes, I heard Tammy say. For ten o'clock. All right, I'll ask him. Both secretaries hung up at the same time. Tammy punched in another number and said, I need to interrupt you. Mrs. Fontanelli made a quick call herself and then ducked into Miles Newberry's office while Tammy hurried down the hall and ducked into Norm Corrigan's. I knew Brandon Nichols was the kind of man who would not allow himself to be lost in the crowd. One way or another, he would make himself known, especially to the leadership, especially to the pastor he could describe so well and seemed so bitter against. Now a man who had to be Norm Corrigan came out of his office and crossed to Miles Newberry's as Tammy came back to her desk acting like she wasn't watching me. There was a three-person conference going on in Newberry's office. I checked my watch. My appointment with Corrigan was coming up. I wondered what their line would be. The door opened. 
Norm Corrigan hurried back to his office. Mrs. Fontenelle hurried back to her desk, and Miles Newberry came strolling down the hall toward me. He was graying nicely and had put on a little more weight. He looked good for being twenty years older. I knew he wouldn't notice whether I looked different. Hi, he said, extending his hand. Miles Newberry, and you are— I stood, shaking his hand. Travis Jordan, I have an appointment with Norm Corrigan. I looked at my watch. Right now. Norm's had something come up. May we talk? It felt funny to be standing eye to eye with this man, having his undivided attention. Twenty years ago, he promised we'd do this. Okay. We went into his office, and he closed the door. Rather than sit behind his desk, he sat in one chair facing me as I sat in another. It didn't exactly make me feel more comfortable, but I appreciated the protocol. Now, what can we do for you? He asked. I imagine you've heard from Mrs. Fontenelle, I said. I'm here trying to find out anything you can tell me about this man. I gave him the same explanation I gave Mrs. Fontenelle and showed him the same photograph. He was not at all happy to see it. He scowled, drew a deep breath, sighed it out, then asked me, What do you intend to do with this? I need to know who he is, who he really is, and how I can deal with him. I need to know his background and what would motivate him to get into this false Christ routine. If you can tell me anything you know about him, I'd greatly appreciate it. He ignored my question. What makes you think he was here at this church? He talks like he was here, and he's very bitter. Oops. That sounded unkind, but then again, it was true. Miles Newberry chuckled. To shed my unintentional stab, I thought, Well, this is a big church and we get all kinds. Not everyone who comes through here is going to be happy with us. I wanted an answer to my first line of questions. Do you know this man? Not personally, no. I noticed his body language. We were in his office, but he was the one acting cornered. But you know who he is. I could sense reluctance in his answer. Yes, we know who he is. So he did attend this church for a time. I already told you that. Actually, no, you didn't. Well, he did. And when was that? He looked at the ceiling. He took another breath. He was clearly not comfortable. I would guess two or three years ago. Did he have a name? He looked at me curiously. I explained. He's used two different names that I know of, and I'm suspecting a third. He whistled his amazement, but said nothing further. This guy was not a bubbling spring of information. Is there a problem here? I feel like you don't want to talk about this. You have to understand that we do a lot of counseling here, and that we hold a lot of information in confidence. Even his name? Well, please don't take offense, but we don't know who you are. We don't know what you're going to do with the information. We have relationships and confidences we have to protect. I'm sure you understand. Perhaps I should tell you what this man is doing in our town. I recapped Nichols slash Johnson's career, showing Miles Newberry some news articles from the local paper, as well as from the bigger papers in Seattle and Spokane. I can understand you're wanting to protect whomever he may have hurt, but given the circumstances, I'm not so sure you'd be wise to protect him. Newberry studied the articles. So now he's healing people? I've seen him do it. His pain was showing as he handed back the articles. When he was here, he went by the name Justin Cantwell. Then he conceded, and he was trouble. I waited for him to elaborate, but he didn't. What kind of trouble? I can't go into that. Justin Cantwell. I wrote it down. Any idea where he was from? Any background? He sighed. I need to talk to some people before I can give out any more information. Will you be around tomorrow? This was a major frustration, and I didn't try to hide it. I have to fly back tonight. It's one of those round-trip discount things. Well, leave us a number, and we'll call you. Now, where had I heard that line before? What about Pastor Harris? Does he know anything about Cantwell? I'll have to ask him. Let's ask him now. He's unavailable right now. Is he here on the premises? He's unavailable. I tried to control the emotion in my voice. He's always unavailable. What about Norm Corrigan? Miles Newberry shrugged. He wouldn't know anything about this. He's new on staff? That's right. But Mrs. Fontenelle's run into this guy. The photograph really upset her. He nodded. She was here then. So it makes sense that Pastor Harris knew him. He got tense. Are you digging for something? Only because it's buried. 
Please don't take offense, but I have a very dangerous man deceiving my town according to an agenda. My friends and I spent a good deal of money getting me down here, and when you stonewall on behalf of Pastor Harris, I get uncomfortable. If you know about Cantwell and Mrs. Fontenelle knows about Cantwell, it's inconceivable that this hasn't somehow touched Pastor Harris. I'd like to talk with him. His eyes narrowed. Before we go any further, I need to warn you about something. I was listening. This church has been appointed by God as a light in this city. It has his blessing and his mandate to spread the gospel and make disciples. He indicated my valise. If you try to cause this church any harm with this information, you'll be opposing God, and that's never advisable. I stopped. Twenty years ago, his warning would have scared me. Today, I felt vindicated. Reverend Newberry, when I attended this church, I always sensed that kind of attitude trickling down from the leadership. I never thought I'd hear anyone verbalize it. He gave me a curious look. He was about to ask me, so I told him. Yeah, my wife and I attended this church about twenty years ago. I don't expect you to remember me, because you never knew me in the first place, and it's obvious you don't know me now, or you wouldn't have said what you just said to me. But I thank you for your candor, and I'm sure I can count on your help. I leaned toward him, eye to eye. He was going to regret not sitting behind his desk. I need to hear from anyone who has had direct dealings with Justin Cantwell, and if that includes Pastor Harris, I need to hear from him, not you on behalf of him. No more running interference, okay? No more putting me off. The devil's at work in Antioch, and we don't have time for that. He returned my gaze for a moment, and then nodded as if in agreement. Leave me your number. Brandon Nichols chuckled and lovingly patted Matt Kiley on his bowed head. Get up, Matt. No need to grovel. Matt Kiley was on his knees in the straw before the Messiah of Antioch, ready to plead, bargain, cajole, do anything to get his strength back. The moment the boss touched him, he felt it coursing through him. His arms, his back, his legs were strong again, maybe even stronger. He leaped quickly to his feet, flexing and stretching. All there again? The boss asked, holding Matt at arm's length and inspecting him. Matt was about to answer, but his throat choked with emotion. He nodded instead. They were standing in the barn at the Macon Ranch. The boss was supervising as two new followers unloaded a truckload of oats, stacking the sacks on a pallet. The boss nodded toward the feed sacks. Let's try those arms out. Matt put up his dukes and gave the sacks a few solid punches. His legs felt like powerful springs under him. He danced, bobbed, weaved like a boxer. Wham, wham. He pounded dents in the sacks. It felt great. Yeah, he hollered, then threw his arms around the boss. He'd never been a hugger before this. The boss was pleased. All right, then. You have your strength. But remember, Matt, your strength comes from me. It's mine for my use. No more wasting it on foolish brawling. Okay, you got it. Oh, he remembered something and reached into his pocket. The other merchants asked me to give you these gift cards. You can use them to get discounts on lodging, meals, just about anything in town. Pass them out to the pilgrims. It's our way of saying thanks. Tell them thanks for me. My lord, called Michael the prophet, hurrying into the barn. Armand Harrison is here. Nicholas's eyes brightened as he turned to see Armand Harrison and a lovely young lady walking in with Michael. Hello and welcome. Harrison shook hands with Antioch's Messiah, then introduced the young lady. This is Gail, the one we talked about. The Messiah was delighted. Gail was in awe. Harrison told her, He'll take good care of you, and trust me, you'll be a different woman when you leave here. Michael, take her to her room in the guest house. I'll be along shortly. Michael gave a little bow, and then led Gail along with a touch of his hand. Her husband's gone, Armin explained. In the Navy. She's had some real problems with that. Nichols gave a wise and understanding nod. She needs comfort. Fulfillment. He smiled. Don't worry. Armin smiled. I won't. Cindy, the young woman I spoke to you about, is a gentle sort and reasonably well-adjusted. But I've told her she could benefit from the communal environment you have with your group. And, of course, your wisdom regarding... Of course. 
As they left the barn, chatting enthusiastically about their ministry relationship, Matt only sighed with envy. The boss always got what he wanted. Don Anderson was turning around repair jobs so quickly, people were starting to comment on his speedy service. He was careful never to let visitors see him using his special gift, and often he'd tinker away with his tools just for show. But in the week that followed that special touch from Brandon Nichols, he had cleared almost every item to be repaired from the shelves of his workroom. Now he was actually getting a little bored and started tinkering just for the fun of it. Some more repair jobs came in today. The Steen's VCR wouldn't rewind until he touched it. He made out a bill for how much time it would have taken him to fix it. It would have taken him three hours, well, more like four, to fix Lonnie Thompson's tape deck that wouldn't go around. With one touch that took less than a second, he made it go around. Lonnie was still going to be billed for four hours. An electric mixer came to life again, as did a wireless doorbell. Don spent most of his man hours just writing up the bills. Then there was the Borson's CD player, a nice one with a rotating deck that held five CDs at once. The rotating deck didn't rotate. He hit the open button and it slid open. Hmm. Kenny Borson left a heavy metal CD in this thing. No wonder the deck was malfunctioning. Then the craziest notion came over Don, and he ran his finger in a circle around the face of the CD as if he could actually read the digital recording through his fingertip. It was just a silly whim, but still he wondered. Somewhere in his head he could hear some raging, wailing, wildfire guitar work, every blasting, distorted note like a toothache set to music. It was giving him a toothache. He removed his finger. The sound stopped. He looked at his fingertip. No, he thought. Don, now you're leaping a little too high. Well, there were other CDs in the store. A little experiment would settle any doubts. He found one of Mozart, and no sooner picked it up than he heard the opening strains of Symphony No. 40 in G major. He shifted his gentle hold on the CD so that his fingers rested in another spot. Symphony No. 39 in E-flat. Man, oh man! He thought, what else can I do? When Jim Baylor came home from work, the house was quiet. In this household, such quiet was seldom a normal or good thing, and it made him uncomfortable. D? No answer. His first thought was that she was up at the ranch again, lingering after the afternoon meeting, all gaga over Mr. Messiah and forgetting her starving family at home. But this was Wednesday and Mr. Messiah wasn't holding any meetings on Wednesdays. He went into the kitchen, then the living room. D? What? Her voice came from the bedroom, low and muffled, and she certainly wasn't laughing. He hurried down the hall and to the bedroom door. She was curled up in a near-fetal position on the bed, hugging a pillow to her head, her expression just this side of death. D? What's wrong? She muttered into the pillow. He could hardly hear her. What do you care? Jim hated it when something would happen to Dee that he just couldn't understand and didn't know how to fix. He suspected this might be one of those times. What's bothering you? Nothing. He approached the bed and sat on the edge. She rolled over, turning her back to him. Just leave me alone. You always do anyway. You don't care about me. Nobody does. Sure I care about you. I love you. You're my wife. If I died, you'd all be a lot happier. Jim tried to tell her that wasn't true, and Dee kept talking about how worthless she was and how no one loved her and how she wanted to die, and the conversation went around and around on the same merry-go-round for several minutes. Finally, Jim got impatient enough to ask, What happened? Did Brandon Nichols hurt your feelings? That raised her temperature a little. What do you care? You know what Jack McKinstry told me? He said Mary Donovan thinks she's Mary, you know, the Virgin Mary. Yes, so what? And I hear Adrian's talking to an angel. Did you hear about that? She curled up tighter. Will you just get out of here? D. maybe you're just bugged because they've got this stuff happening to them and none of it's happening to you. She flipped over like a fish on a rock. You don't know anything, Jim Baylor, how could you? You don't know the Lord, you don't care, and you don't know diddly squat about spiritual things or what God's doing on the earth, so don't try to tell me. 
He matched her volume, and by now it was getting high. You don't think I know anything? Hey, I'm not lying on the bed like some kind of beached whale. Her strength was returning. What did you call me? Wanting to die. More strength, more voice. What did you call me? I'm not the one who spilled frozen french fries all over the table and cha cha for Jesus while my family went hungry. That was the joy of the Lord. We could squirt each other and then dance a bit. Maybe look at the clouds. It'll be a blast. She nearly screamed. That was the joy of the Lord. What joy of the Lord? You're lying here wanting to die. What kind of joy is that? You wouldn't understand. I understand you lying on the bed feeling sorry for yourself. What's that? The pits of the Lord? She let out a war cry and threw the pillow at him. Yeah, that's it. That's it. He backed out the door, angrily pointing his finger at her. Go ahead and stew. We'll see if Brandy Boy comes to cheer you up again. Ah! She reached for the lamp to throw, but he slammed the bedroom door and stomped down the hall. He got out of the house. He'd eat at Judy's tonight. Maybe he'd get good and drunk, too. I'll bet you never imagined you were so enlightened. I'd no sooner come in the door than the phone rang. It was Brandon Nichols, alias Herb Johnson, alias Justin Cantwell. I have expected this call. Hello, Justin. He betrayed no reaction to my use of his third name. Did you talk with Pastor Dale? I sat on the couch, smiling at his question. Pastor Dale was unavailable. Oh, really? I talked to Miles Newberry. He laughed. Ah, good old Miles. A man you can talk to for hours and never really meet. I had to laugh. That was the feeling I got. I quickly added. But he says you were troubled, Justin. I was. They all came within a fraction of an inch of being embarrassed. As the saying goes, I wish I'd had a camera. But did you notice, Travis? There's something different about you. You've grown. The old game hasn't changed, but you have. I suppressed a little chuckle. He was right. I used to buy everything that guy said. And you did what he told you to do? Oh, yes. And you felt guilty whenever he said so? Oh, yeah. And any misgivings were your fault every time? Yep. And this time he tried to scare you. But you didn't scare. Why is that? I've been trying to figure out why. You weren't born yesterday, that's why. Time's gone by, waters flowed under the bridge. Their game only works on certain people, and you don't fit the profile anymore. I think that's a good thing. Oh, it's good, Travis. Sometimes you can feel pretty miserable. I'm not worried. Day by day, I can see you coming around. The more you try to find out about me, the more you discover about yourself. It's just like I've always told you. We're very much the same. Of course, you didn't find out much, did you? About me, that is. Miles gave me another name for you. That's number three now. But you don't know if that's the right one, either. How much time are you willing to waste tracking it down? I don't know. I think it would help greatly if you'd stop the charade and just tell me who you are. Stop the charade? He laughed a spiteful laugh. And be the first man of God on the face of the earth to do so? Hey, come on now. You know that's not fair. No malice intended, Travis. That's just the way it is. Ministers are supposed to have their lives together and be an example. They're supposed to have all the answers. Well, they don't. So they pretend because they have to. Some of them get sick of pretending. And I commend you. His voice turned bitter. But some of them love pretending. It gives them a rush to think of all the people they're fooling. Suddenly he mimicked the tone of a fiery southern preacher. You are a sinner saved by Christ. Come to Jesus and you shall be clean. Then follow me, cause I make the rules. Salvation by grace. Christianity by performance. You have been there, Travis. Move on, let it go. You've grown since the cathedral. You can keep growing. I still have a place for you. Hmm. Get out of one charade so I can join the biggest charade of all? I'll have to think about that one. I'm not worried. And I'm sure you have nothing more to say to me about yourself. Not today. Goodbye, then. Nancy Barron sat at her desk in the back of the Antioch Harvester and Office Supply, listening to hold music on her telephone. 
It was usually this way whenever she called the county health department. Finally. This is Pete Jameson. Hi, Pete. This is Nancy Barons. Oh, hi, Nancy. What's up? I've got some questions about that water project up at the Macon Ranch. You inspected that, didn't you? Uh, yeah. Let's see. That was an upgrade, wasn't it? A new storage tank and three pressure tanks. What about the water source? Uh, that was a private well. And? What do you mean, and? I was talking to Mrs. Macon the other day, and she told me they had to develop a spring two miles behind the house. Not for me, they didn't. You didn't require an alternative water source? He laughed at the silliness of it. No. See if his Macon upgraded that well for commercial use just before he died. I required a new wellhead and some weatherizing of the well house, but that was it. You didn't require them to develop that spring? No. I didn't require or inspect development of any spring. Okay, thanks. Let's have dinner sometime. Check your calendar and call me. You got it. Nancy hung up and turned to Kim. I was right. 21. While Justin Cantwell was working his magic at the Macon Ranch, Brett Henkel was doing his best not to think about it. It was Deputy Rod Stanton's shift, his turn to serve and protect the town. So tonight, Brett sat at home with his wife Lori and their two boys, Dan and Howie, enjoying a rented movie on video. They were watching, of all things, a cop movie. The obligatory car chase was just starting. Okay, watch now, said Brett, taking popcorn from the big bowl he was sharing with Lori. They're going to turn into that alley and hit some garbage cans. The bad guy's big Lincoln screeched and fishtailed into a narrow alley, bashing aside some garbage cans, sending them flying. Now they're going to splash through some water. The bad guy's car, followed by the cop's car, hit a big puddle in the alley, sending up sheets of spray while the long telephoto shot made the cars appear right on top of each other. Dad, Howie whined, you're ruining it. Next they're going to crash through some construction barriers. Dad, the bad guys were cornered. They screeched through a tight turn and into a construction site, splintering several construction barriers. There's got to be a flip coming up somewhere, Brett mused. The bad guys roared up a street, swerved to avoid an oncoming truck, hit the back end of a parked truck, and sailed into the air, twisting upside down. Their car came down in slow motion on top of some other cars, then flipped again, landing in the street. Cool, said Dan. So much for those guys said Lori. They'll live, said Brett. The bad guys climbed out of the inverted car and ran, shooting at the good guys. Have you seen this before? Lori asked. Didn't have to, Brett replied. It's the same every... He winced, grabbing his leg. What is it? Sssss. The television screen went snowy. Hey, said the boys. Right at the good part. Brett rubbed his leg. It's that shrapnel wound. It's really poking me. But... Lori looked at the little jar on the mantle. The shrapnel that had fallen out at Brendan Nichols's touch was still there. The shrapnel isn't in there anymore. Brett recovered a little. Yeah, it hurts anyway. I don't know why. Why'd this thing stop? Dan fussed, reaching above the television to tinker with the VCR. Get back! Brett shouted, leaping to his feet, almost spilling the popcorn. Dan leaped back, his hands quivering, startled and scared. Howie sat on the floor, wide-eyed and frozen. Brett? Now just take it easy, Brett said to whom? He was looking toward the corner of the room near the television. Lori, take the boys into the kitchen. Why? Do it now. Come on, boys. Howie, come on, get up. What are you looking at? Dan asked. Go with your mother. Lori looked in the same direction as Brett and saw nothing but she felt something. Boys, get into the kitchen and stay there. What do you see, Dad? Dan was getting scared now. Go. Lori herded the boys behind her as she backed toward the kitchen, watching her husband talk to the wall. Listen, Brett was saying. I don't know what you want, but you made a big mistake coming in here. His right hand was behind his back. He was snapping his fingers. A signal. I can't hear you. Speak up. She ran into the kitchen, yanked the locked box from the cupboard above the refrigerator, and opened it with a key hidden behind the flour jar. Inside was a nine-millimeter pistol. 
She grabbed a loaded clip from a drawer, slammed it into the pistol, and returned to the living room. She stopped at the edge of the living room. She peered intensely in the direction her husband was looking, but there was no one there. Snap, snap, snap. He wanted the gun. She saw nothing, but felt a jittery sensation, like standing on the edge of a cliff. Her pulse was hammering. Behind her, the boys were starting to cry. Was her husband hallucinating? Dared she give him a loaded firearm? He grabbed it from her forcefully, pushing her behind him, taking a shooting stance. Freeze! Turn around slowly! Put your hands on the wall! Whatever it was, it was beginning to move. He followed with his aim, the muzzle of the gun sweeping across the room toward the hallway. She could feel something getting closer. Stop or I'll shoot! It didn't stop. Stop! Her skin was tingling, like a static charge. She backed away. She may have seen a shadow that didn't belong. Bang! The boys screamed. She jumped. Her trembling hands went to her ears. Her eyes searched and searched. Brett aimed down the hall. Bang! The bullet slammed into the back door. Brett ran down the hall. Hold it! She dashed into the kitchen, crouching, shielding the boys in a corner with her body as they screamed and cried. She heard the back door open, felt cold air crawling around her ankles. Her ears were humming from the shots. The telephone rang, startling her like another gunshot. She was protecting the boys. She didn't even think of answering it. Brett slammed the back door and scrambled up the hall through a blue haze of smoke, limping and cursing. The telephone rang again. He's gone. The cop movie came back on the television. Shooting, yelling, sirens. The telephone rang. She turned but did not rise. In anger, Brett grabbed the phone off the kitchen wall. Ankle! Then, Rod, get your butt over here. I've had a suspect right here in the house. The hitchhiker. That guy I told you about. He was right here in the house. What? He listened, then cursed again. Did you put her in custody? His hand went to his leg, and he bent a little, wincing in pain. No, you did the right thing. I think it's already hit the fan. Get Mark on the radio and get the two squad cars over here. One on Maple, one on Elm. I want the neighborhood combed for this guy. He listened to another question. Leave her there. We'll sort that out later. He hung up, hurried into the living room to pause the VCR, then returned to the kitchen and his wife. He noticed the gun in his hand. He quickly removed the clip and set it aside. He touched her. Lori, it's okay. Boys, it's okay. It's all over. What was it? Dan cried. Howie was speechless with fear. It was a man I picked up on the highway some weeks ago. He sneaked in somehow. He's gone now. You're okay. Lori stood. The boys just held onto her legs and remained there as she asked. The hitchhiker? Yeah. The blonde guy who told me Jesus was coming? That was him. I don't know what he wanted, but... He lowered his voice for the sake of the boys. He was up to no good. We'll have to lock the place up tight, tonight. If you want, I can take you to your mother's. The hitchhiker? She asked again. He nodded. He held her. Yeah. I knew that guy was trouble the moment he pulled that stunt in the car. Honey. She was afraid to say it. I didn't see him. It's okay. She pushed him back just enough to look in his eyes. No, really. I didn't see him. I didn't see anyone there. He returned her gaze with a blank look. He was right there. Right by the TV cabinet. He must have been hiding behind it. She began to feel another fear. A fear for her husband's sanity. Sweetheart, that cabinet's right up against the wall. You can't hide back there. He backed away. You didn't see him? He was standing right there. She could only shake her head, no. Didn't you see him run down the hall? She switched subjects. What did Rod say? Brett stood in the middle of the kitchen, looking disoriented. He arrested Penny Adams tonight. Oh, no. She'd been shoplifting from Florence Lynch's store. He and Florence went over to Bonnie Adams's place and found a closet full of stolen merchandise. And she just got her hand back. Brett winced again, his hand on his leg. Yeah, 
just like I got my leg fixed. She didn't understand. What? He picked up the gun again and slammed in the clip. It'll be okay. I'll get it straightened out. He went into the hall and grabbed his coat from the closet. You're not leaving! Lori pleaded. The town's falling apart. I can't just sit here. He kissed her and limped out the door, leaving her alone, bewildered and afraid. Dan and Howie would not let go of her. Mona Diller didn't know how to feel, happy or troubled, encouraged or frustrated. The Wheatland Motel was seeing all kinds of changes and enjoying a steady flow of business. Norman had a great brainstorm, a costly one, but it worked out. They converted two of their units to kitchenettes, and the moment they were ready, they were rented, by the month, by some of Brandon Nichols's followers. A steady stream of pilgrims took up the rest of the rooms, and now Norman was thinking of buying the old auto shop next door, raising it to the ground, and putting in a whole new wing. Things were going great. For the business. Things were not going so great between Mona and Norman. Oh, things seemed okay on the surface, but in her mind she was plagued by misgivings by the nagging questions that can bother a woman when her man seems uninterested. He'd been busy and preoccupied, of course, but it was more than that. It was, well, it had to be another woman. It was unthinkable, but that's what she thought. She had no direct knowledge, but she was sure of it. He was looking elsewhere. But it was worse than that. It was hard to describe, harder to believe, but she could sense a shifting, leering menace in his eyes that had never been there before, as if a different mind had moved in behind them, lustfully gazing everywhere else while looking toward her with disdain. She and Norman weren't talking much. She couldn't look at him. He showed no desire to look at her. Today she was trying to bury her worries by concentrating on linen inventory, what they had, what they needed, and how much of each. She was rummaging through the supply room, counting sheets and towels shelf by shelf, trying to figure out Norman's rotation system. Managing the supply room was usually his job, but he'd been busy with the kitchenettes, so the task had fallen to her. When she pulled a stack of folded sheets from a top shelf, a magazine slid out and fell on the floor. It was not necessary to pick it up or even look closer to know what kind of publication it was. The glossy photo on the cover told her all she would ever need to know. She backed away, clutching the folded sheets as if they would soften the pain now spiking through her heart. Was this the other woman? No doubt she was not the only one. Mona threw the sheets aside and reached up on the shelf, just above eye level, to feel for more. There were more. She pulled one out, saw it, dropped it, then pulled out another. She dropped it as if it were a poisonous snake bearing its fangs, then backed away, clutching the sheets to her breast. Time froze, and so did she, her arms wrapped around the stack of folded sheets, gawking at the images on the floor. Every pain she had ever felt, and thought she could avoid by working in this room, tumbled back upon her. She'd buried herself in this task to forget her troubles with Norman. But now... As soon as I returned from Southern California, I thought it important to discuss with Morgan and Kyle what I discovered, as little as it was, and to plan our next course of action. Kyle had church commitments that evening, but said Morgan and I should meet anyway. I called her and suggested we meet over dinner. Uh, where can we do that? She asked. It was a valid question. She was a minister, and it wouldn't look right for her to have a man in her home. I wasn't a minister anymore, but I was still concerned about appearances, and we both knew it wouldn't be appropriate for her to be in my home, either. If we met at Judy's, it would look like we were meeting socially, and the town was too small with too active a grapevine for something like that. Why don't we get out of town? I suggested. Maybe some place in Spokane? That would be more prudent, she said. Where would you like to go? Oh, why don't you pick a place and let me know? All right. That, too, was an overwhelming question. This was going to be a meeting with a professional lady of distinction. We couldn't go to McDonald's or Burger King. It would have to be a place with some class, some atmosphere, but not too much because this wasn't a date. What did she like? I knew of a nice Italian place with great salads, but you usually had to sit and wait for a table. 
There was a Japanese juggle the knives restaurant, but it wouldn't be a good place for a serious discussion. I liked Mexican, but the salsa would have me blowing my nose all evening. We could try Mongolian barbecue, but building your own meal from raw meat and vegetables seemed too informal. There was a nice steakhouse overlooking the Spokane River. The falls would be spectacular this time of year, but that might seem presumptuous. Wow, she said. Look at those falls. We had a table right next to the windows. White tablecloth, cloth napkins, an oil candle in the middle, two forks. She was wearing a dark purple dress with long sheer sleeves and delicate silver earrings that dangled almost to her shoulders. I'd settled for a sport jacket and tie, but wore a cream-colored shirt, less formal than a white one. We started looking over the menu, talking about what we were in the mood for. You ever done any singing? I asked offhandedly, not looking up. She replied offhandedly, Star Cloud Marmalade. I couldn't find it on the menu. What's that? The rock group I sang with. We did two albums and once warmed up for Led Zeppelin. I dropped my menu. You really did sing in a rock group? She nodded. I probably scarred my vocal cords, but we were quite good if I may say so, and I emulated Janis Joplin. Vocally, I tried to qualify. Gabe rescued me from the drug scene before I ended up like her. There but for the grace of God would have gone I. How did you meet Gabe? He was a youth minister at a Methodist church, and a friend introduced us. I liked him the first time we met, and we ended up falling in love. I'd done a lot to mess up the world. Gabe and I did what we could to put it back together again, at least our little corner of it. We were together fourteen years. I liked him. I liked Marion. The waitress came and took our order. I went for a steak. Morgan decided on a spinach something or other. I told her about my visit to the Cathedral of Life. She listened raptly, her fingers on her chin, often chuckling at my account. Our dinners came, and we gave them half our attention. You really said that to Miles Newberry? I wouldn't have been so bold twenty years ago. Justin Cantwell, she mused. I wonder if we'll find another name behind this one. Our local messiah isn't telling. But he still talks to you? He still tries to pull you in. That really interests me. He's looking for someone to share his bitterness and disillusionment. No doubt. She smiled and cocked her head. So do you? The thought chilled me. I don't want to end up like him. So how did he end up the way he is? The same way I got where I am, to hear him tell it. That's spooky. The waitress checked back. Everything okay here? Can I get you anything? The food was great, and we were fine. She made her exit. So how are things with you? I asked. Better. She smiled a whimsical smile. Remember that list of three items from our first meeting? I probed my memory. You and your congregation aren't getting along. Brandon Nichols isn't Jesus. And Michael the prophet is your son. The third one is still a problem, but the first two... For a moment, she looked at the falls outside the window. I'm moving into an irreversible situation. Jesus has become an issue for me, and some, not all, in the congregation don't want me going there. She smiled. Still, like it or not, I'm there. I'm starting to address him by name, starting to view my faith as a relationship. I'm sure you know what I mean. I tried not to fully express my joy, lest I embarrass her in public. I know what you mean. Travis, I've been to seminary. I've been an ordained minister for ten years, and I was married to an ordained minister for fourteen. Gabe and I did all we could to bring out the best in people. But it's one of those things you only see looking back. There was always an evasive, missing element, relationship. Jesus was a religious abstraction, a historical figure we discussed and debated but didn't know. She looked around the room. Some of my parishioners would make an issue of my having dinner with an evangelical, fundamentalist, Pentecostal, whatever you are. But they'd be missing the point. It's not my church or your church or which tradition is right or how many candles we light. It's knowing Jesus for who he is. Oh, I was enjoying this. Preach on, sister. She preached on. 
leaning so low toward me that her earrings went almost in her spinach. And I think that's Justin Cantwell's problem. Plenty of church, but no relationship. She settled back in her chair and thought a moment. The white cascading falls reflected in her glasses. Maybe Michael's problem, too. But I really wanted to ease her pain. There could be a new beginning here, a new twist to the story. She gave a weak smile. Let's hope so. Who knows? Maybe if Michael's mother knows the real Christ, she can somehow wean him from a false one. I smiled at her. I'll concur with that. She abruptly switched subjects. So how long did you pastor in Antioch? About fifteen years. She leaned back as if for a better view and said, Tell me about it. Oh, there's not much to tell. How'd you wind up in Antioch in the first place? I closed my eyes and could see the memory playing through my mind like an old home movie. Some memories just never fade. It was a calling that made no practical sense. Marion was working at her company in Los Angeles and doing well. I had my teaching degree and some great prospects for employment and elementary education. Our budget was finally starting to look healthy. We'd moved to a bigger apartment and bought new furniture. We even had a second car. And then Dad called. Some folks wanted to start a Pentecostal mission church in a little eastern Washington town called Antioch. He just thought I might like to pray about that. No pressure. He was just letting me know. I said I'd pray about it. And I did. Dear Lord, I hope they find somebody. And immediately put the subject aside. It came back. Sitting in our living room and hearing the police helicopter circling the neighborhood for the fifth straight night got me thinking about living in a quiet place and being a pastor again. Then I thought of Northwest Mission. No way, I thought. Never again. I mentioned Dad's call to Marion. They're dreaming, I said. Maybe not, she answered, but said nothing more. A week later, a voice from my past called. Brother Smith, the dean of men when I was in Bible college. He now held a position with the Northwest District of the Pentecostal Mission and noticed how I'd taken pains to maintain my credentials. Perhaps I'd be interested in taking a new church in Antioch, Washington. Well, who's running it now? I asked. I didn't want another territorial battle with somebody already there. Nobody, he said. You'll have to run the whole show. Start it from the ground up. It'll be your church, Travis. It'll be your vision. Brother Smith was no stranger to my nature or my illustrious ministry career thus far. He knew I'd find the opportunity tantalizing. And I did. My own church. No religious machinery already in place. No customs or traditions to fight against. No one to say, well, that's the way we do things here. No Sister Marvins, no Brother Roggenbecks. Just Marion and me. I tried to talk myself out of it, reminding myself that for the first time in our marriage we had some stability, some hope for a normal life. But the more I talked to the Lord and myself, aloud pacing about the apartment, the more stirred up I got and I couldn't sit still. It'll never work, I told the mirror. Would it work? I asked the Lord. What about Marion? She had a good job, with a great salary and chance for advancement. I couldn't ask her to move to Antioch, Washington. I looked for Antioch on a map. It was marked with the tiniest little circle available. She'd never go for it. Brother Smith gave me some phone numbers in Antioch. I made some calls and got some details. I knelt by our bed and prayed some more. After I rose from my knees, I started preaching to the empty apartment. I already had a great idea for my first sermon. I'd talk about relationships, I thought. We didn't have a big city church, but we had each other, and that was what mattered. Oh, brother, what's Marion going to think? Lord, if this is your will, then speak to Marion's heart. Give her a peace. No, not peace. Make her excited. Make her want to do it. I was excited. The more I thought about it, the more excited I got. I couldn't wait for Marion to get home. I was out of school and still waiting on a steady job, so I was pulling my weight by fixing dinner every night. Marion would scribble out instructions each morning, and I'd give it my best shot. That night when she got home, 
I served up pork roast and stir-fried vegetables over rice, and brought up the subject of Antioch. How many are in the church now? she asked. Well, I talked to a guy named Avery Sisson. Right now there's him and his wife and their four kids. She held her fork in midair. And? That's it. Right now there's no Pentecostal Mission Church in that town. Why should there be? She wasn't trying to be difficult. It was a fair question. My answer was just as fair, I think. I don't know. According to Avery, there isn't another spirit-filled church in Antioch. And according to Brother Smith, the district thinks it's time to get a church started there. Avery's looked at a church building. It used to be an old congregational church, but now the guy next door owns it. He says we can rent it or buy it from him. And what would we do for a living? Avery says I can work for his brother in construction until I get a teaching job. Antioch has a grade school and a high school. She took another bite of stir-fried vegetables, chewed a while, thought a while, and then said, What are you feeling, T.J.? What's in your heart? I looked down at my plate, a little reticent. I think maybe I'd like to find out more. You know, think about it. She reached over, we always sat close together, and tapped on my heart. What's in here? I took a moment to search out the answer. I just, I just want to do, you know, what Jesus did. I want to go about doing good. Win some souls, change some hearts, bring some light into this world. I want to tell people about Jesus because he's a wonderful Savior and friend. You think God put that in there? I actually got choked up. Since I was a kid. She gave me that smile that always made me feel like a conqueror. And then she rose and hugged me from behind. Then we'd better check it out. Mr. Framer owned the building and met us there. It needs a little fixing up. It hasn't been used for a church in 15 years. Standing there on Elm Street with Avery Sisson, his wife Joan, and Marion, I saw only future potential, not present condition. The plywood over the windows, the paint peeling off the lap siding, the wrinkled, moss-covered roofing didn't discourage me at all. This was an adventure, a vision to be fulfilled. How's the roof? Marion asked. It leaks, said Framer. What about plumbing? I asked. Just a sink in the basement and no toilet. There's an outhouse out back. Any pews? Burned them. There's nothing in there but a bunch of lockers. The old chapel sat forlornly in the middle of an unmowed field, looking as discarded and neglected as the rusting harrower, burned-out van, and immovable old bulldozer that sat in the grass alongside it. Mr. Framer led us through the grass and weeds to the front steps. That bulldozer belongs to my son. He can come and move it if you want. I don't know where that arrower came from. What happened to the van? Kid set it on fire. I was hoping to sell it, but no. The front door sounded like it hadn't been opened in a while. Inside, Mr. Framer turned on the lights. The building did have electricity, and four simple chandeliers hanging from the vaulted ceiling. It was cold in there. It smelled musty. The floor was old, tongue-and-groove planking, painted gray. All we could see was lockers, stacks of them, rows of them. Ugly, green, battered lockers. My son got these lockers when they tore down the old high school. I don't know what he was planning on doing with them, but they've been sitting in here for eight years, and I'll be happy to get rid of them. I squeezed through the lockers to the front and found the platform and the square footprint of unpainted planking where the pulpit used to stand. I stood in that spot and looked back at my congregation. Three people, and maybe Mr. Farmer, standing among the lockers. I could see pews in that room, and a hundred people filling them. I could see sunlight coming through the windows, feel the warmth of the oil stove, and hear the sound of singing. I could see people kneeling at the front pews and at the foot of the platform. There were Bibles and hymnals in every row, and boxes of Kleenex up front. And the bell. Does the bell work? Mr. Framer walked to the back of the room and unlooped the rope from its hook on the wall. He gave the bell three gentle yanks to get it rocking, and then we heard it ringing from the steeple outside. Clang, 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 like a sound out of history, a sweet old-timey voice of hope reawakening in a new generation. Marion broke into a wide grin and clapped. Praise God, I said, and beckoned to Marion. 
She joined me on the platform and looked out over all those lockers in the yellow light of the chandeliers. What do you see, Marion? We could put the piano over there, and maybe we could get some carpet to run up the middle and sides. We need a cross, a big cross, to go on that wall. What about classrooms? Mr. Framer looked at us funny. It's got a basement with a sink, that's all. We went down the steep, narrow stairs. The basement wasn't much more than a crawl space, barely high enough to stand in. It was dark and tomb-like, smelled of earth and dead mice, and the floor timbers hung low above our heads, festooned with spider webs. We could divide this into four, maybe five classrooms, I envisioned. Where are we going to put the bathrooms? There's an outhouse out back, Mr. Framer reminded us. I tried the sink. The water came out a rusty brown. We could fit a kitchen in here, I suppose. It's going to be a lot of work, all in good time. A building does not a church make. We could meet in our home while we're fixing this place up. As soon as we get a home. We could read each other's eyes. This was it. We had to be here. This was where God wanted us. We'll take it. Well, it needs a lot of fixing up, but if you want to put the work into it, I'll count that as rent. To this day, I'm not sure what it was. A storage shed or an old bunkhouse or perhaps a shop. It sat out behind Mrs. Whitfield's place, between her barn and her chicken coop, roughly ten feet deep and forty feet long, with a sagging shed roof, three doors, eight four-paned windows in the front and four in the back. It had shiplap siding on the outside, and on the inside, bare studs and the back side of the shiplap. It was divided into three rooms, all cluttered with farm machinery, engine parts, old lumber, poultry feeders and brooders, and broken bales of straw. The middle room had a toilet and sink. The wiring was exposed and very basic, a bare light bulb in each room and maybe an outlet or two nailed to the bare studs. The roof was good. Mrs. Whitfield had it redone just a few years ago. The floor was good, as much as I could see under all the junk. What do you think? I asked Marion. She cringed, and then she gave the place her best try. That could be the living room. This could be the kitchen, and maybe we could put a wall in here to make this the bathroom. We could make a bedroom out of that last room, but we'll have to put in a closet. Dad'll help us. If it's church, he's in. My dad'll help, too. He loves doing things for his kids. Avery nodded confidently. One month and you won't know the place. I turned to Mrs. Whitfield. We'll take it. We were staying with the Sissons sleeping on a borrowed hide-a-bed in their garage and sharing two bathrooms with Avery, Joan, and their four kids. Our small, apartment-sized collection of furniture and almost everything else we owned was locked in a rented storage space in Spokane. We would be living in a renovated shack between a barn and a chicken coop and pastoring a church without a usable building for who knew how long. Neither one of us had gainful employment, and we had only three to four months of savings but we were the happiest we'd been in five years of marriage. 22. Marion and I pastored in Antioch for 15 years. We lived in five different houses, worked at ten different jobs. I didn't draw a full-time salary from Antioch Pentecostal Mission until we'd been there ten years. Antioch Mission began with Avery and Pete Sisson and their families, and we met in Avery and Joan's living room. Within the year, we moved into the old church building we rented from Mr. Framer, and three years after that, we finally got an indoor toilet. We bought that building from Mr. Framer in 1987, the same year Marion and I got burned out of our home. We started our new building in 1990, were approved for occupancy in 1995, and moved in Easter Sunday. On my last Sunday in November of 1997, the church was well established in its new building on the west side of town on a quaint knoll just above the highway. There were 150 in the congregation, a bank account in the black, a big yellow bus that ran well, a good youth program, and the church's name on a fancy, sand-blasted sign out front. Fifteen years. A journey that felt so long and was over so soon, in a little town few people ever heard of. Fifteen years. Ninety-three souls saved, twenty-three weddings, fourteen funerals, a small retirement account, no real estate, a little savings. When I left the ministry, I was alone, 
and wondering what in the world I thought I'd been doing all that time. Morgan and I declined the dessert, but asked for coffee. And then she just looked at me, studying me. I regretted sounding so depressed at the end of my recap. My stories tended to end on a blue note these days. Give me some names, she said. Beg your pardon? She gave a half shrug and picked up her coffee cup. Just some names. People you remember from those fifteen years. Tell me some stories. Joe Kelmer. He was in his fifties, a rancher with five hundred acres south of town. I was working with Pete Sisson's crew, preparing to pour slab for a new stable out on his place. Pete, Johnny Herreros, Tinker Moore, and I were knee-deep in a ditch, digging footings and hurling dirt like a chain gang, when Joe came out to see how we were doing, his hands in his jeans pockets, his face a little glum. It wasn't like him. Usually he'd come over to check on our progress and talk so much he'd hinder it. How's it going? We told him fine, and Pete said we were hoping to get the steel in and pour by the day after tomorrow. So how's Joe today? Pete asked. Oh, not too good, he replied, sitting on an overturned five-gallon bucket. My bowels ain't worth the poop that goes through them. What's the problem? I expected one of Joe's typical complaints about the water, his wife's cooking, or his advancing age. Cancer? he said. Just found out this morning. We stopped digging. Doc says they'll probably have to take the whole thing out. We all stood in the ditch, our shovels in our hands, trying to adjust to the news, and wondering what we could say. We'll have to pray for you, said Pete. Get old Travis here to lay hands on you and get the Lord to chase that cancer out of here. Oh, thanks a lot, Pete. Set me up, why don't you? But Joe just got up like a tired old man and said, You'd better keep working. I'd like to see this barn while I'm still around. Then he left. I first met Joe and Emily Kelmer on another project the year before, and immediately returned, more appropriately dressed, for a pastoral call. It turned out they considered themselves Catholics, meaning that was their background, but they never attended Mass and had never been inside Our Lady of the Fields. They didn't have much use for my ministerial side, but they did appreciate my skill with hammer and saw and shovel and said so. After Joe gave us the news, I did pray for him. I led the guys in prayer right there in the ditch that day, and Marion and I remembered him in our prayers every evening. I trusted God. There was no way in the world I could predict what the Lord would do, but I trusted him. Well, God is never short on surprises. Joe told me he hadn't been inside a church since the day he and Emily were married, but the very next Sunday he and Emily came into our little church on Elm Street arm in arm. We'd been meeting in that building for close to three years. The lockers were finally gone. Avery and Pete had recently completed a labor of love, a pulpit, a communion table, and a matching cross for the back wall. For now, we were using any chairs folks could bring from home. Folding chairs, lawn chairs, plastic chairs, and dining chairs. Joe and Emily went right to the front row and sat in two green plastic patio chairs. I was leading some opening worship choruses, playing my guitar while Marion played the piano, but I let the others keep singing while I ducked aside and greeted Joe and Emily. Okay, Travis, I'm here, he said. You can go ahead and pray for me. I went back to leading the singing, my mind half on what I was doing and half on what I would have to do in a few minutes. It's easy to pray for colds and flu, final exams, and unsaved loved ones. Most of those things work themselves out in God's own good time. Colon cancer doesn't do that. The worship was sweet. Mine was intense. Folks, I finally said, a lot of you know Joe and Emily. Those who did said hi, and Joe and Emily said hi back. Joe's here because he needs prayer. Joe stood and faced the thirty or so people who had gathered. I'm not a religious man. I haven't had much time for God most of my life. But that doesn't mean he isn't there and can't hear me if I want to talk to him. You know what I mean? Amen, some said. Praise God. And I'm hoping he won't mind if I decide to come to him now after waiting so long. He paused, perhaps to gather his resolve perhaps to corral his emotions. I have colon cancer, 
You know how it is. You get sick and you think you'll get over it, and before long you've waited too long. The doctor says... He stopped. Crying was something Joe Kelmer didn't believe in. He took a breath. He says they'll have to take the whole thing out, put me on chemotherapy, pump me, full of drugs and whatever. Won't be able to take a crap like most people. Excuse me, I didn't mean to say it that way. He turned and faced me. Anyway, I made God a deal. If he takes this cancer from my body, then I'll give him my attention. First thing, above everything, the rest of my life. If he'll give me my life, I'll give it back to him. And that's about it. I absolutely did not know how this was going to turn out. Joe was either going to have a great reason to serve God, or a great reason not to, at least in his thinking. And it was hard to be comfortable about it. And then, when he came forward and stood facing me, ready to be prayed for, I couldn't banish old memories from my mind. I could just see myself standing in front of Andy Smith and Carla Dickens back in the old Kenyan Bannister days. I could remember the episode with Sharon Iverson, the girl with diabetes who almost died at Christian Chapel. Well, Lord, I prayed. You know all about that. You know I don't want to get into any kind of pretensions or showiness. I didn't ask for this. You brought it about, and now here we are. That's all I know. Here we are. Joe was waiting. I took my little vial of olive oil from the back of the pulpit and put a drop on Joe's forehead. This oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, I told him. In the book of James, it tells us to anoint the sick with oil and pray, and the Lord will restore the sick. Do you believe that, Joe? He shrugged. Sure, why not? Let's pray for Joe, I said, beckoning to the Sisson brothers and Bruce Hiddle, my elders, to join me. We laid hands on Joe, and then I prayed. I don't remember much of my prayer. I said something about Joe wanting a touch from God and humbling himself in meek petition. And I know I requested that God would just glorify himself in Joe's body, in the name of Jesus. And just like that, it was over. Thanks for coming, Joe. Thank you, Travis, was all he said as he sat down. They stayed for the rest of the service, received love and greetings from all of us, and then left. Monday morning we were framing up the walls of the new stable and wondering how Joe was doing. He never came out of the house, and we didn't hear a thing from Emily or anyone else. We remembered him in prayer at lunchtime. Tuesday it was the same thing. We watched the house to see if any cars were gone, and one was. Maybe Joe was in the hospital. Maybe he was in for tests, chemotherapy, or even surgery to have his colon removed. We couldn't find out. Wednesday morning, after we'd put in about an hour, Joe came out to see us, his hands in his jeans pockets, his cowboy hat set firmly on his head. Hey, Joe, I said. How's it going? He looked straight at me, that old... Joe Kelmer half-smile on his face and said, Guess who doesn't have cancer anymore? The silence that fell over us was just as long and awkward as when we first heard the bad news. I was being cautious, I guess. I actually said, Who? Joe gave his chest two little taps with his thumb. We were amazed. That's all there was to it. You're kidding. Praise God, are you sure? What'd the doctor say? Went in on Monday. He laughed. I told the doc something was feeling different all of a sudden, and he got me right in like it was an emergency. They about took me apart trying to find something wrong. They spent two days at it, and... He gave his hands a quick wave like an umpire signaling safe. It's gone. I'm clean. They can't figure it out. But I know. We couldn't believe it. We looked at each other. He almost touched noses with me. Jesus healed me. He answered your prayer, and he answered mine. He backed off and addressed all of us. So you boys might want to knock off for a while. Emily's got some coffee on, and we can microwave some cinnamon rolls. We're going to give our lives to Jesus. You just tell us what to do. When the Apostle Paul told the Philippian jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, you and your whole household, 
His words could have applied perfectly to Joe and his family. On Wednesday, Joe and Emily knelt in their living room with me, Pete, Johnny, and Tinker, and received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. On Friday, Joe and Emily's daughter, Claudia, and her husband, Nate, knelt in the same living room and turned their lives over to Jesus. On Sunday, Joe and Emily sat in the same green, plastic chairs, and Claudia and Nate sat right next to them. Their son, Larry, and his wife, Shirley, had come from Oregon to fill out the row, and they dedicated their lives to Christ that morning. Joe was not a shy man, and if you bought a horse from him or sold him feed or asked him directions or called to sell him a magazine subscription or just pumped some gas for his truck, you heard about Jesus and what Jesus had done for him. He wasn't one to debate or hard sell, but it was hard to argue with his testimony. Norm Barrett, the diesel mechanic, along with his wife and three kids, came to the Lord because of Joe Kelmer. Bud Lundgren, our permanent guitar player, got saved while he and Joe were out bass fishing. And Bud's wife, Julie, our permanent saxophone player, got saved while shopping with Emily. The Barretts and the Lundgrens shared Jesus with other friends. Some of them got saved and shared with their friends. And for a while we had ourselves a nice little revival rippling through town. And it all started with Joe Kelmer. Bruce Hittle. He was a good-looking guy in his thirties, an electrical engineer for Washington Water Power. He had a sweet wife named Annie and two cute kids, Jamie and Josh. In May of 1990, he displayed a quiet peace and faith in the Lord that became an example to the rest of us. Bruce and his family were returning from a visit with Annie's folks in Electric City, driving a long, monotonous two-lane late at night. Bruce was at the wheel, Annie was on the passenger side. The kids were secured in child seats in the back. The last thing Bruce remembers was the oncoming headlights of a large vehicle, most likely a truck. There was nothing amiss. The truck was in its own lane. They passed each other, going opposite directions. And then Bruce woke up in a daze, in the dark, his body numb, slumped against his shoulder restraint. The kids in the back seat were screaming. Blood was streaming from his forehead and dripping off his chin. Beads of shattered windshield lay like gravel on the seats, in his lap, on top of the dashboard. The car was leaning precariously, apparently in a gully beside the highway. He reached for Annie, but felt rough wood. A twelve-inch log had come through the windshield and now lay where Annie's head and shoulders should have been. He twisted around, trying to see the kids, they were spattered with blood, flesh, and Annie's blonde hair. A logging truck had lost part of its load just as the two vehicles passed. A log, perfectly timed and aimed, went through the windshield of Bruce's car, missing Bruce and killing his wife. The truck driver pulled over and became incoherent when he saw what his lost load had done. Another motorist saw the wreck and went in search of a telephone. I was working as dispatcher for the volunteer fire department that night and took the emergency call. I sent out the dispatch, telling the volunteers there'd been a fatality accident, but I had no idea the accident involved a family from my church. When the aid crew arrived and radioed back, I got the news. By that time, Bruce and the kids had been trapped in their car for over an hour. Numb with shock, I remained at my post coordinating communications and crews until Pete Sisson burst into the station and bumped me from my chair. I'll handle it. Get going. Bruce and the kids were airlifted to a hospital in Spokane, and that was where I found them. Bruce had broken ribs and facial lacerations. The kids had minor injuries from flying glass and seat restraints. He was coherent, but we didn't talk. There were no words, only shock and an insurmountable disbelief. Annie was gone, instantly. Before any of us could fathom that we had lost anything, she simply wasn't there. We could not believe it that night. We could scarcely believe it the next morning. Shock did not give way to grief until well into the next day. And then the questions came. With miles and miles of open road, why that truck, that car, together at that time and that place? Why was the accident so ruthlessly, savagely perfect? Like everyone else, I drew upon my faith for comfort and tried to share that comfort as best I could. But inside, I was asking the same questions as everyone else, knowing there would never be answers. There was no funeral, 
only a memorial service once Bruce had healed enough to attend. All who knew and loved Annie were there and took turns sharing their thoughts and remembrances. I spoke briefly about the need to trust God in all circumstances, for his ways are unsearchable. I reminded everyone that Annie, knowing Jesus, was in a better place and just fine, but I could feel my insides quaking and I teetered on the brink of tears with every sentence. After we sang our last song, I stole quietly into a back room, sat down with my face in my hands, and lost it completely. Oh, dear Lord, why? Why, Annie? What's Bruce going to do now? What about Josh and Jamie? I didn't hear anyone come in. I just felt a hand on my shoulder and heard a quiet whisper. It's okay. It's okay. I reached up and touched the hand, touching me, then looked into the scarred, black and blue face of Bruce Hiddle. He sat down, put his arm around my shoulders and let me cry, not saying another word. I was supposed to be the minister, bringing comfort to the grieving, but I was drained of comfort. Bruce, a quiet serenity showing through his scars and his tears, was ready to share what he had. In the months that followed, Bruce often got tearful, at any time, in any place, usually without warning, but he didn't seem self-conscious about it. It's for Annie, he would tell people. Don't worry, it's just something I have to do. The rest of the time, he was the friend, daddy, and brother we all cherished, with a glow about him that the scars and the stitches could not extinguish. The scars eventually faded. The glow still remains. It's Jesus, he always explained. He knows the answers. He'll work it out. Two years later, the Lord brought Libby McLean into Bruce's life, and in the summer of 1992, they were wed in our little church on Elm Street. Josh and Jamie stood with their dad and their new mom as I performed the ceremony, and once again, I teetered on the brink of tears with every sentence. It's okay, Bruce whispered to me as he held his bride's hand. It's okay. Mr. Framer. He said he'd been to church already and didn't need any more of it. Well, we saw no need to argue with that. But church wasn't the question. Jesus was. But although Mr. Framer didn't need any more religion, he did need a haircut. Marion volunteered and gave him a trim every two weeks. Having accepted her help, he was ready to accept mine, and so I helped him put a new roof on his house over several weekends. The next thing we knew, he was mowing the church grass every week without anyone asking him. When we started running a bus ministry around town, he was the guy who provided the bus and kept it running. Four years after we started renting the church building, he finally came to a Sunday morning service, slipping in behind a group of folks to escape notice. I saw him come in but didn't make a big deal out of it. I just winked at him. We played that little game for the next few months, long enough for him to discover he could talk to just about anyone in that church without something spooky or religious happening to him. Only when I was sure it was safe did I ask him about Mrs. Framer and why she was not attending church with him. He didn't give me a clear answer that Sunday, but the following Wednesday he gave me a strong enough hint. He brought over a portable, battery-powered chemical toilet for us to install under the basement stairway. That way, he said, the ladies wouldn't have to trek out to the outhouse during a service, but could fulfill their natural obligations with some comfort and delicacy. I could tell he thought very highly of his gesture, so I didn't refuse it. We put the toilet under the stairs and nailed up a plywood wall and a thin little door with a springed hinge. A chemical toilet is a box-shaped contraption with a toilet seat on top that doesn't flush to an outside sewer or septic system. It has two tanks inside it, one for fresh water and chemicals, the other to hold all the flushed waste. When you're finished and you press a little button, the electric pump kicks on, the blue water and chemical mix swirls around the bowl, and the toilet tucks away your contribution in its holding tank. The toilet Mr. Framer gave us was comfortable. I know that from personal experience, and others would agree. As for delicate, well, that toilet just couldn't keep a secret. The electric pump was loud, and it would grind on forever, announcing to the entire congregation seated upstairs that a modest user had just finished and would be rejoining the service directly. If that wasn't announcement enough, the slam of that plywood door was. And then there was the smell. 
though intended for the ladies and their need for comfort and privacy. It's just a fact of life that one good toilet among forty churchgoers is going to get used by everyone. Our little camping toilet wasn't meant to handle a load that size, and it didn't. No matter. As soon as that toilet was in, Mrs. Framer came to church. The Framers heard the gospel every Sunday for two more years, and finally came forward to receive Christ one Sunday night. Nothing tragic had occurred in their lives. There was no crisis or desperate material need to make them turn to God. They were just ready. That was all. It was time. But I do credit the Framers with our board's unanimous decision to do whatever was necessary to get a septic system approved and a real flushing toilet installed. That motion was seconded and carried within a month of the chemical toilet's arrival, and when we installed men's and women's flush toilet restrooms in the basement, the framers were there to cut the ribbon. Rich Watkins, a former biker, now a trucker, with long black hair and a ponytail, and eagles, skulls, snakes, and naked women tattooed all over his huge arms. When we marched for Jesus down the main highway through town with signs and placards proclaiming his name, Rich happened to be in the tavern and stepped outside to watch us go by. Some of his drinking buddies laughed at us, but Rich just read our signs and listened to us sing. I saw the look on his face and thought, Dear Lord, protect us. That guy looks like trouble. He pulled up in front of our church on his Harley Sunday morning, sat quietly through the whole service, and then said to me afterward, So this is where you find Jesus? It sure is, I said. Well, I've decided I gotta square up with my old lady, but I better get right with God first, know what I mean? I prayed with him, led him to Christ, and eventually met his wife, Clarice, and their four children. Now, this guy was one monumental disciplining job. He'd never been to Sunday school or had any kind of Christian upbringing, so Marion and I and our church family had to do it all. We had to teach him the subtleties of doctrine, concepts such as you don't usually lead a person to repentance by breaking a beer bottle over his head, and such fine points as, turning the other cheek doesn't mean you walk up and moon somebody you don't like. He's still growing in the Lord, and recently took a big step we were all proud of. He volunteered to go into the public schools and give the kids a no-holds-barred lecture about staying off drugs. The kids love his presentations. The parents and teachers do, too, especially since we finally broke him of the habit of referring to Satan as... That dirty S.O.B. the devil. If I ever needed a mental image of the early Simon Peter, I just imagined Rich Watkins, and I had it. Guy Forbes. He ran the local movie theater. When he showed an X-rated movie, I got some of the other pastors and their churches to join us in picketing the theater both nights. I thought he'd be mad at us, many of the folks going into the theater were. But he called me that week and apologized for showing the movie. We got together for lunch after that, got to know and trust each other, and later started up our own impromptu movie rating committee between the two of us. He didn't always go along with the other half of the committee, but we reached more agreements than disagreements, and our town enjoyed a little more peace because of it. He has yet to get saved, but we have a strong mutual respect. Bob Fisher, Paul Daly, the Sisson Brothers, Jake Helgeson, Rudy Whaler, Tinker Moore, and twenty other guys and gals who showed up the night our house caught fire. You never appreciate your neighbors quite so much as when you're in trouble. And that night, when Marion turned away from some French fries to answer the phone, and a grease fire broke out, we owed those folks everything. The fire took out most of the kitchen and blackened the rest of the house. But thanks to the faithful folks of the volunteer fire department, most of our belongings made it through. After the fire, the town almost buried us in clothing, food, dishes, and utensils to replace what we had lost. I'd done a lot of visitation around town, knocking on doors to get acquainted with people, but I don't know that I ever met as many folks as when we were in need, and they came by to help out. Antioch's a great town. It really is. That farmhand. I never learned his name. Tom something. He was working for George Harding during harvest and got his foot caught in a combine auger. I was driving the truck and heard him screaming. By the time we shut the machine down and got him out, his ankle had made at least two full rotations. Pray for me, preacher! He kept screaming. I touched his ankle very gently and prayed. 
Lord, please heal this leg. Please restore it in Jesus' name. He was back at work the next day, climbing all over that machine as if nothing had happened. He moved on after harvest. I don't know if he ever got saved. Lance Montgomery. Tiger, Cecily, and Moira Bradley. Ron and Vicky Hansen and their sons, Ned and Tom. The rest of the youth group and a fair share of the town. One of the kids got an old 8mm home movie camera, and I got an idea. I wrote a script, and our youth group made a movie. A 55-minute epic shot on location in and around the town of Antioch. The whole production cost us $500 and took a year to film. We staged a big car wreck, burned down a barn painted to look like a house, kept our characters in constant peril until they got saved, and pulled in as many people as we could to be extras and walk-ons. By the time the movie premiered in the high school auditorium, at least a hundred folks came to see it because they were in it. The film was grainy and jerky. Sometimes our actors sounded like munchkins, and sometimes they sounded like dopey giants talking through molasses. Sometimes the movie camera picked up the local radio station, and we got music and news along with dialogue. But our show was a hit, and we broke even. I don't think the showing of the film won any souls to the Lord, but the making of it helped us to get to know a lot of folks around town, and they all heard the gospel in the process. The youth are grown up now and starting families of their own, but they fondly remember their brief and meaningful stint in the gospel movie biz, and I can't think of any who are not serving the Lord today. Lorraine Bradley, Mrs. Framer, Libby Hiddle, Emily Kelmer, and all the wonderful ladies in the church who brought dinner over while Marion was sick. They had it all scheduled out, every day of the week. They cooked, they cleaned, they did our laundry, they helped me get Marion in and out of the car, they helped me get her to and from the hospital. My coffee cup was cold and empty. I was staring at it, wishing I could hide in it. You can stop, said Morgan. I had been enjoying the stories up to this point. Okay. She touched the back of my hand. Thank you. I shrugged. You asked. I hope I delivered. I loved it. I looked at my watch. Man, is it that late? Time flies. I pushed away from the table. It's been a great evening. It's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. She rose from her chair and I held her coat as she slipped into it. So anyway, I might be hearing from the cathedral, that is, if they remember to call me. She held up her hand to stop me. I don't think that's what this evening was about. Do you? Maybe I was unwilling to explore it. I'm not sure what you mean. She buttoned her coat as she looked up at me over her glasses. All those people, Travis, they're still with you, right in here. She tapped on my heart. When you go home tonight, don't think about old what's-his-name up at the Macon Ranch. Think about them. They're what the last fifteen years were all about. They're what Jesus is all about. Old what's-his-name can't touch that. We came to the restaurant in separate cars and left the same way. All the way home I reflected on the evening, warmed and healed by Morgan Elliott's discerning spirit soothed by the acceptance I saw in her eyes. I had to wipe some tears away as I drove. I hadn't felt this kind of kinship with anyone since Marion went home. Maybe we could have dinner again sometime. Maybe we... 23. Where have you been? Florence Lynch had been cranky to begin with. But after waiting until past her bedtime for a cop, any cop, to show up, she was beyond cranky and not to be trifled with. Brett Henkel stepped through her front door and into her living room, nervous and agitated. We had another incident across town. Well, what about my incident? You keep me waiting here all night? Florence went to her dining room table and grabbed up the list she'd compiled. I have it all right here. Two dresses, three hair combs, two bracelets, four blouses, and a pair of shoes. She handed it to him, and he looked it over with a certain detachment. I caught her red-handed, in the very act. Did Rod tell you? Uh, no. She was trying to sneak out of my store with the stow-and-dagger. That's the purple dress. She pointed to the list in his hand. 
This one right here, $112 retail. She was wearing it under her own dress, but I saw the hem sticking out. Rod and I went over to Penny's house and... She snuffed and rolled her eyes. Have you ever smelled that place? The carpet's woven marijuana has to be, and the clothes Bonnie Adams wears. No wonder Penny was stealing from my shop. So that's where you found the rest of this stuff? In Penny's closet and right on top of her dresser. Oh, Bonnie Adams had a fit just screaming at Penny and slapping her around. But you know what? All Penny did was sit there and shrug and flip her hair out of her eyes. I don't think she's a bit sorry. Well, I'm sure she is. You're sure she... What? You've got to be kidding. You've hauled her in before several times. Rod told me. Yes, but that was... That's why he jailed her. She can't be trusted. I'd still like to talk to her. Penny's not a bad girl at heart. If she spends some time in the jail this evening and gets a good talking to, we may not have any more trouble from her. She gawked at him. You're dreaming, right? No, I'm... Well, wake up. I'm pressing charges. It was easy to tell he didn't like that news. You're asking for a lot of trouble, a lot of time, a hearing, a trial. Perhaps he was hard of hearing. She said it slower and louder. I'm pressing charges. You're a police officer. Now see to it. He grabbed his leg and winced. Did... did Rod get your statement? Yes, he did. And he told me to write up this list of the stolen merchandise, so now you have it. He turned toward the door, and yes, he was definitely limping. Well, I'll get back to you in the morning. He pulled a card from his pocket and scribbled a phone number on the back. If you decide to change your mind, you can call me at home. He handed the card to her. That's highly unlikely. By now, she was angry with him. Penny Adams is a thief. She's always been a thief, and this town needs to be rid of her once and for all. He answered with an edge in his voice. Yes, ma'am. And went out the door. Don Anderson woke from a restful sleep, disturbed by a strange, low hum he'd never heard in the house before. He raised his head from his pillow and listened. It sounded like a sixty cycle hum. The same noise sometimes picked up by amplifiers and sound systems. Had he left something on? He got out of bed, careful not to wake Angela, and went into the living room to check the stereo. It was off. The television was off. The fluorescent lights in the kitchen were off. The furnace wasn't running. He listened to the refrigerator. Wow! He could hear everything that compressor was doing. The whir of the motor, the high-pitched rushing of the freon through the condenser. There was a sixty-cycle hum down in the middle of all that noise, but it wasn't the hum he was after. Where was it coming from? He walked down the hallway toward the bedroom again, still hearing the hum like a steady note in his head. The bathroom light was on. He reached for the light switch on the wall and clicked it off. The humming stopped. Oh, the wall switch. He clicked it on again. There was that hum. He bent close to the switch and listened. Well, it wasn't just the switch. He straightened slowly, his ear close to the wall. Then he moved a foot or two down the hall, still listening. Then he backed up again. He raised as high as his tiptoes, then squatted. He shook his head in amazement. He could hear the wire in the wall, or more exactly, the electric current flowing through it. He could hear where the wire was which way it went up the wall, where it turned. Incredible. He chuckled with delight. Like his other new abilities, this could be useful. Imagine being able to find wires in walls, maybe cables underground, maybe hear bad connections or short circuits. He clicked off the light. The humming stopped. And headed for the bedroom, grinning to himself in the dark. This was going to be great. Back in bed, he listened again for the hum of the wires. Not too many things were turned on right now. The house was dark and quiet. Good enough. But what would it sound like during the waking hours, when things got turned on and power was flowing through the wires? Well, he'd worry about that in the morning. He rolled over and closed his eyes. What was that? It sounded like an ant doing a tap dance on his nightstand. Tick. Tick, 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 tick. Tick, 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 tick. He rolled over and looked too dark. He clicked on his bedside lamp. The wires in the wall hummed. Angela woke up and groaned. What are you doing? Checking out a noise? He reached for his digital watch. The moment he touched it, 
The little tap dance came through loud and clear. Tick, 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 tick. He put the watch down. What noise? Angela asked. Oh, it was just my watch. Your watch? He clicked off the lamp. The humming stopped. Angela went back to sleep. Don lay there, eyes open, wondering whether he should be worried as the sound of his watch kept tap dancing in his ears. Tick, 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 tick. Florence Lynch lay in her bed, troubled and tossing, dreaming of a deranged and bug-eyed Penny Adams reaching out and grabbing things. Penny was ghostly, transparent around the edges, drifting and floating through Florence's house with long, sticky fingers clutching after everything in sight. And Florence kept chasing her, never keeping up, trying to stop her, screaming at her. Penny just laughed a witchy laugh and kept grabbing, 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 taking dishes out of the cupboard, knickknacks off the shelf, a scarf from around Florence's neck. Stop that! Put that back! Put it back! That's not yours! More witchy laughing. Green, fuzzy teeth, the touch of long, cold fingers. Florence awoke with a jerk, her heart pounding, her face slick with sweat, the darkness like a mask over her eyes. Terrified. A nightmare. She tried to calm down. She couldn't. It was a nightmare, she told herself. It's over now. It wasn't over. Her terror would not subside. With a death grip around fistfuls of down comforter, she covered her face up to her eyes and searched the deep, endless darkness of the bedroom. A man was standing in the corner. The terror felt like a hammer blow to her heart. Her throat constricted, her hands trembled. His gaze emerged from the blackness like dim yellow headlights emerging through thick smoke. There was something vaguely recognizable in their expression a glint she'd known for years and hadn't seen in ten. Lewis? She gasped. Lewis? The form of her dead husband inched toward her, the darkness receding like tide water from the old gray shirt and jeans, the pale veined skin of the face. Except for the unbroken glare of those eyes, he looked the same as the moment he died. The pale blue lips were moving, but there was no sound. She managed to breathe again, in short, shallow gasps. Louis, what is it? He raised his finger and shook it at her, his eyes angry and scolding, his lips forming the word no, 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 no. She no more than felt the question forming in her mind before she had the answer. She knew what he was trying to tell her. Penny Adams was not asleep, but she was comfortable lying on a cot under clean, warm blankets. Compared to some of the other jails she'd occupied, this cell wasn't bad. Even so, she felt disappointed. Her new hand was supposed to be something magical, something shielded from hassles. She'd been in and out of Anderson's and Kylie's with all kinds of great stuff, and they never noticed. Florence Lynch never noticed either. Until today. That's what Penny couldn't figure out. Where did she slip up? What killed the magic? People could be so weird, getting all shook up over a few dresses, a few blouses, a few watches and CDs. She liked them. She wanted them. Don Anderson and Matt Kiley and Florence Lynch never even missed them. So what was the big deal? They had plenty of stuff, and she didn't. And that wasn't fair. What good was having a new hand if you couldn't use it? She heard the front door open and footsteps moving across the front office floor. She sat up in time to see Brett Henkel come through the cell block door the keys to the cells in his hand. He was wearing civilian clothes and hadn't combed his hair. He must have gotten out of bed to come down here. Well, he said, you're still awake? She shrugged and flipped a lock of hair out of her eyes. He paused outside her door. You don't know how lucky you are. I just got a call from Florence Lynch. She says to let you go, to forget about the whole thing. Way cool, she thought, but said nothing. So I'm going to let you out of here, but I want you to do us all a favor. You listening? She looked up at him. Sure. You got a new hand, maybe from God, and I know he wouldn't do that just so you can go on stealing. So try to do something else with it. This town doesn't need the trouble, and neither do I, and neither do you. You got it? She knew how to answer. 
Okay. He unlocked the cell door. Get your coat, I'll take you home. She followed him out of the station and to the squad car, feeling relieved and giddy. Maybe the magic was still there. Officer Henkel was in a good mood, going easy on her. She also noticed he wasn't limping like before. When my telephone rang Friday morning, it could have been Kyle Sherman calling for an update, or maybe Jim Baylor calling to talk about D. Bob Fisher still called once in a while just to call. Bruce Hiddle or Joe Kelmer called occasionally to make sure I was still breathing. My sister Renee called whenever there was family news. It could have been Morgan Elliott following up on last night's dinner meeting. I would have liked that. I was half expecting a call from the cathedral, probably from Miles Newberry or some other well-screened and thoroughly instructed cathedral associate, but I still considered that too much to hope for. There was no way in the world I could have expected this caller. Travis Jordan? Speaking. Mr. Jordan, my name is Elise Brenner. My maiden name is Harris. Dale Harris is my father. I sank onto the couch, more than a little intrigued. The Dale Harris? Pastor of the Cathedral of Life? One and the same. Have I caught you at a bad time? No, no, no. I'm free. I'm okay. I understand you visited my dad's church a little while ago? That's right. Did you talk with my father? I broke into a grin and hoped she didn't hear me chuckle. No, he was unavailable. But you did talk to Miles Newberry. Uh, yeah, that's that's right. I uh, talked to Miles, uh, Pastor Newberry. About a mutual acquaintance, Justin Cantwell? I leaned forward, pressing the receiver to my ear. That's right, he, uh, he was going to get back to me. He won't. None of them will. Mr. Jordan, it's only by a fluke that I heard about your meeting with Miles. They weren't about to tell me. They don't like this sort of thing getting out. Why are you calling me? Because I know Justin Cantwell, and I can tell you about him. Which means I have to tell you about him. It would be wrong not to. The others, my father included, don't want anyone to know about him because it would be too embarrassing. I grabbed a notepad I kept by the phone and flipped to a clean page. So... You understand who I am and what my needs are? Mrs. Fontanelli told me. You remember her, my dad's secretary? Oh, yes, Mrs. Fontanelli. She seemed like a nice lady. One of the nicest. She's like a second mom. She told me about your visit and how the staff handled it. She's a professional and she does her job, but she's a friend, too. She wasn't going to tell me unless I asked her, but I asked her, so she told me. Okay. This conversation is going to be confidential, all right? All right. She took an audible breath. I'm married to one of the associate pastors at the cathedral, Tom Brenner. I used to be the head of the music department at the church. I directed the choir, ran the worship team, organized the Christmas and Easter pageants, all that sort of thing. Three years ago, Justin Cantwell auditioned for the choir, and we put him in the tenor section. That's how I got to know him. To make a long story short, we ended up having an affair. I tried to keep my voice from betraying my wide-eyed facial expression. I see. Now, you have to consider who my father was. He had a monstrous church with three services on Sunday morning, a book deal with a major publisher, a television ministry, a tape ministry. He was a district presbyter for our denomination and serving on the board of Horizon Bible College. He had a professional, big-time booking agency to line up his outside speaking engagements, and another company managing annual vocations to the Holy Land with his name in the logo. He had a well-trained professional pastoral staff, and we had ourselves an efficient, smooth-running church with a multi-million dollar annual budget. Mr. Jordan, I guess I've made it clear my dad was successful in, well, the popular word is the ministry. Oh, yes, anybody can see that. So next thing you know, his daughter, married with three kids, has an affair with a stranger from the teeming masses of that congregation. The, uh, powers that be, the board, the pastors, and my father, feared it would mar the image of the church and the pastor. They thought it could snarl the ministry's momentum, let the church roll on as the song goes. I was ashamed and felt foolish. My husband's ministry was going to be in jeopardy as well. So we got together prayed about it, and then, to put it simply, we covered it up. The church kept me on staff through Christmas. Hey, it was the big Christmas pageant. They couldn't let anything jeopardize that. 
and then they let me take an indefinite leave of absence in January. My husband went right on serving as an associate pastor, doing all he could to act normal, to keep the college and career department rolling while we worked things out. The official word was that I'd worked very hard and needed a rest and time to be with my family, which was true. It just wasn't the whole truth. What happened to Justin Cantwell? He vanished like he was never there. I've read a few things in the paper about Jesus showing up in Antioch, but I didn't have a clue it was him. Not until you came down here asking questions. So how are you and your husband doing? We're still working it out. It hasn't been easy. Does he... Does he know you're talking to me about all this? I told him I was going to call you today. And what was his response? He had to leave. The college and career department has a meeting this morning, but that's... Yes? I don't know if you'll be able to understand this, but it's part of the story, so I'll tell you. I almost couldn't help being drawn to Justin Cantwell. He was the first man in my life I could really talk to. He understood me. He understood my pain. He took the time to talk with me and, you know, just share his feelings about things. She took a breath to clear her mind. I did not know my father. I can't say that I know him now. We never really talked. Never spent time together, unless it was in church. Hey, as long as I played the piano or led the choir or worked in the church office, we had a relationship. It was mostly professional. But at least we had something. I could feel my insides twisting a little. I, uh, I think I do understand. That's what people don't realize. On the surface, it's a wonderful church, and we have a happy, Christ-filled family. Dad likes to brag about his kids in public, but my sister, Judy, is divorced and bulimic, and my brother, Sam, is an alcoholic. My oldest brother, Dale Jr., turned out pretty well, but that's because he's just like Dad. He's in the ministry, pastoring a church in Oklahoma. As for me and my husband, Tom... She dropped off in mid-sentence. Did Tom go to Horizon Bible College? Yes. She sounded surprised. And he talks and thinks like your dad. Now her voice carried her amazement. Have you met him? No, but he's on the pastoral staff, isn't he? She laughed. So you've been to our church? I've seen how it works. Dad handpicks every associate. I love Tom. But he's dad's kind of man, all church. They fuel each other. It's all they talk about. I should have seen it coming. It's as if you can't love and serve the Lord by being with your family. You have to be doing church stuff. Ah, yes, the stuff. I'm sorry. I really was. Again, I don't expect you to understand. But in our home, you had to be involved in the church to feel like a part of the family. Dale and I could play the game. Sam and Judy couldn't. She gave a bitter chuckle. I was always at the church. So Dad used to talk to Sam and Judy through me. He'd say things like, Tell Sam I like that paint job on the house, or tell Judy she should sell that car and get an automatic. Sam used to brag about being a pagan just to send a message. Dad never picked up on it. Maybe the affair was my way of sending a message to Tom. Sometimes I think he may have received it, but sometimes not. What about your mother? The same rule applied, so they'd fight a lot. Then she'd run into the bedroom to cry, and he'd go out and cut the grass. Nothing ever changed that I could see. She threatened to leave him once, but then she felt so guilty about it that she ended up asking him to forgive her. I wanted to scream. And pieces were coming together in my head even as I formed the question. Justin Cantwell knew all about this, didn't he? Yes. He could tell you all about it, just like he'd been there. Just like he'd been there. So we just clicked. You know what I mean? Our hearts touched and he showed compassion and love and warmth. And it didn't have to be church-related. Then she asked, Is he doing the same thing to someone up there? I was too blown away to answer. I had to think. Mr. Jordan? Oh, yes. Definitely. You have to warn whoever it is. Don't let him do it. Listen, he'll come on at first like he's, well, like he's Jesus himself. Right. But he's not a healer, Mr. Jordan. I don't care how it looks. He knew about my hurt, but he didn't heal it. He just brought it out and made it worse. I think he looks for people to share his anger and his hurt, and then he brings out the worst in them. 
He uses them. Do you know anything about his background? Where he's from? Who his family are? Once I saw he got a letter from Netchville, Texas. Just the envelope. He told me it was from his mother. Netchville. I asked her to spell it and wrote it down. Did you catch his mother's name? Lois Cantwell. He wouldn't talk about her or any of his family, for that matter. He's bitter, and having known him and the way he knew me, I can guess where the bitterness came from. He knows the Christian language. When he joined our choir, he already knew the worship songs. He could raise his hands and praise the Lord. He could pray and quote from the Bible. He talked about Jesus and used Jesus' name just like a real Christian. He's been there. But it didn't go well for him. That would be an understatement. But, Mr. Jordan, think twice before you pity him. He's not just a wounded soul. He's a destroyer, with a destroyer driving him. He never did miracles while he was here. A little prophetic insight, maybe, just enough to carry out his agenda. But if what I've read is true, that demon is still growing, and now it's in your town. Better be prayed up. 24. Nancy Behrens stared at the image on her computer monitor, then sighed, dropping her gaze. She wagged her head, her face despondent. Kim Staples didn't notice. She was busy at her own computer, tapping keys and moving her mouse, pasting and assembling Tuesday's paper. Uh-oh, I've got a problem. We've all got a problem, Nancy replied. Kim turned from her monitor, hoping Nancy would look her way. See here? Kylie Hardware's full-page ad landed right opposite Anderson Furniture's full-page ad at the center spread. You think that's too much ad all in one place? Nancy? Nancy rested her forehead on her fingertips and gave her screen a less than enthusiastic glance. I can't run this story. Kim pushed with her feet, propelling her wheeled chair across to Nancy's desk. But it's news. Nancy waved her off, a little angry. No, no, no. I don't want to hear that excuse anymore. We've been using it for weeks. On her monitor was the headline, A Better Home for the Messiah. Underneath was a full-color photo of the new public restrooms and showers under construction at the Macon Ranch. What in the world are we doing? This isn't a news story. It's another full-page ad. Kim shrugged. He's employing local workers, buying materials from local businesses, drawing pilgrims from all over the country who spend money here. That's news for this town. People want to know about it. But we're helping him. Knowing what we know, we're still helping him. Kim nodded forlornly. When I was up there to take the picture, Nichols's people told me they wanted 500 copies when the story ran. Yeah, free publicity. More clippings to put in their PR package. An endorsement, if you ask me. He's using us just like he's using everyone else in this town. What if we toned down the headline and didn't call him the Messiah? Nancy leaned back, folding her arms. I notice we've never run a story on Mary Donovan. Kim snickered. Or Michael Elliott. Our own Virgin Mary and John the Baptist. Kind of like meeting Mickey Mouse and Goofy at Disneyland. So why haven't we? The big papers have. Because an animated geometric screensaver started up on Nancy's computer. She let it run. We live here, and we don't want to hurt our friends. Not to mention we're covering our own rear ends. If we ever did an honest story about any of this, we'd be right alongside the big papers and showing how ludicrous it all is. For the first time, Nancy looked at Kim. But it's going to blow up. Adrian Folsom's talking to an angel, but have you seen how paranoid she's gotten? And the other night, Rod Stanton and Mark spent a couple of hours looking for a ghost Brett says appeared in his living room, the hitchhiker he picked up months ago. You're kidding. We've got all these people and all this money coming into town. There's building going on. Businesses are expanding and sticking their necks out. And for what? For this supposedly upgraded version of Jesus Christ, who performs miracles but has a thing for women, is probably a crook, and... It was a difficult realization. And have you noticed how nobody's really better off? Business is better, sure, but Matt Kiley's nothing more than a thug. Norman Dillard looks at you everywhere but in the eye. Penny Adams is stealing again. Adrian's paranoid. Brett's, I don't know, seeing things. And Don Anderson? Him, too? Well... He's not entirely there when you talk to him. Maybe he's been playing with his toys too much? It's going to blow up. And when it does, where's this town going to be? We should have gotten a clue when we first talked to Nevin Sorrel, who's now dead, of course. 
definitely not better off. But what can we prove? No. Take it to the next step. Say we can prove something. This late in the game, how's the town going to react? We're talking wallets and purses here, a mighty big balloon to pop, and we helped, Kim. That's the sad thing. We beat the drum for this guy. We contributed to the problem. Kim nodded. I think I'm feeling scared. You and me both. So what now? We're backing away. This guy's a leaking gasoline truck, and when everything blows, we don't want to be in league with him. We can cover the story afterwards, and then who can blame us? With a few quick keystrokes and moves of the mouse, Nancy erased the headline from the front page of Tuesday's issue. Are you going to tell Travis Jordan what we know? I'm sure it would be of interest to him, but... Nancy stopped short, her brow crinkling. What? The Harmons, in Missoula. Yeah? Have they ever seen a picture of Brandon Nichols? Saturday morning, when I dialed the Macon Ranch, Mrs. Macon didn't answer her own telephone. A machine did. Hello, you've reached the ranch of the New Dawn. If you know your party's extension, you may dial it now. Otherwise, remain on the line and an operator will assist you. Another gathering of the human family will begin at 2 p.m. today, Saturday. See you there. I remained on the line and got the operator. Hello, Ranch of the New Dawn. Hello, this is Travis Jordan, and I'd like to speak with Mrs. Macon. I didn't really have anything to say to her. I just wanted to find out if she could talk on her own telephone. Mrs. Macon is unavailable. Would you like to talk to her assistant? Mrs. Macon has an assistant? Okay, sure. Hold music started playing. I about fell over. Hello, this is Gildy. How can I help you? Gildy? Gildy Holiday? Judy Holiday's granddaughter, who used to wait on me at Judy's. Oh, is this Travis? What are you doing up there? Taking care of Mrs. Macon. You know, cooking, cleaning, answering the phone, helping her get around. Since when? Two weeks ago. I'm loving it. It's a nice house to work in, and the money's good. So how's the widow? She sighed. Not very good. Sometimes she's there, and sometimes she isn't, if you know what I mean. That answer I was not expecting. Are we talking about Ethel Macon? Yes. Who used to be married to Cephas Macon? Sure. The lady who owns the ranch? Well, the corporation owns it now, but she still lives here. It's a good thing because the stroke really put her down. Was I on the right planet? What stroke? Haven't you heard? She had a stroke two weeks ago. I had to recover from that blow before I could ask the next question. What corporation? Well, New Dawn. Brandon Nichols and the widow signed a deal before her stroke. I was stunned. Things happen fast up there, she laughed. You ought to see it. I'm planning on coming to the gathering this afternoon. Just pardon the mess. We're building, you know. Hey, Kyle. Want to go to a meeting? You read my mind. I picked him up and we headed for the ranch. You don't have to say or do anything, I told him. I just need you praying. This one's going to be tense. They were building all right, although at this point the new restroom and shower facility was still more mud and mess than building. The concrete slab was poured, the rough in plumbing sticking up through it. Open ditches for sewer lines and drainage were all around it, barricaded for safety. A sign posted in front showed the architect's drawing of what it would look like. It was going to be nice, the envy of any national park. Just in time, too. We'd driven by George Harding's place on the way and quickly estimated a minimum of a hundred trailers and RVs parked in his still-developing RV park. As we came up the hill to the ranch and into the parking area, we estimated another hundred up there, not counting all the cars. And now there were two circus tents side by side, joined like Siamese twins with the middle wall removed and the stage centered between them. Brandon Nichols, for that was his name for these folks, would now be performing in the round for a crowd approaching 600. Ushers with red shirts and walkie-talkies directed the flow of people coming in. A six-piece band, two guitars, bass, drums, keyboard, and a female vocalist were performing feel-good songs like Everything is beautiful, don't worry, be happy, and what a wonderful world. Matt Kiley was serving as head usher now. 
We avoided him, finding two seats halfway back and in the middle. From there we could see a roped-off corridor from the stage to a tent door that led to Mrs. Macon's house. That had to be where Elvis, excuse me, Nichols, would make his big entrance. By two o'clock, almost all the folding and plastic chairs were taken, and the two tents were filled with the excited pre-show murmuring of the crowd. I also heard babies and kids, lots of them, and noted that a good number were loose, running up and down the aisles, chasing and hollering, falling and crying. Apparently, the New Dawn Corporation hadn't yet thought about child care, and many parents had chosen not to be responsible for their children. I smiled. I couldn't help it. It was two o'clock, and folks were still trickling in, still talking among themselves as they looked for seats. I kept on smiling. The drummer in the band let out a drum roll. And now, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, announced the pretty female vocalist. Please welcome our messenger of the new dawn, Brandon Nichols. The band started a peppy tune. The crowd rose to its feet, applauding and cheering. And in came Nichols, decked out in white tunic and glittering gold jewelry, and sporting a brand new wavy permanent. He waved and smiled as he ascended the stage, then held both hands high over his head like a fighter entering the ring. The applause went on for a good long minute. So where's Sally Fordyce? Kyle asked me. Nichols was on stage alone, without Sally Fordyce in a biblical robe, or the Virgin Mary Donovan. The size of the crowd could have explained why we didn't see D. Baylor or Adrian Folsom, but perhaps they weren't here either. I recognized some of Armand Harrison's women sitting toward the front, but apart from them, this was a crowd of strangers. Nichols sighted us in the crowd, and his smile faded for an instant. He forced it back, flashing some teeth in our direction, as he said to the crowd, We've come far, haven't we? The crowd cheered again. We didn't cheer, but it did flash a smile back at him, and he must have caught the meaning in it. He had trouble getting started. Well, anyway, here we are, and, uh, we've got... We've got things to do today. Yes, sir, it's, uh... How are you all doing? After a few false starts, he finally got his talk rolling telling some stories, getting some laughs, and encouraging everyone about how wonderful they were. I didn't catch most of what he said. I was more interested in the edge in his voice, the tenseness in his walk, the way he kept drumming his fingers against his thigh. I looked around the tent. Was anyone else noticing the same thing? Possibly. A man leaned and whispered an observation to his wife, and she nodded, watching Nichols intently. I looked around. The kids were still loose. There were gaggles of latecomers still wandering around and chatting in the back. Kyle's eyes were open, but his lips were moving vaguely. He was praying. Good. I did some praying myself, but never took my eyes off Nichols. And that's why we were with... Why we're... When it... One more try. That's why we were where we were when... He was flustered but kept going his voice tense and his good humor strained. He was trying to promise us a better world, trying to convince us how such a dream was in our hands. He lost his train of thought and stopped cold. He backed up, picked it up again, hurriedly mumbled some point about how we could achieve heights our parents never dreamed of. I want it quiet in here! It was a sudden, alarming flash of temper. The people sitting near me reacted as if they'd been slapped. He pointed to some kids running up the aisle in front of him. Whose children are these? He didn't wait for an answer. I want them out of here, now! A burly usher grabbed the arm of a little boy running by, whip-cracking him and hauling him in. The kid screamed bloody murder, kicking and punching as the usher carried him toward an exit. His mother popped up out of the vast, seated crowd and started hollering for him, tripping over chairs and feet trying to get out of her row. Take him out! said Nichols. And then he pointed to some other children still running loose. And those two, that girl and that girl and those two boys and that one running back there, get them out of my sight. Now there was a murmur in the crowd. People were looking at each other, whispering, concerned. This isn't like Jesus, I could imagine them saying. Kyle and I drank it all in. I caught myself smiling again and put my hand over my mouth. Parents were popping up all over the crowd, working their way into the aisles, 
hollering, clapping, and fingers snapping at their kids. Some returned to their seats with their fussing children in tow. Many headed for the exits, indignant. For several minutes, two couples had to chase their kids around the tent and actually catch them before hauling them out, kicking and screaming. Nichols pointed an accusing finger and sighted down it at some latecomers meandering around in the back. And you people, you're late. Do you have any idea what message that sends to the rest of us? Or to me? Now find your seats and please stop your talking. Now this was quite a show. Brandon Nichols stood there like iron, scanning the crowd with a seething expression, waiting for his orders to be fulfilled. When it was quiet, nervously, tensely quiet, he said, I hope today will set a precedent in your minds. We may be under a tent, but this is not a circus, nor is it a playground, and I am not here to compete with unruly children and gabby latecomers. He drew a breath. Now, where was I? He went on for a while, trying to throw in some jokes about the kid and latecomer problem, but getting half laughs for his trouble. His talk came to an anticlimactic ending, and I sensed that all of us, including Nichols, were just as happy to have it over. He moved on to the spectacle he was known for, going to people in the audience, apparently with no prior knowledge of who they were or what their problem was, and touching them. He ventured into the audience and started healing bad eyes, bad knees, bad lungs. A short but very fat woman came running down the aisle, reaching out toward him. Matt Kiley and two other toughs waylaid her and started walking and almost dragging her back to her seat. You haven't helped me, she screamed at Nichols. Look at me, just look at me. He'd been trying to ignore her, but finally pointed at her and growled into the wireless microphone. It's not my fault you're fat. You're fat because you lie around eating Big Macs and bonbons all day. Now sit down in however many chairs you have back there and be quiet. I've already touched you twice. He did his best to recover his momentum, working his way around the two big tents, naming and healing sicknesses and sometimes granting favors. I watched in fascination. This used to be easy for him, but not tonight. People were getting out of their seats, clogging the aisles, shooting out their hands to touch him. Back in your seats, people! Get back in your seats! He had to repeat the same order. And then his head swiveled and his hair flew out sideways as he angrily searched the room. Where are my ushers? Matt and his heavies could only hold so many back before others broke through the line. They were wrestling with four or five petitioners when a young trench-coated man broke through and almost tackled Nichols. Nichols spun around and gave the man a shove that floored him. Don't touch me. Just keep your hands off, all right? He beat away another hand, reaching toward him. Get away. I told you before, I don't heal procrastination. And you, if you want a million dollars, try working. What do you think I am, a genie? A man behind me quipped. Welcome to Earth, God. Kyle and I cracked up careful to do it quietly. When Matt Kiley bumped up against me with an invitation to meet with Nichols, he made it sound as if I had no choice. I followed him into Mrs. Macon's living room to find Antioch's Messiah pacing and cursing, his brand new perm getting a little frizzy. Get out of here, Matt. If I need you, I'll call you. Matt didn't take kindly to being barked at, but he left us alone. Justin Cantwell, that's what I now called him, went to Mrs. Macon's minibar and poured himself a drink. He did it so hurriedly I thought he'd spill it. Travis, you are wasting your time, as always. There is nothing to discover in Netchville, nothing that you don't already know. You've already been there, believe me. I have to follow it up. You ought to know that. I thought he'd throw his drink at me, but he contained himself. Lies! All you will hear is lies. Travis, they've done the same thing to you as to me. It's all your fault. You're the one who's out of step, out of God's will, full of sin, destined for hell. You're the one who has to give up his questions and fall in line. You're the one who has his whole life shredded to pieces. He spread his arms and drawled like a southern preacher. All uh, in the name of righteousness. What are you so afraid of? He gulped from his drink and leered at me. You think you can analyze me? There's no fear here, Travis. Not of you, not of the kid preacher you dragged along. Why'd you bring him anyway? For backup? Of course. 
He just rolled his eyes at me. Oh, I'm petrified. Then he took another swallow. I am upset, that's obvious. I'm upset at you and your refusal to let the slightest clue penetrate that skull of yours. I'm upset at all those people out there and all their crap. He paced in tight little circles, his hand messing up his permed hair. The people in George Harding's RV park think they should have equal time parking up here like the others. The people parking up here want lifetime spaces and special restroom privileges. They bring all their kids, but nobody wants to take charge of them. Some don't like the music. Some want more music. The chairs are too hard. It's too hot in the tent. It's too cold. I've got a bunch of old people who won't sit anywhere but clear in the back and then complain because they can't hear. I've got another bunch who are always late. Always! And have a different excuse every time. I've got four different factions in a big fight over what to do with our website, and we don't even have a website! I smiled gleefully. I couldn't help it. Having a little trouble there, Justin? Why are you smiling? You did no better. I gave a little shrug. I lasted longer. Hey, Justin, fifteen years in this town. You haven't even gotten to year one. I've got six hundred followers, top that. And no one to run the nursery. He refilled his glass and paced toward the fireplace. I'm not worried about it. It's only a wrinkle in the process. We'll iron it out. He rested his arm on the mantle and took another gulp. But if you had these people in your church, they're asking for fancy cars now and houses and bags of money. Can you believe that? That same guy was back today wanting me to heal him of procrastination. Procrastination! As if it's my fault he can't get his act together. I thought you said you give them what they want. But they never stop wanting. I healed the guy's thyroid. He came back the next week wanting me to heal his baldness. And then he came back wanting me to help him play a piano better. And this week he came back with three friends who want to be more sexually attractive. There's that other woman who wants me to make her thin, but she won't stop eating. And this other jerk who wants to be rich, but never worked a day in his life. I could only shrug. What did you expect? They could grow up a little. I feigned wide-eyed surprise. They have to grow up? Really? He threw back his drink, drained it, and slammed down the glass. You may as well stop gloating, Travis. They are going to fall in line. It's going to happen, believe me, and I hope you'll be around. He went to the couch, sat down, then got right up again. His hands couldn't stop moving, his fingers drumming. Elise, one of the cathedral's finest, did she bother telling you how I reached out to her? Tried to comfort her, tried to bring some minuscule token of human warmth into her life? She did. That answer seemed to mollify him, if only slightly. I was trying to prevent another casualty. I nodded. I understand. Then why are you going to Netchville? I'd never seen that crazed look in his eyes before. It made me take note of how I could avoid the furniture and how far it was to the door. Easy, Justin, easy. I'm here to talk to you first. You can save me the trip. You will not corner me. I threw up my hands, palms forward. Okay, okay. Just be mindful of who's forcing whose hand here. He leaned against the hearth again, glaring at the flames, silent and brooding. After a long, uncomfortable moment, he faced me directly, his lip drooping into a sneer. So go to Netchville. You'll recognize it. It's where we started, you and me. He looked away, as if viewing it in his mind's eye. Meet my daddy. Talk to my mom. Hear what a lie really sounds like. Maybe you'll finally wake up. Finally, he looked at me. When you come back, we'll talk about it. Have a drink. Compare notes. I'll enjoy seeing your conversion. He pointed his finger at me. Just be sure you find out everything. Have you got your mom's phone number? He turned away. It's your voyage. I found my own way out to the front porch where Kyle was waiting. We moved toward the parking lot. Most of the cars were gone by now. The RV people were milling around their big vehicles, apparently discussing the meeting. Their faces weren't this glum the last time I was here. What do you think? Kyle asked. He's heading for rough water, I replied and you and I are part of the storm. I think we're being followed. I had no reason not to look back. The moment I did, a hooded figure walked faster, moving toward us, looking down, face concealed. We were near my car. Let's get the doors open.
Kyle opened a rear door as an invitation, then got in the front passenger seat. I got behind the wheel and then beckoned to the hooded stranger to hurry and get in. The figure slipped quickly into the back seat and closed the door. Thank you. Please get me out of here. I started the engine and got moving. Better lie down. She slumped over, the hood of her coat over her face. It was Sally Fordyce. We knew her voice and saw a part of her face as she climbed in. It was bruised yellow, green, and black. One eye was swollen shut. I reached over and locked all the doors with the auto lock. Lie still, Kyle cautioned her without looking back. We'll get you out of here. Please hurry. Just keep calm, I said. We aren't going to stop, not for anybody. We drove past the parking lot attendants in their bright orange vests. One eyed us suspiciously, his walkie-talkie close to his jaw. I couldn't be sure if he knew. I kept driving, not looking his way in case he tried to signal me. I turned down the driveway and added some speed. In a few minutes, we were out on the highway. I hit the accelerator. Kyle turned. Have you seen a doctor? She sat up but kept her hood around her face, embarrassed. No, Brandon wouldn't allow it. I could see her face in the rearview mirror. You'd better see a doctor. I'm not kidding. I want to go home first. Kyle was visibly angry. Did he do this to you? She broke down weeping as she nodded. He's going crazy. What about Mary Donovan? I asked. She's okay. She could see us both giving her a second look and added, She's not one of his lovers. Kyle flopped back in his seat. Lord, help us. Oh, great, I said. What? I was watching the rear window past Sally's battered face and saw blue lights flashing. Kyle twisted around and looked back. It's Henkel, Sally wailed. No, don't stop. Take it easy, I said, watching the image in my mirror. She was desperate, frantic. He's working for Brandon, can't you see that? He's trying to take me back. She's probably right, said Kyle. I wanted more. Sally, listen to me. That's a police officer back there. I have to stop. No! Then I need a good reason not to. She dropped the hood from her face. I could see Kyle's face twist with horror and disgust. Trav, she's been bleeding. I saw enough in the rearview mirror to turn my stomach. You think Brandon would want people to see this? She asked. Kyle took her side. Brandon's the one who beat up Sally, so why is Henkel chasing us? Did I trust Brett Henkel? Not anymore. Okay, okay, we won't stop, but I want witnesses. I grabbed up the cell phone line next to the gear shift and handed it to Kyle. Sally, what's your home phone number? She said her number and Kyle tapped it in. Tell Meg and Charlie we're taking Sally to the clinic and to meet us there. Tell them to bring some friends. And then call 911 and tell them we're transporting a beating victim to the clinic. And you can tell them we're being escorted by Officer Brett Henkel. Then I prayed out loud. And Lord, please help us. I caught Sally's eye in the mirror. Don't worry, Sally. I'm not stopping. Not for anybody. 25. Brett turned on his siren. My heart was pounding, and I felt guilty. Hey, I was disobeying an officer. But I kept going, driving under the speed limit. Sally whimpered and cowered in the back seat, her hood over her face. Lord God, send your angels to help us. Kyle prayed aloud, and then said into the cell phone, Hello, Mrs. Fordyce. He was too excited to talk slowly. He had to keep repeating himself. We're on our way now. We're on our way into town. No, we're on the highway west of town going into town. No, Sally's in the car with us. She's in our car. We're going to the clinic. No, the clinic. I could see Hunkle through the windshield, talking on his radio. I rolled down my window and signaled with my arm for him to come alongside. He gunned his big engine and pulled up beside us, rolling his window down. Pull the car over, Travis, he hollered jabbing the air with his finger. We're transporting an injury victim to the clinic. Pull the car over! In my right ear, Kyle was talking to the 911 dispatcher. We're inbound on the highway west of town. Yeah, that's right. Officer Henkel is... Well, he's right beside us at the moment. Henkel shouted over the roar of our engines, our tires, and the wind. Stop and we'll transfer the victim to my vehicle. She can't be moved. Well, it was going to be the truth as far as I could help it. Pull over! And then he swore. 
hitting his brakes, ducking his car behind us just in time to avoid an oncoming semi. This could get hazardous, I said, slowing down to thirty. We were approaching the edge of town. Now the dispatcher's telling us to stop, Kyle reported. Then he told the dispatcher, Why don't we just all meet at the clinic, huh? Well, could you call Officer Henkel and explain our situation and tell him he doesn't need to be sounding that stupid siren? What? He listened, then told me. Henkel's called for a backup. Rod Stanton's going to block the road into town. I see him, I replied. Rod's squad car was parked along the highway at the western edge of town. But something was a little odd. Cars were slowing in our lane, brake lights shining, and there were people standing in the street and gathering on either side. I gathered we weren't the only show in town. I slowed. Oh, no, I said. Oh, no, Kyle echoed. What? said Sally, leaning forward between the front seats. There was another Jesus standing in the middle of the highway, a long-haired, bearded man in white robe and sandals. He was blonde, and I could imagine him being a yoga-humming, yogurt-eating surfer in California before coming to Antioch to try the Messiah game. He appeared to have a whip in his hand, and he was flailing each car as it passed, hollering and preach-pointing with his free hand. The first car passed him by, and then the next. The third stopped to listen, and I could see the passengers snapping pictures through the closed windows. I was coming up behind them. Stuck between false Christ number two and a cop. I couldn't stop with Henkel after me, but the right lane wasn't moving. A car came by us in the opposing lane, and then I pulled around, hoping to get by. This latest Jesus put out his hand and stood right in front of me, ranting and raving about something. What's he saying? Sally asked. I rolled down my window. Brett Henkel was pulling up right behind me, his siren still blaring. Can we get through here, please? I shouted, and I didn't sound nice. By now I had a real gripe against false Christs messing up my life. This one approached my window, whip in hand. No motor vehicle, sir. Thou shalt not pollute the air. A gift from the Father's own hand. We have to get to the clinic. It is written, my town shall be a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a garbage dump. This isn't your town, bub. I'll get him to move, said Kyle, opening his door. What? I said, but it was too late to stop him. Extinguish your engine, my beloved, said the Christ, and partake of the clean air God has... Excuse me, said Kyle, coming around the front of my car. The phony Jesus brandished his whip as if defending himself. Touch me not! Red Henkel cut his siren and got out of his car. Kyle held out a dollar. See this here? You would bribe the Holy One of Israel? Some pilgrims were moving closer, cameras ready. A woman in pink shorts and a plastic sun hat touched him, stood there a moment, then turned to walk back to her friends. I didn't feel anything, she reported. Kyle held the dollar out, coaxing the Christ toward the left side of the road. Whose face is this? And whose inscription? The Christ took the dollar and looked at it. George Washington? You're standing in George's road. Did you know that? The Christ looked down at George's pavement. Render unto George the things that are George's. Can I keep his dollar? The Christ asked. Okay, hold it, said Brett Henkel, striding from his car, pushing through the pilgrims, his club ready. But a woman in a biblical outfit got there first, embracing the Christ. Son, my beloved son! The Christ looked baffled. Who are you? She stepped back and gave him the classic mother look, her hands on her hips. I happen to be your mother. Wow, another one. Brett was getting close. You'd better go, Kyle told me. I knew Kyle was sacrificing himself. I gave him a nod of thanks and eased forward through the gathering bodies. Travis, don't you leave, Brett warned, pointing his nightstick at me. I hollered out my window, just meet me at the clinic, and kept going. In my mirror, I saw a four-way spat going between Brett Henkel, Kyle, the Christ, and his long-lost mother. Then Rod joined up and they had a five-way going. Antioch was definitely an exciting place to visit. I reached the clinic in two minutes. Charlie and Meg Fordyce were already there and took Sally inside. They'd gotten the word around. Morgan Elliott was also there, along with Jim Baylor, Joe and Emily Kelmer, and Bruce Hiddle. They all saw Sally's condition before her parents hurried her through the door, and now they gathered around me. Don't worry about a thing, Travis, said Joe. Morgan put one arm around me, 
gave me a quick hug and let go. We'll see whose side old Henkel's on, said Jim. Brett Henkel screeched to a halt right beside my car and almost fell out he was so upset. Travis? Then he regarded the others standing around me and balked a little. Now, folks, I wouldn't recommend getting involved in this. Come into the clinic and have a look at Sally, I said. First, I'm taking you in. No, you're not, said Joe. He was transporting an injury victim. It was an emergency. I'll be the judge of that. Rod Stanton drove into the parking lot of the clinic with Kyle sitting in the back of his squad car. Brett nodded toward his backup and said, It's over, folks. Now, unless you all want to be arrested, you'll stand aside and let me do my duty. I think you'd better take a look at Sally and do your duty, Jim demanded. Let's do it, said Rod. Brett jerked his head around and glared at his deputy. I'm giving the orders here, deputy. Then he noticed Kyle wasn't handcuffed. Where are his cuffs? He's not under arrest. It wasn't just a statement of fact. It was an act of defiance, and I could tell Rod knew it. He hasn't done anything wrong, and besides that, he helped me quell that second Jesus situation. Nobody's getting arrested here today, said Joe. Unless it's Mr. Brandon, the home wrecker and lover beater, said Jim, jabbing his finger toward the ranch. Brett, I said. I'm hoping your loyalty is still to the law and to this community. If so, I'm sure you can understand my not stopping. You resisted an officer, Travis. You resisted an officer, fled an officer, disobeyed an officer, acted like a jerk, made an officer look like a jerk. Don't give us that officer business, said Kyle. You're not an officer of the law. You're an officer for Brandon Nichols, and you know it. Brett turned deliberately and put his hand on his gun. You want to say that again? Bruce interceded. Officer, I think Kyle is asking you to clarify where your loyalties lie. With the law and justice and the good of this community? Or with Brandon Nichols? Just who's calling the shots here? Brett just stood there, stuck. Rod tapped Brett's arm with the back of his fingers. Come on, let's talk to Sally and take it from there. For an agonizing moment, the only sound was Brett's labored, angry breathing. Finally, abruptly, Brett started toward the door of the clinic, but not without barking a few last-word orders. I want this parking lot cleared. If you've no business here, then clear out, now! I tagged Kyle and Morgan. Let's get to a phone. I held the receiver to my ear and dialed the number I got from information. Come on now, time's getting tight. I was sitting in Morgan's office at the Methodist Church. Morgan and Kyle were sitting in the church office behind the foyer, listening in on a speakerphone, its microphone muted. We all listened as the telephone rang at the other end once, twice, three times, four times. Hello? The voice sounded grumpy, gravelly, and a little slurred. Hello, is this the Cantwell residence? Yeah, who's this? The man could have been drunk. It was hard to understand him. Hello, I'm Travis Jordan. I live in Antioch, Washington. I suppose you've read about us in the papers? No. Oh, well, I'm calling to speak to Lois Cantwell. She's not home right now. This guy could never get a job telephone soliciting, that was for sure. He could get a job discouraging solicitors. Well, then, is this Reverend Ernest Cantwell? Yeah, who's this? I told him who I was again. I think we might have a mutual acquaintance. Would you by any chance have a son named Justin? There was silence at the other end, but I could hear a labored breathing. Are you there? I don't have a son named Justin, no. Any relation at all named Justin? No. Do you have a son? No. The tone of his voice told me otherwise. Well, I happen to know a Justin Cantwell who hails from Natchville, Texas, and has a mother named Lois. I don't know any Lois either. Oh, uh, excuse me, sir, but you just told me Lois wasn't home right now. I'm calling a number listed under both your names, Ernest and Lois Cantwell. Don't call this number again. Click. I hung up and sat back to wait for Kyle and Morgan to journey through the church sanctuary and join me. As they entered the office, I looked up at them for their reaction. Morgan shrugged a little. I guess I'm not surprised. Kyle patted his pockets symbolically. Anybody got change for airfare? 
I could sell my mother's old watch, Morgan quipped. Gildy! The scream rattled the house and made Gildy Holiday jump in her seat. She was already nervous and frightened. She'd been working in the quaint desk just off the kitchen, writing checks to pay the help and compiling a grocery list, when she heard the crashes, tinkles, and rips coming from the guest room. That was Nichols's room now. He decided the main house was more to his liking than the guest cottage. The big kitchen more practical for his parties, the larger, more elegant guest bedroom more conducive to his romantic flings. But the arrangement also put him under the same roof as Gildy, with no walls or bars between them. She didn't answer him, but clicked off her computer, threw the corporate checkbook into a drawer and grabbed her coat. It was time to get out of there. Brandon Nichols was moving through the house like a man possessed, his footsteps quick and pounding, his breath chugging. She headed for the back door. He was there, his eyes like those of a stalking panther, his hair dangling like black lightning bolts across his brow. He moved toward her. She ran behind her desk to keep it between them. Call Brett Henkel. The voice was low and sinister. My room's been vandalized. She picked up the telephone receiver on her desk, but hesitated to dial, staring at him. His eyes were darting about the room as if watching a swarm of tiny, invisible demons. Torn up, broken, everything a disaster, a disaster! He noticed she hadn't dialed. Well, call them! Somebody's been here. It's a senseless, despicable act of hatred. We have enemies, Gildy. They're trying to destroy us. He stopped in the middle of the room, wiping drool from his mouth with the back of his hand. Trying to destroy us. Hate. It's everywhere, all around. Notify the staff. We're going to heighten security tonight. No one comes or goes. We're locking the place down. I'll tell them, she said weakly, still holding the receiver, but not calling. Now he seemed dazed by his own anger, scanning the room slowly turning as if searching. That bedroom is swimming with evil. It's crawling. It's alive. I can't sleep there anymore. You can sleep in the third bedroom. No one's using that room right now. He nodded, his eyes still crazy. Good. Don't call the cops. She put the telephone down. They don't need to know. Nobody needs to know. Nobody. He moved toward the hall as she stood behind her desk, watching his every move. You can't trust them anyway. You can't trust cops. They stand by and let horrible things happen to you. Did you know that? They stand by. Just stand by. I need to check on Mrs. Macon. He nodded. Go ahead. Go. Then he laughed, apparently at himself. Don't mind me. I'm just a child of the devil. He headed down the hall to his room and closed the door behind him. She heard him roar like a madman. There was another crash. A piece of furniture hit the door. The house quivered. A window broke. Gildy buttoned up her coat, went straight to Mrs. Macon's room, knocked lightly, then went in. In a matter of minutes, she emerged again, carrying Mrs. Macon, now wearing a robe and wrapped in a blanket. The widow's eyes were open, but she seemed oblivious to the fact that she was being carried hurriedly down the hall and through the kitchen. Gildy went out the back door, put the widow in her car, and drove away. Kyle, Morgan, and I put our heads together, pooled our bank accounts, and called the travel agent. She could get me into Dallas-Fort Worth, where I could rent a car to drive to Netchville, and fit it into our waning budget if I flew out of Spokane that night and out of Seattle at one in the morning. I had to brace myself before agreeing, and then it was settled. Kyle left for home. I remained with Morgan in her office. What is it? she asked. After months of playing Justin Cantwell's strange game, things were becoming clear. I know what I'm going to find in Netchville. She nodded. You know what Marion said when we found out she had lung cancer? I was still sitting at Morgan's desk. She sat down across from me and listened, as she always did. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to tell her or what to do, and she just said, Travis, take me ice skating. The vision flashed across my mind. We were kids in our twenties. I had my arm around her waist and her hand in mine, and the world was rushing by us. 
We were in our forties, on the ice again, and she was giving me that one special look. A wave of emotion hit me, and I could hardly speak my confession. I could barely remember how it had been so long. Morgan heaved a troubled sigh. I should have gone fishing with Gabe. He asked me so many times, but always ended up going with his buddies. I had to stay here, studying, fulfilling some counseling appointments I could have scheduled for another time. Hey, it was ministry. I was doing it for God. And now I've never been able to understand why I never got it through my head. I was his first choice for a fishing buddy. His first choice, and I never went. I found a smile somewhere, passed it on to her, and wiped the corners of my eyes. I think Marion and I enjoyed ministering together. We lived it, we talked about it, we spent our days and nights immersed in it. But now I'm afraid. Mm hmm. I'm afraid that. that maybe it was the ministry that defined us. That somehow it was church that summarized what we were. We were the program. The preaching, the Sunday school, the youth choir, the bus, the building. But were we ever us? When Marion died, it hit me so hard and so cruel. All the church stuff was still there. The service schedule, the song sheets, the visitation committee, it was all still there. But Marion was gone. The church stuff would always be there in one form or another. Always needing, always demanding. But there was only one Marion. Only one chance to know her, and that was over. You know, we prayed around the clock for Marion's healing. The whole church fasted, and we had people signed to 24 one-hour shifts. Dee and her friends tried to speak a healing into existence. I got a note from somebody who said they had a dream. If I'd dip Marion seven times in the baptistry, she'd be healed. My little laugh was sad. I almost tried that. I took her to some faith healing meetings. You know the kind. You go in there and some loud, flamboyant evangelist with big hair starts laying hands on people and they start falling over while the organ player runs his finger down the keyboard. It was strange, I guess, kind of hokey. But when you're grasping, I believe God could have healed Marion. I still believe the Lord heals. I mean, look at Joe Kelmer. Bang! Healed, just like that. But can you figure God out? All the things we tried, all the faith and the methods, and the shadows on her x-rays just kept getting bigger, kept spreading. They took out her left lung, and the shadow spread to her right. And then the cancer started popping up other places. I think she knew. I mean, clear back when she wanted to go ice skating again. She always had a special intimacy with God, an inside line or something. I think she knew. But she stuck by me. She hoped right along with me, and we fought together against the whole idea of her dying, and we both tried to faith our way out of it. But we, uh, we finally got a clue, or I got a clue. God has his ways. He just plain has his ways. By the time she died, it was almost a non-event. We were so ready for it. She was holding my hand and I could feel the moment she slipped away. It was June 12th, 1997, just five months after we saw those first x-rays. I drew a deep breath and sighed it out, bringing my recollections to a close. God will do what God will do. Morgan studied me a moment, then asked, Do you still trust him? I had no trouble nodding yes. Then you're one up on Justin Cantwell. That came as a revelation, and it made me chuckle. When did that happen? She had a playful delight in her eyes. Sometime after Justin got here. As you said, God has his ways. Maybe it took a bitter man not having to show you what you did have. And to show me? She reached across the desk and took my hand as tears filled her eyes. Jesus was hiding, that's all. Hiding in the memories, all the places you've been, 
all the people you've known, all the paths he's walked with you, whether you understood it all or not. She paused to reflect, then told me, what Justin Cantwell wouldn't give for just one good memory. I packed a small bag with enough clothes and necessities for an overnight in Texas and drove to Spokane to catch an 11 o'clock flight to Seattle. The flight from Seattle to Dallas-Fort Worth would arrive around 6.30 in the morning, Dallas time. The drive to Netchville would take about three hours, which meant I'd be arriving in that little town just in time for Sunday morning services. Needless to say, I wouldn't be sleeping much. Armand Harrison finally left Anderson's furniture and appliance after bickering over the price of a television and whether or not the stand should be included or be extra. Now Don Anderson was alone in his big glittery store, surrounded by washers, dryers, televisions, CD players, VCRs, DVD players, all shapes and sizes of radios, telephones, toys, CDs, cassettes. And he had to get a handle on his new ability. He had to control it, channel it, rein it in, and use it in some orderly, controlled fashion. If he didn't, he could hear the lights overhead humming at him like a swarm of bees, so loud it was hard to hear someone talking to him from across the store. Well, okay, he could always stand closer to someone talking. When he started up a kerosene heater to demonstrate for a customer, it roared like a toilet refilling after a flush. He had to ask the customer to repeat himself a few times. Well, it only made that noise when it was running. He could always turn it off and hope he'd never need the heat. But the CDs, oh, the CDs. All he had to do now was touch the plastic cases, and they would start playing in his head right through the shrink wrap. He put one of the girls in charge of stocking the CD rack and left it to her to sell them as well. And now there were the radios. He could hear them all over the room, wailing and thumping the rock stations, crooning the easy listening stuff, or garbling out the news and sports, no less than fifty of them at once. And they were all turned off. Maybe he could tune them all to the same station. Something sweet and relaxing. He went to the first radio, a portable CD-slash-cassette-slash- AMFM virtual surround sound unit. All he did was touch the tuning knob, and he could hear the station as if he were wearing headphones. He twirled the knob until he heard the kind of music they play in elevators. Ah, he could live with that. He went to the next unit, another portable stereo, but this one bigger, with more bells and whistles. He set the station. Hey, this was going to work. See there, Don? One step at a time. We'll get a handle on this, I hope. I hope. Then it occurred to him. Sure, there were no less than fifty radios on display in the store. He could get to them easily. But there were at least a hundred more in unopened boxes stacked under the shelves and in the back room. And he could hear them, too. Oh, man, this was going to be a long night. As he headed for the counter for a carton knife, he passed by the washing machines. Oh, no, now what? It sounded like a squadron of B-17s flying overhead. He leaned on a washer. The rumble made him jump. He could feel it all through his body. No! He faced the washing machine, staring it right in the control knob and pleaded with it. You're not running. You're not turned on. You're not even plugged in. It rumbled at him. Its companion dryer rumbled, too. The whole row of washers and dryers rumbled like circus lions in a cage. He backed away. The rumbling quieted a little. They seemed to be consulting one another, rumbling and mumbling. Could he live with this, too? You don't scare me, he muttered. They rumbled at him. It scared him to death. Matt Kiley burst through the door of his hardware store, startling Bev Parsons, his soft-spoken right-hand gal. How's it going? She was checking out a customer and held her peace until the customer stepped out the door. Then she showed a sour side he'd never seen before. If you expect me to run this store all by myself, I expect to be paid accordingly. He brushed past her. You're not running it all by yourself. She was never one to be forward, but today she was angry enough. She followed directly behind him, down the aisle past the lawn sprinklers and garden sprayers, talking to his back, but getting it said. 
I've kept track of the hours I've been here running this whole operation while you've been up at the ranch, and let me tell you, I might as well own this place. He stopped and turned so fast she ran into him. You think you're the only one who has problems? If anything happens to Brandon Nichols, we could all be out of work. He continued toward the back of the store. She followed him. What do you mean? I mean he has enemies. Somebody came right into the house and trashed his room. He reached the gun counter. Barney! Yeah? Barney Myers replied from the automotive section. Let's have the key to the gun cabinets. He turned to Bev. Happens every time. Somebody starts doing the right thing and somebody else decides they have to harass him. Well, nobody's going to harass Brandon Nichols. Not if I've got anything to say about it. Barney brought the key, and Matt opened the gun display case. He reached for a semi-automatic pistol, ripped off the price tag, and slipped it in his coat pocket. Give me two cases of 9 millimeter rounds, those hollow points, and two boxes. No, make that four boxes of 12-gauge shells. Double-aught buckshot. Barney selected the ammo cartons while Matt took a shotgun from the rack behind the counter. Bev's voice quavered with fear. But you can't just shoot somebody. Matt took the boxes of shells from Barney. Well, they don't have to break into Brandon's house either now, do they? Thanks, Barney. He hurried around the counter and up the aisle again. They don't have to get near him. They don't have to come on the property. They don't have to come nose to nose with me. It's all up to them. Close up tonight, same as usual. I'll be back sometime tomorrow. 26. I was driving across Texas in the early morning, covering miles and miles under a golden dawn, and feeling continually deceived by the crumpled, wrongly folded road map on the seat beside me. Maps of Texas still have to fit in your car, so they make Texas look smaller than you first assume. Twice I was sure I'd missed a town or a turn, only to find it thirty or forty more miles down the road. Natchville looked like a quick trip, but it was three hours at legal speeds, as promised. The lady who rented me my car told me I would probably smell Natchville before I saw it, and she was right. At first I thought something in my car was overheating or shorting out, but I soon discovered it was just the wind coming through my vents after blowing through Natchville's stockyards and oil rigs. It smelled like a herd of cattle tarring a roof, the scent of manure and ammonia interlaced with the stench of black crude. Undoubtedly, the people of Netchville had long ago learned to live with it, since the town wouldn't be there at all without it. I drove by the stockyards, the ground trampled and fertilized to a thick, gamey black under hundreds of hooves, and saw the oil wells on the right and the left nodding slowly, emphatically, yes, yes, yes. Slowing to 25 miles per hour, I passed the city limit sign. Netchville, population 2,125. It was not a bad little town at first glance, almost a Texas version of Antioch. They had a feed store, a tractor and implement dealer, a true value hardware, even a local appliance store. Only it wasn't Pepto-Bismol pink. So here I was, a stranger in a strange town in the middle of the vast state of Texas and feeling like it. Now what? I pulled over at a service station to top off the tank and check the yellow pages of a phone book. As I flipped the phone book open, I was praying for help and guidance. I could feel butterflies in my stomach. Churches, churches. I would know it when I saw it. It wouldn't be Catholic, Methodist, Lutheran, or Baptist. I was guessing it would be, how shall I say it, hyper-Pentecostal. Judging from Justin Cantwell's bitterness and the reception I got from the Reverend Ernest Cantwell, it would be stridently, strictly, inflexibly, legalistically, pharisaically Pentecostal. There would be a long list of complex, tangled, sometimes contradictory, often hypocritical, but absolutely essential requirements and taboos defining what it meant to be a Christian. I was familiar with that kind of church and glad I never had to attend one. I was guessing that Justin Cantwell did. My finger stopped on a promising possibility. The Nashville Church of the True Gospel. Good morning and praise God, said the cheerful male voice. True Gospel? Hi, what time is your service this morning? Sunday school at 9.45 and morning worships at 11. Is Pastor Cantwell preaching? Oh, absolutely. You can't hold him back. Think you can join us? I'll be there. Well, you're going to hear the truth. That's what we're all about. And your name is? 
I said. Thanks a lot, cheerfully, and hung up. They'd pick the right guy to answer the phone. If I were them, I sure wouldn't want the pastor doing it. I checked my watch. It was just before ten, so I had an hour. I asked the man at the cash register how I might find the church, and he drew me a map. Then I returned to my car and drove through town in no particular hurry. I didn't want to attend Sunday school because I'd be sitting in the adult Sunday school class where I'd have to introduce myself to everyone else, and most likely Reverend Cantwell would be teaching. I wanted a chance to get a feel for the place first. Now I'd be the timid visitor sitting in the back. What happened next had to be the gentle, guiding hand of God. I was driving by a quaint, wide-porched home on Main Street and spotted a sign in the yard. H. K. Sullivan, M.D. I got a hunch. I felt in my spirit that I should stop. And so I did. Parked across the street, I took a moment to rethink it. I didn't know how many doctors were in this town, probably not many. Whenever and however Justin Cantwell got those scars on his arms, this doctor might know about it, or perhaps know the doctor who did. There was a car in the driveway. I thought I saw someone in the backyard. It couldn't hurt to knock on the door and ask. Dr. Howard Sullivan was in his seventies, dressed in work jeans and a T-shirt advertising Imodium A.D., he sat beside Mrs. Sullivan on their couch while I sat opposite them, waiting for the doctor's verdict on the photographs I'd handed him. So now he's claiming to be Jesus, he muttered. He's allowing people to believe and say that about him. I qualified. The doctor laid the photos out side by side on the coffee table, studying them. His wife held his arm, her eyes troubled. There's a whole lot I could tell you about him, but I can't. I closed my eyes and sighed in disappointment and frustration. Don't be rude. I reprimanded myself. You do understand my situation. He nodded. I sure do. More than you think. And I want to help you, but I can't tell you anything without the Cantwell's consent. That's just the way I do things. Is his name Justin Cantwell? The doctor nodded. I can tell you that, yes. Was he ever a patient of yours? The doctor nodded again, but said nothing. Did you treat the wounds in his forearms? I didn't get a response. Mrs. Sullivan pulled her husband's arm and said, I don't think you'd better go any further. I did, said the doctor. Honey, now that's all, she warned him. And then she told me, This is a small, close-knit little town, and we watch out for our neighbors. If we violated any trust, we wouldn't survive here. Talk to the Cantwells, said the doctor, picking up the photos and handing them to me. Please. I want to help you. I want to bring this whole sad story to a close. They'll be in church pretty soon, said Mrs. Sullivan, looking at the mantel clock. That would be a good place to meet them. He'd have to behave himself in front of his congregation, she jabbed him. Honey! Then she told me, You may not get far with Pastor Cantwell, but I think Mrs. Cantwell will be sympathetic. Work on her if you can. All I need is their consent. I need to hear from them that I can talk to you. It's the Church of the True Gospel, is that right? Over on Dunbar Street, two blocks down, turn left, three blocks on the right. It was an old brick building with thick concrete steps and a blue neon Jesus Saves sign bolted to the top of the facade. Worshippers were gathering, moving from the gravel parking lot, approaching from either direction on the sidewalk, dressed in their Sunday best, toting their Bibles, it might mean different things to different folks in different parts of the country, but for these people in this part of the country, they looked very religious. I was parked across the street. I checked my tie in the rearview mirror. It was black, very safe. I ran a comb through my hair, recently cut, with ears and collar uncovered. I'd already given my face the once-over with a small travel razor. I had a suit coat ready on a hanger and a good-sized Bible on the seat. Hopefully, I would look righteous enough not to disturb anyone. I stepped out of my car, slipped into my suit coat, straightened and adjusted everything, and crossed the street, returning whatever smile or greeting came my way. The piano and organ were already playing the prelude. I followed the other folks up the front steps. Passing through the door, I noticed a yardstick tacked to the doorpost for measuring the height of hemlines. I'd heard about that practice but this was the first time I had actually seen it. Being a Pentecostal, 
I gravitate toward the livelier kind of worship. I'm not a dancer, jumper, or roller, but I like a good tune, a catchy rhythm, and lyrics that express how I feel about my Savior. This church had them. The worship was great. A little protracted and repetitious for my taste, but nobody else seemed to mind, so neither did I. The young fellow leading worship did plenty of jumping, and when he spoke, I recognized the cheerful voice I'd heard on the telephone. But I wasn't prepared for the pastor, the haggard, graying wraith sitting in a wheelchair on the platform. He clutched a huge Bible in blue-veined, seemingly palsied hands and glared at everyone. Sure, he smiled frequently, raised his hands in praise, sang the songs, and shouted hallelujah. But his eyes never lost that steely glare, and he never lost that weird hunch, either, like a buzzard perched in a dead snag, waiting for his next meal to die. This was Reverend Ernest Cantwell? This was Justin's daddy? I had food for thought already. They went through announcements and some testimonies, and then it was the Reverend's turn to preach. When he raised his arms to grip and propel his chair wheels, I saw that big buzzard again, ruffling his wings ready to fly. He wheeled up to a specially made lowered pulpit, set his big Bible on it, and then gaffed our attention with those eyes. I would that you were either cold or hot, he began, and I recognized the voice I heard on the telephone. A coarse, ragged, booming voice you didn't trifle with, slurring the words. But since you are lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Amen, they said. That's right. The axe is already laid to the roots, and every plant that does not bear fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Save us, Lord. Amen. I looked throughout the nation for a righteous man, and I found none. There was none righteous, no, not one, and my anger was kindled against my people, and it repented me that I had made them and set them on a hill, but woe to them, for now that hill will be brought low. Amen. So come out, my people, come out from among them, and be ye separate, for great is their destruction, and their destruction is nigh at hand, and the smoke of their destruction shall go up like the smoke of a furnace forever and ever. The locomotive started rolling, leaving the station, gaining speed. Our nation is ripe for judgment. Amen. Our towns and our cities are ripe for judgment. Amen. The church is ripe for judgment. Yes, and you are ripe for judgment. Amen, that's right. Did you hear me? I said you are ripe for judgment. Lord, save us. You are ripe for judgment. Amen. I said you are ripe for judgment. With a steady, pounding cadence, he went down the universal list of vices, added a few of his own sports on Sunday, and cable TV, and condemned them all. He warned the president, he warned Congress, he warned Hollywood, and he warned the game shows and soap operas. He dealt in depth with the horrible things God had planned for sinners like us, and told us he'd learned how hot hell was, at least ten times the heat of a nuclear blast, the difference being, it lasts and lasts. With help from the song leader, he took off his suit coat and then wiped the sweat from his brow. He kept going, hot and heavy, wheeling from one side of the platform to the other, his weak and faulty arms swatting invisible bees, his voice bouncing off the walls. For forty minutes, he scared the bejeebers out of us, and when our terror of God and judgment had reached just the right level, he brought Jesus into it, rolling along at such a clip that Jesus was jesus and judgment was judgment -a. The place was rocking with the rhythm of his words. He'd say it, we'd answer. He gave it, we took it. He shouted, we praised. Back and forth, back and forth. Yea and amen. Finally, he gave the invitation, and folks began moving to the altar to pray as Sister Cantwell, white-haired and serene, softly played almost persuaded on the organ. So this was Sister Lois Cantwell. 
I had to wonder about her. She seemed so gentle, so small, such a contrast to the fiery, rough-hewn reverend. She was dark-skinned, too, probably of Hispanic or Native American descent. Recalling Mrs. Sullivan's advice, I thought I might approach her first. I got my chance as the service ended, and the refreshed and rededicated saints filed out. Sister Cantwell? She was still seated at the organ, just saying goodbye to a sister in the Lord. She extended her hand. Hello, and you are? Travis Jordan. I was wondering if I might have a word with you and your husband. I dropped a hint. I'm from Antioch, Washington. That didn't faze her. My, you're far from home, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. So what brings you here? I braced myself, lowered my voice, and said, Justin Cantwell. That did face her. She placed her hand over her heart, and I thought she'd stopped breathing. Who are you? I'm Travis Jordan, I repeated. I'm a school teacher from Antioch, Washington. I was also a minister in the Pentecostal Mission Church for over 15 years. Have you seen my son? She nearly whispered. Yes, I have. He's in Antioch. We've visited on many occasions. She was obviously starving for news, any news. Is he all right? What's he doing? Hello! With a booming, gravelly, slurred voice, the reverend rolled up. Ernest Caldwell. He offered his bent, half-limp hand. And who might you be? Travis Jordan, I said, knowing his toothy smile was going to vanish the moment I said more. Sister Cantwell said it first. He knows our son. The reverend seemed perplexed. She further clarified. Justin. The smile vanished and that glare intensified. So what are you doing here? With my eyes, I indicated that other people were still around. Is there some place we could talk privately? What about? About Justin. His wife whispered with a plea in her voice. Conway! The reverend hollered and a man near the door immediately turned our way. He was big and had those cold animal eyes required of any good tavern bouncer. Oh, brother, I thought. I'm going to get thrown out of here. Ernest, Sister Cantwell pleaded. Reverend Cantwell spun his chair around and started wheeling toward the center aisle, zigzagging between folks visiting and praying. Can't we open up the office? We have to meet with this, this, whatever he is. I stood there. Sister Cantwell gave me a gentle touch on the arm, prodding me. Please. I weaved past the petitioning saints and down the center aisle with Sister Cantwell right behind me, and Conway the bouncer dead ahead. He had opened a door on the left side of the foyer, and now stood there while the reverend wheeled inside. I followed the reverend, and the reverend's wife followed me. We were in the pastor's office. He wheeled himself behind his desk and hollered to Conway from there. You want to hang around, Conway? I might need you. Conway nodded a slow, insider's kind of smile, and closed the office door as a sheriff would close a jail cell. Have a seat, said Cantwell. His wife already occupied one of the two available chairs. I planted myself in the other, my Bible and valise in my lap. The reverend glared at me a moment, then at his wife, then snapped at me with a flicker of his hand. So speak. I reached into my valise and pulled out the photos and news clippings again. This was getting to be a routine. I passed the photos to Mrs. Cantwell, explaining who I was, where I was from, and what was going on up there, and how a young man had come to town acting like some kind of new, improved messiah. At first sight of the photos, Mrs. Cantwell gasped, her hand over her mouth. Tears filled her eyes. Conway! The reverend yelled, and the door burst open. Conway looked ready to pummel me. I want to see these pictures. Conway walked right in front of me, grabbed the pictures from Mrs. Cantwell, and handed them over to the reverend. Stick around, the reverend ordered and Conway took his place against the door like an obedient, 280-pound Doberman. Cantwell studied the photos one at a time, his hands inept and fumbling. 
Then he threw them spitefully on his desk. So what? My eyes drifted to a picture on the bookshelf. Reverend and Mrs. Cantwell in their earlier years. Reverend Cantwell was standing. Cantwell didn't appreciate my looking at it. He reached over and tried to grab it, fumbling the picture frame so that it fell face down with a loud smack. The cuff of his shirt sleeve was unbuttoned. I saw a jagged scar on his forearm, but looked away before he knew it. Conway stepped in and positioned the picture safely on the shelf, face down. Is this man your son? I asked, indicating the photos. Our son is dead. Mrs. Cantwell groaned in anguish. Ernest, don't say that. He only reaffirmed it. Justin is dead, as far as I'm concerned. He's dead to this house, dead to this church, dead to this town. We don't want to see him again. He used both hands to gather up the pictures. And we don't appreciate your bringing him back. He handed the photos to Conway, who handed them back to me. Sir, I'm not so sure I want him in my town, either. I'm not here to defend him or meddle with the past. Then don't, Mrs. Cantwell pleaded. Ernest. He pointed a jagged finger at her. And you be still. I've said all I'm going to say about this. Conway, show this man to the door. Conway opened the office door and, valuing my life, I took my cue. I packed up my photos and clippings and got out of there. I could hear Mrs. Cantwell sobbing as I left, and her husband barking at her. Stop that! Just stop that right now! He's dead! He's dead! Conway not only showed me to the door, he accompanied me clear across the street to my car. I scanned the surrounding street and sidewalks. Some people were still around, meaning there would be witnesses if this guy clobbered me. Unfortunately, they seemed to be making it a point not to look in our direction. We reached the car and I pulled the keys from my coat pocket. Uh, listen, Conway, I'm not trying to stir up trouble. I have trouble, and I'm trying to get some help. If you know anything, let me give you some advice. These were the first words I'd heard Conway speak. Go home and take care of your own problems, but don't bring him back here again. He lowered his voice, but didn't sound any kinder. Justin Cantwell is pure poison. That's all you need to know. I ran him in several times, and I never saw anybody come closer to being the devil than that kid. You ran him in? I'm the cop around here. Oh. That did not make me feel safer. He's probably told you some real juicy tales about us. But he's a liar. He'll lie to you like you wouldn't believe. Everything he says is a lie. I thought of the scars on Cantwell's arms and asked, How did Pastor Cantwell end up in a wheelchair? Car wreck six years ago. He jerked his thumb toward my car door. I unlocked the door and climbed in. Conway held the door open so he could deliver his final message. Get out of town, Mr. Jordan. Get out fast and don't come back. You got it? I nodded and started my engine. Got it. So ended my visit to the Netchville Church of the True Gospel. But my visit to the town of Netchville was not about to end so abruptly. Morgan, Kyle, and I had assumed I would actually be able to talk with someone and would need the time, so we included one night's stay at a motel in the budget. I'd flown all night and driven all morning, and I was tired. I was going to spend that money. I found a little motel at the far end of town and got a room. It was cheap, but it was clean, and the bed was more than adequate for a man whose eyes were burning for sleep and whose heart was pained with frustration. I lay there on top of the bedspread, my wrist on my forehead, my eyes closed. The glaring expression and harsh voice of Reverend Cantwell kept replaying in my mind, as well as the tears and timid pleadings of Justin Cantwell's mother. If Justin Cantwell was the question... The answer was sealed behind her tears and her husband's defiance. I saw in her a mother mourning for a wayward son. I saw in him a dog growling, barking, and lathering from inside a parked car. Precious Lord, I prayed, there's got to be a way. After fifteen minutes of stewing and praying, I opened my eyes. I was in Justin Cantwell's hometown 
until Cantwell himself had an overwhelming change of heart, something on the order of getting saved, I would never be closer to the truth than I was right now. I was nearly exhausted, but could not sleep because I had to know. And I would know. God help me, before I left this town, I would know. I knelt by the bed, and in prayer, grabbed the hem of Jesus' garment. Dear Lord, you've brought me this far. Please open the door. Hi, I'm sorry to disturb you again, but if we could just talk. The doctor's wife didn't wait for me to finish pleading. The moment she saw me, she swung the door open and invited me inside. Dr. Sullivan was sitting in a comfortable chair across from the sofa, still wearing his work jeans and T-shirt. He acknowledged me with his eyes and a warm smile, but didn't say anything. I gathered he was waiting to get a reaction from me. Sister Lois Cantwell was sitting on their couch, clutching a crumpled, wet handkerchief in her hands and weeping. The moment our eyes met, her sobs broke forth again and she covered her face. Oh, praise God! Praise God! I would say so, said Dr. Sullivan. He extended his hand toward another chair. Have a seat. It's good to see you again. Really good, his wife agreed. I sat across from Sister Cantwell. Mrs. Sullivan sat beside her, her hand on Sister Cantwell's, and softly explained. Lois told us about your visit at the church this morning. I had to ask. So where is Reverend Cantwell? He's home taking a nap, Lois answered. I told him I was going to go see Lori for a while. I'm Lori, Mrs. Sullivan explained. And now here you are, said the doctor. We thought you'd left town. I was stunned and afraid to presume what would happen next. How is my son? Lois asked. Now that was a tough question. I tried to consider how I would answer, and it took time. He's... he's all right physically, as far as I can tell. And what is he doing? Tell me again. I took it slow, but didn't try to soften it. He's allowing himself to be regarded as a new, improved version of Jesus. He's performing miracles, healing the sick, the lame, and the blind. He's preaching a new super potent religion that helps people have faith in themselves and what they can do. He set up headquarters at a ranch near town, and pilgrims are coming to Antioch from all over the country. The local economy is booming and people are excited. It was interesting how news that sounded so good could produce such horrified reactions. My God, said the doctor. Lois silently shook her head in horror, then said in a barely audible, trembling voice, I'm so sorry, I added. I believe he's out to prove he can be a better Jesus because he's quite unhappy with the real one, or at least his idea of the real one. Lois absorbed that for a moment and then replied, How could he feel otherwise? Dr. Sullivan leaned forward and asked her, Are we going to tell him? She nodded emphatically, without hesitation. The doctor was at a loss. Where do I start? Lois started, straightening a little, looking directly at me. Justin is my son, but I have to tell you, his miracles are from the devil. All his power comes from Satan. If he has touched or healed anyone, those people are in desperate trouble, desperate trouble. She looked at Dr. Sullivan as if needing his help. Dr. Sullivan began. The, uh, the accident. Lois jumped in again. He was, he was just so angry at our church, at everything we were doing. He hated going, he hated our religion. He went the other way, clear the other way. He, she looked at the doctor again. He's a ticking time bomb, he said. And when he explodes, there are terrible results. He kept looking at Lois as if to get her okay to proceed. I don't know what I believe about the devil, but something is driving him. There's more than just an angry young man. A severe psychosis, perhaps, or... He prayed to the devil. He told me that. Or indeed, something diabolical. Something more than human, more than evil. We had to send him away. He couldn't be around his father anymore. The accident. Let's get that out. Lois fell silent. 
her eyes closed in pain, her fist holding the wadded handkerchief over her mouth. Dr. Sullivan directed all his attention toward me. You met Ernest Cantwell? Yes. So you understand he was severely injured some time ago. He has only partial use of his lower body and impaired use of his hands. His speech is affected as well as some of his memory. Now, he met the eyes of the others. The rest of the town has been told he was in a car wreck, and that's been the popular belief for over six years. He looked at me again. But there was no car wreck. No one has ever seen a wrecked car. The local police never looked into it, never investigated, never reported anything. Excuse me, would that be Conway? They all nodded knowingly. Dr. Sullivan said, I understand you met him as well. Conway Gallippo is our chief of police, and he's also head deacon at the church. He looked at Lois as he told me, I guess we could say he's Ernest Cantwell's right-hand man. Lois nodded in agreement. His muscles, his bodyguard. Lois nodded again. The doctor looked at me. Anyway, he was helpful in spreading the myth that Ernest was in a car wreck. The Cantwells, mostly Ernest, didn't want anyone to know that it was actually... that it was Justin. I vividly recalled the pitiful wreck of a man in a wheelchair. What are you saying? It's, uh, it's the time bomb I told you about. Justin and his father did not get along. We had to send Justin up to Illinois to live with my sister, Lois blurted. We told people it was just so he could get to know the rest of the family. I don't think that story worked very well, said Lori. No, said Lois. People weren't blind. Well, let's not get things all confused, the doctor cautioned. He turned back to me. Justin was 15 when they sent him to Illinois. It was to save him from his father, Lois blurted out. And maybe, just maybe help him get away from all the anger and the hate. Then she added, And it was also to protect my husband's ministry. I knew he couldn't continue the Lord's work with such a terrible problem at home. She dabbed her eyes and continued, Justin stayed with my sister until he was eighteen, and then we brought him back. Everything seemed all right for three years. He acted different, like he'd met the Lord at my sister's church, like he really wanted to serve the Lord. He got active in our church, he sang in the choir, he led us in prayer and prophesied. People thought he'd changed. Somehow, he got along with Ernest. She stopped. I could see the pain of the memory flashing through her eyes. But he was waiting, just waiting for the right time, the right moment. He bought a gym and set up in the basement. He was still living with us, and he kept working out getting strong, really developing his body. And then, it wasn't too long after his birthday, he just turned 22. He found that moment. Lori interjected. But weren't there some woman problems in all this? Lois nodded, obviously sad to be reminded. He was sleeping around. One of the girls was the daughter of a deacon, and that's what set it off. Ernest found out about it and came after him, and... She stopped abruptly, her face and hands quivering. Justin was at home, waiting for him. I just thank God I wasn't there to see it. I was at a women's meeting. I think that was part of Justin's plan, too, to even the score with his father when I wouldn't be there to see it. Dr. Sullivan picked up the narrative. I don't think there were any witnesses to the actual beating, but when Lois came home, Lois broke down again sobbing as Lori put an arm around her. The doctor took a ragged breath and continued. Ernest was in the backyard. He'd been... Now he was having trouble telling it. He'd been beaten repeatedly with a baseball bat. Nine of his ribs were broken. His skull was fractured. He was bleeding from head wounds and unconscious. And... He held out an arm and indicated the forearm just above the wrist. He was nailed literally nailed like a crucifixion to the apple tree in the backyard with spikes about. He held his index fingers apart about eight inches. That long? The spikes were still in his arms when the ambulance brought him into the clinic. I had to remove them surgically. Some of the tendons were severed. 
He had several operations, but never fully recovered the use of his hands. There were spinal injuries that partially paralyzed him from the waist down. It's a wonder he's alive at all, hanging from his arms with broken ribs. He would have suffocated if Lois hadn't found him. I was horrified and incredulous. And people think this was a car wreck? The doctor allowed himself a slight, cynical smile. That's what you'll hear on the street. But there are police and paramedics and medical personnel, and this doctor, right here, who know otherwise. Up to this point, none of us has said anything. Ernest came to this town first, and he still holds the high ground. He can make things difficult for anyone who invites trouble. He has that kind of power? The doctor cocked an eyebrow. The power over heaven and hell, and who goes where, to put it simply. He looked at Lois, but she declined to look back. Be still my husband, she said in a whisper. Religion misused, the doctor continued. It's not uncommon. He has the personality and the followers, the chief of police being among them. With an arched eyebrow, he added, Chief Calippo has his own nasty part in this. So, what happened to Justin? He vanished. We never saw him again. Lois did get some letters, occasionally. Her voice was still trembling when she said, I didn't get my first letter for two years. But he went free. The whole matter was buried. Ernest Cantwell had his ministry to think about. I'm sorry, Lois. No, she said, dabbing her eyes. That's all right. It's true. The letters, I said. Did he have an address in Southern California? Yes, but that was all. He moved two years ago, and I never heard from him since. So he was in the Los Angeles area for two years? Yes, I think that's right. I don't know where he was before that. I believe he went to Missoula, Montana, after L.A., and from there he came to our town just this spring. He's using an assumed name, posing as someone else. He's still running, the doctor suggested, and he's still angry, and still very dangerous. Do you have any idea, any plans at all, to stop him before you have an incident like we had here? I'm not sure it hasn't happened already. What about the police? He healed a war wound of our police chief. They all groaned. But more than the wound has changed. The doctor shook his head in wonder. He hates and emulates his father all the same time. Well, he and his father are made of the same stuff. We all are. But I'm finally getting a clear picture. He's going to self-destruct. They were silent, perhaps a little surprised. But I could see Lois nodding. How? the doctor asked. Have you ever tried to be Jesus? Believe me, only the real one can manage that. Amen, Lois managed. But that brings me to the scars on Justin's arms. Doctor, you said you treated those wounds? Dr. Sullivan looked at Lois, and she gave him a barely visible affirmative nod. I believe we mentioned how Justin was sent to Illinois to live with his sister when he was 15. Again, the real reason was hidden from the public especially from the church. Especially, Lois emphasized, then lowered her head and shook it mournfully. Justin was like a wild horse with no way to corral him. Ernest was determined to have it otherwise, and things got out of hand. What was it you said? I asked Lois. Something about Justin wanting to even the score with his father? You can blame me, the doctor interjected. I treated the wounds in Justin's arms but I did nothing about the wounds to his soul. There was nothing to be done in this town, but I could have gone beyond this town for help. I could have done more. He took a moment to compose himself. But Justin was quickly sent off to his aunts in Illinois, so he thought that would be the end of it. He was several states away from his father, no one in town saw what happened, and the rest of us went on with our lives, keeping the matter quiet. Lois raised her eyes and looked into mine. I found him in the backyard, and I, I held him in my arms. I prayed for him. I sang to him. But the Justin we once knew was gone. He never came back. With frightened eyes, she peered into the past. And we had no idea what kind of creature had taken his place. The doctor drew another deep breath. 
Seven years later, Justin nearly killed his father. Now I realized why Justin Cantwell had warned me, just be sure you find out everything. I shifted my weight forward and said, Tell me what happened in the backyard. I closed the motel room door behind me, rested against it, and let the tears come. I cried and cried, quaking against that door, wanting to slap myself, feeling so foolish, so blind. Forgive me, Lord, forgive me. No, Justin Cantwell and I were not that much alike. Sure, our church worlds were similar. Both our dads were preachers. We read from the same Bible, learned the same doctrines, sang the same songs, followed many of the same rules. But I had never been in such a place as Nashville. And I know I'd never been in such a place as Justin's backyard. 27. Monday morning, Michael Elliott felt called to go for a short, very spiritual walk across the rolling pasture land of the ranch. He took his staff in his hand, wore his prophetic mantle over his head and shoulders, and set out on his journey knowing not where it would take him. God would lead. As he walked along the white paddock fence, past horses, lazily grazing, he looked frequently toward heaven, praising God and listening, always listening, for the next prophetic message, the next inkling of what God was about to do. He knew he must obey every word, he must watch for every sign. The Messiah had come, Antioch was the new Jerusalem, and he, Michael, blessed among men, was to be the Messiah's messenger. I will obey, my lord, he said. But speak the word, and I will obey. I am your servant. His heart soared. He felt filled with God, in tune with the divine cosmic mind. And greater works than these shall ye do. The promise coursed through his soul like marching orders from on high. Greater works. These would require greater faith, greater obedience, but the world would behold and tremble, and then it would change. It would grow. A new thing would occur upon the earth, the news of which would make all ears tingle. Michael raised his staff toward the heavens and sang forth in joy, turning the heads of some steers who grazed beyond a wire fence with bright plastic numbers on their ears. He came to the pond, an acre of quiet water reflecting the deep blue of the sky and the June green of the gentle hills. Mr. Macon had built a fishing dock there, and his old skiff lay on a split rail rack by the shore. Across the water, four ducks paddled in formation, dipping their heads, rustling their wings, and conversing in duckese. This was one of Michael's favorite spots for reflection. He often took the skiff out just to float quietly, lie on his back, and watch the sky. The mud along the shore became his canvas, and his most recent etching, the word Alleluia in Gothic lettering, was still intact, though some ducks had waddled through it. Standing at the end of the dock, he sniffed the natural living odor of the pond, the scent of mud, algae, ducks, and catfish. He received the kiss of the breeze upon his cheek and heard the song of the earth the breeze carried, the rustle of the spear grass, the lowing of the cattle, the murmur of the ducks. Walk upon the water. Below him, the pond was a sheet of glass, and his reflection nearly perfect. Walk upon the water. The voice was the same, the one he had always heeded and obeyed. It brought him to Brandon Nichols. It had led him through the streets of Antioch. It had opened his understanding to the mighty move of God. Walk upon the water. This was the Messiah's pond. He was the Messiah's messenger. All things were the Messiah's. All works, all miracles, all things. Greater works than these shall ye do. As God tested Abraham, Gideon, Joshua, and even the first Christ in the wilderness, so now he, Michael, was being tested. It is mine to obey, he responded in his spirit. Far be it from me to turn away from the voice of God. He obeyed. He stepped off the dock. It was cold this time of year, deep too. He thought he would drown before he finally grabbed hold of the dock and worked his way toward the shore hand over hand. Dripping and shivering, he clambered out of the water, shocked by the cold and by the very fact that he was wet. 
Looking back, he saw his staff floating on the water, far beyond reach without a boat, or another swim. As for his prophet's mantle, by now it was somewhere on the bottom. Father Alvendetti was rather surprised to see a sizable crowd once again sitting in the sanctuary of Our Ladies, visiting quietly, eyes rarely wandering from the crucifix that hung on the wall. Some he'd seen before, in those few days between the first miracle and the advent of Antioch's Messiah. Penny Adams was there, apparently unhappy with her hand, though it looked all right. The young woman from Moses Lake who had leukemia was back without her husband, looking well physically, but strangely ill in her demeanor. Others were new to this place, but Father Al had been told a little about their stories. The exceedingly fat lady who still wanted a miraculous reduction in her size, the young man who couldn't get a million dollars out of Brandon Nichols and still hadn't thought of working, the man who had important things to do, but had to put them off so he could be healed of procrastination, the man wanting to be more sexually attractive, along with his three friends. But Father Al wasn't quite as familiar with the common motivation these and the hundred others freely acknowledged among themselves. They couldn't get it at the ranch, so they were going to get it here. He moved among them, greeting them, asking if there might be anything he could do to meet their spiritual needs. Might he pray with them, or hear their confession? He would be happy to conduct a special Mass just for them. I'm not Catholic. Not now. Uh, you're standing in the way? How often does it cry? Is this going to cost us? What is this, a commercial? Their message was clear. He was intruding. An intruder in his own church. He retired to his office and closed the door, weighing a new fear he hoped was ill-founded. He wanted to believe these pilgrims were the same as they were before, pious, penitent, humbly petitioning. This was Monday morning, he told himself, that time of rude awakening that can bring out the bad side of people. Surely he had only imagined their tense expressions, edgy voices, and scavenger eyes. Even so, an ominous possibility made him shudder. Suppose the crucifix doesn't cry. In the vacant lot beside Mumford's machine shop, Dee Baylor sat alone on the hood of her car, watching the sky. There were no clouds overhead, and only a few near the horizon. But this was where the Lord had spoken. And this was where the joy had been. Now Adrian had her angel, and Mary had become the Virgin Mary. Blanche had long since poo-pooed the whole thing and gone back to church. Brandon Nichols wasn't seeing anyone today. But the sky was still here, right where Dee had left it, and if it took all day to see one little cloud bearing a word of hope to her soul, she would remain here. A car drove into the parking lot, and two couples climbed out, one older, one younger. They had cameras and binoculars and ran up to her eagerly. Is this where you see the Virgin in the clouds? The older man asked. Dee felt her heart soar. The Lord had brought these seekers to her. The miracle would return and she would guide them. This is the place. If you have faith and a willing heart, God will speak to you. The young man checked the sky and smirked. There aren't any clouds. There will be. We don't have time for this, said the older lady. What about the trees in the park? asked the young lady. Somebody saw Jesus and Mary there yesterday. Let's go, said the older man. Dee called after them. But this is the place. You can have it, the young man mocked. And just that quick, they were gone. Dee's heart sank, but she remained there, sitting on the hood of her car. The clouds would return. She had faith. How much do we really know about this guy? asked Richard the real estate broker from Wisconsin. Everything we need to know, replied Andy Parmenter, the retired California executive. He's a messenger of God. No, no, now, come on, that's a cop out and you know it, said Weaver, the CPA from Chicago. There's something he's not telling, warned Richard. Like everything, maybe, said Weaver. They were gathered around the front of Andy Parmenter's big motor home, all three of them in sour moods they'd been working on for days. It hit me this morning, said real estate Richard. Here we are in this RV park with, what, 300 other people? 400, I think, Weaver the CPA offered. I'm still waiting to have my water turned on. I'm smelling the sewage from 60 other vehicles in my row that isn't going anywhere. It's just sitting in the sewer lines. The whole system's backed up. 
and we've got kids crying and couples fighting and radios blaring while I'm trying to sleep. And who's that loud-mouthed prophet lady over in row four? Which one? Moses' sister, Miriam, or Isaac's wife, Rebecca? She doesn't know when to shut up, does she? Who's listening to her? Your point, Richard, Andy demanded. Get to your point. Richard leaned forward and gestured like an angry Italian. My point is, this morning it hit me. I am not better off than I was back in Wisconsin. Back there I had a house and a job and people who looked up to me. I didn't like it. It didn't feel like it was about anything, but... He looked around the RV park hastily laid out on George Harding's property. What's so great about this? I may as well be back in Wisconsin. Andy shook his head impatiently. Richard, you have to be willing to sacrifice. What sacrifice? I didn't come here to sacrifice. I came here because you told me Nichols could produce. He can't produce, said Weaver. Wait a minute, Weaver, said Andy. He healed your bald spot, didn't he? My bald spot? My bald spot? Winnie and I came all the way out here, and she still has her hay fever, and she still bugs the heck out of me, and now my motorhome's in mud up to the axles. And you want me to be happy about a freaking bald spot? So leave! Andy snapped. Uh-uh, said Richard. I'm coming to my point here. You're the one who talked us into this. I sold my house, remember? Said Weaver, who started poking Andy in the chest. You told me to sell my house, so now I'm sitting in the mud with that stupid motorhome in a wheat field with a wife I can't stand who has hay fever. Andy grabbed the poking finger and pushed it away. Don't touch me again, Weaver. Why? You gonna do something about it? This time Weaver shoved him. Andy outweighed him. His shove put Weaver on his back in the stubble. Richard got into the fight, then Weaver again. Andy's neighbor sided with Andy and threw his weight into it. Weaver resorted to straw and mud, Richard to lots of high kicking, Andy to more shoving and a little biting. A bigger crowd would have gathered to watch, but theirs was not the only fight worth watching. Over on row four, Dorothy, who once had arthritis, and Alice, who once had a bad hip, were in the middle of a face-scratching, hair-pulling catfight over whose grandkid broke out a window. And row two had two fights involving six people and plenty of black, sticky mud to make it interesting. And where have you been? Brandon Nichols growled as Michael came in the back door to the house dripping wet. Nichols was standing on a chair while Melody Blair worked hurriedly, pinning the hem of his new white robe. I'm afraid I've taken a swim. Nichols's fiery eyes glared at him through his disheveled hair. You went swimming when I need you? He snapped at Melody. Are you through? just a few more pins, and the people need some enlightenment. They need their eyes opened. Who put their bodies together? Who put bread in their stomachs and hope in their hearts? Tell me! Michael jumped a little at Nichols's outburst, but answered loyally, You did, my lord. You and only you. Nichols gave a slight nod of approval, though the anger did not leave his face. Then we'll have to go over it again for the sake of those who've forgotten. Did you hear there's another messiah in town? There's somebody else telling people he's the Christ. In my town! Michael was quite dismayed. How can this be, when you are the Christ? Nichols glared at nothing, half in a world of his own. Sally Fordyce is a poison to us. She's lying. We'll have to take care of that. And Mrs. Macon, he cursed. I fault myself for hiring Gildy Holiday. Nervously, he swept his hair from his face with his fingers. We've got a lot to do and not a lot of time. Michael, who is the Christ? You are, my lord. Who, Michael? Who is the Christ? You and only you. Nichols leaned, pointing his finger, his eyes like cold white marbles. Who is the Christ, Michael? Michael shouted back. You are! Nichols nodded approvingly. Simple. It's as plain as anything can be. We just need to tell them, Michael and keep telling them until they get it. We're going into town today. We're going to make it abundantly clear. You, you're going into Antioch? Nichols screamed toward the hall. Mary! The voice of Virgin Mary Donovan came from a distant room in the house. Yea, my son, be ready in ten minutes. Then he glared at Michael. Put on some dry clothes, and then go out and help Matt prepare the truck. You're my prophet, Michael. You're going to prophesy.
He reached down and swatted Melody on the head. She cowered, fearing another blow. Hurry it up. At Our Lady's, Arnold Kowalski brought in the ladder. The pilgrims wanted it in place, ready for the next miracle. His feet hurt, his hands hurt, and carrying that ladder up the platform steps was no easy task, but no one in the crowd offered to help. This was his penance, he figured, the price to pay for a refreshing of his own private blessing. His personal crucifix was still around his neck, and judging from the recurrence of his pain, it must need recharging. He didn't think anyone would get upset if he went up the ladder to, uh, dust off the crucifix. He was, after all, the church maintenance man. He'd brought the ladder, hadn't he? For all his trouble and pain, he deserved access to the wonderful wooden image. Setting the ladder carefully in place, he started climbing, one painful step at a time. He could hear the people beginning to stir behind him. He looked over his shoulder and produced his dust rag. Church maintenance? Just gonna dust things off? They didn't seem too sure about that. He reached the top of the ladder, face to face with the image, and began to feign dusting as he carefully, stealthily pulled his crucifix from under his shirt. Leaning awkwardly, he still had the chain around his neck. He managed to touch the big crucifix with his own. Hey! A man yelled. What are you doing? Uh, just dusting. What you got in your hand? And then it started. What's in his hand? What's he doing? People got out of their seats, ran for a better viewing angle. He's trying to steal the blessing. Look, he's got another crucifix. People were running onto the platform for a better look. And they were mad. Get down from there. You think I came all this way? How dare you? The ladder started shaking. Oh, no. Oh, no, please. Arnold cried. A hand grabbed his ankle. Oh! The ladder shook again. Another hand grabbed Arnold's other ankle. Get down from there. Well, if he's going to get some, I'm going to get some. You'll have to wait your turn. The lady who once had leukemia slapped the fat lady, who slapped her back. The procrastinator shoved them both, and Penny squirmed through the opening in the crowd trying to get to the ladder. A mob was forming on the platform, and the ladder was beginning to teeter away from the wall. Arnold was sure he was going to die. There was a crash. A candle stand had fallen over. Now look what you did. Look what I got. Give me that. Slaps, punches, screams. Arnold tried to climb down. Hands yanked him and he fell into the crowd. Now there was a free-for-all for the ladder. Oof. They were walking right on his back. Father Vendetti came racing in, yelled something, waved his hands, yelled again. Nobody listened. A burly character who'd been sitting in the front row reached the top of the ladder and grabbed the crucifix with both hands, making it wiggle on its wall mountings. Is it loose? Someone asked. Loose enough? Yeah, said the fat lady. Why does it have to be up there where we can't reach it? A riotous yell went up from the crowd, and the burly man started heaving and yanking. Father Vendetti ran for his office and the telephone. Guess we're going to have ourselves a little parade, said Matt Kiley, strapping down some loudspeakers on the back of the ranch's big flatbed. The boss likes attention. Ever notice that? Michael was yanking the starter rope of a small Honda gas generator anchored between some hay bales. It wouldn't start. Choke it. Where's that? Matt flipped the choke up. Try it. Michael yanked again, and the generator came to life. Matt opened the choke and then switched on the PA. He spoke into the wireless microphone. Hello, testing, testing. His voice boomed out of the speakers, echoing off the ranch house and barn. Brandon Nichols, you are ready to greet your public. He handed the microphone to Michael. Go on, get out in front and try it out. Michael took the microphone and hopped down from the flatbed. For the first time since he'd knocked on the door of the Macon ranch house, he felt a little foolish. Come on, said Matt. Let's hear something prophetic. Hello, testing. Come on, come on, we're driving through town, remember? Let the, uh... Ears of the multitudes be open before the, the, uh, coming of the Lord. Go out a little farther, Matt directed. We're getting some feedback. This is dumb, Michael thought. He'd never spoken a test prophecy before. He walked several yards out in front of the truck, talking as he went. 
Let those who have seen no mercy now see mercy. Let those who are hungry come and dine. Let the blind see the light of the Messiah come to this place. The back door of the ranch house opened, and Brandon Nichols walked out from under the patio roof and into the sunlight, his image reflected in the swimming pool. His hair was neatly combed, parted in the middle, and cascading to his shoulders. His beard was shaped and trimmed. He was wearing a white robe and mantle and biblical leather sandals. The full sleeves of his robe were just short enough to reveal the scars on his arms. He looked like a piece of religious artwork, and he was ready. Mary Donovan followed him, her robe and shawl perfectly in place, her eyes full of wonder. Let's go, he said. Mona Dillard knew she would lose her mind. As if she wasn't sickened and frightened enough over dirty-eyed Norman, now it turned out that the couple who'd rented number eight weren't really a couple. They were two halves of two other couples, and one of the other halves, a semi-maniacal black belt, was kicking on the door, trying to smash it in, yelling and swearing. Now, now you stop that, Mona pleaded from a safe distance across the parking lot. Where, oh, where was Norman? The brute just kept kicking. Sutter, you're gonna pay for this! Another kick. A woman inside screamed. A man inside screamed something about being sorry and making a mistake and why don't we talk about this. The door caved in. The brute ran in. A woman ran out, hands over her head, screaming, while all hell broke loose inside. A lamp went through the window and landed in several pieces on the concrete. Then a suitcase. Then Sutter. Mona ran to the office to call the police. Adrian Folsom opened the bottom drawer of her dresser and pulled out the remaining stationery she'd purchased for her special ministry. She wouldn't be needing it anymore. Is that all of it? asked her husband, Roger. This is it. I wrote. She consulted a list she kept in the box, counting all the names. I wrote fifteen letters from Alcazar to all these people. Roger was dismayed. Fifteen? I thought he was... Adrian winced with shame and embarrassment. I thought he was an angel of God. I really did. Where is he now? Oh, I don't know. He's a spirit, Roger. You can't just go out and find him. Well, he'd better take his business elsewhere. That's all I've got to say. He shouted to the air. You hear that, Amazar? Adrian whispered. He'll scare Melissa. And his name's Alcazar. He knows who I mean. She looked at the list of names in her stationery box. I'll have to write back to every one of them and tell them to throw the letters away. Roger nodded with a smile. I'm feeling better already. Just then, they heard the voice of their granddaughter, Melissa, playing in the living room. Hi, what's your name? Roger and Adrian exchanged a look, then ran. Five-year-old Melissa and Jilly, the schnauzer, had been playing fetch with Jilly's ball, but now they stood in the middle of the room looking up at... nothing. Melissa was making a face. That's a funny name. I'm Melissa. Seemingly in answer to a question, she looked at Jilly and said, This is Jilly. She won't bite you. Adrian and Roger stood frozen in the hallway. Melissa? Adrian said, her voice trembling with fear she tried not to show. Would you come here, please? Melissa looked their way but didn't move. She was still talking to someone. This is my grandma and grandpa. She told Adrian and Roger, This is Alka Seltzer. That's his name. I'm not making it up. Melissa, I want you to come here this instant. Melissa shrugged and came toward them. Adrian stepped forward, reached, and yanked Melissa to her side. Then she scanned the room, her eyes darting wildly for any stirring, any shadow or sign. Jilly was the best sign. She was still looking up at something no one else could see. Melissa got fussy. He wants to play with me. Alcanar, said Roger. Alcazar, Adrian corrected. Alcazar, get out of the house. Right now. You're not welcome here. Even his voice was shaky. Jilly watched something move through the room, then followed it past the kitchen and toward the back door, her eyes locked on it, panting, trotting, and leaping playfully, but not barking. The back door opened by itself, and Jilly dashed into the backyard. Jilly! 
Adrian cried, running after her. Jilly, come back here! Adrian! Roger ran after her with Melissa at his heels. Jilly snarled and then yelped. Adrian flung the back door open and stepped onto the walkway. She screamed, stepping backward, turning her face away, covering her eyes. Roger grabbed Melissa, but too late. She saw it too and shrieked, burying her face in his leg. Jilly lay twisted and dead on the grass, eyes vacant, legs crookedly skyward, her innards strewn about the yard in torn lengths and pieces. Jim Baylor didn't even get through the police station door before he bumped chests with Deputy Mark Peterson coming out. Hey, whoa there! I'm in a hurry, Jim. Jim followed, almost running alongside, as Mark strode toward his truck. The town had three officers and two squad cars, and it was his day to be the odd man. What's the deal on Sally Fordyce? You gonna do anything? We've got it on the list, Jim, that's all I can tell you. On the list? What's the matter with you? Didn't you see what that creep did to her? Mark was wound up tight and not feeling kind. Jim, our phones are ringing themselves off the desks. We've got fights, we've got riots, we've got destruction of property. Brett's out on call, Rod's out, I'm heading out, and we're still not going to get to everybody. Sally's okay, she'll live. She has time to press charges and go through the process. We can't mess with her case today. He opened the door to his pickup and climbed in. You're supposed to be doing your job. Mark's hand was on the door handle, ready to close it. I am doing my job, or don't you have eyes? I don't believe this. Jim. Mark took a breath, a moment to calm himself. He let go of the door handle. If you'd like to help, you can corral that wife of yours before she kills somebody. Brett just saw her driving through town like a nutcase. He would have pulled her over if he wasn't trying to calm a riot at the Catholic Church. Jim was shocked. You talking about D? How many wives do you have? Mark grabbed the door handle again. Take away her car keys and we'll get to Sally Fordyce quicker, okay? He slammed the door shut and drove off, emergency lights flashing. I'd better get home. Jim thought. I was tired and emotionally spent as I pulled into Antioch. All the way from Netchville to Dallas, then to Seattle, then to Spokane, then all the way home to Antioch. I wanted my couch, if not my bed. Nothing, I thought, would dissuade me from my course. Not the mobs scurrying around the streets of Antioch with their cameras and recorders. Not the people running from the Catholic Church with... Was that a wooden foot in that lady's hand? And were those two guys fighting over a wooden arm? Not the... Oh, brother, was this another Jesus? He was standing on the sidewalk near the laundromat, signing autographs and having his picture taken with smiling visitors. He had the traditional long hair and beard, but he could have put some more thought into his outfit. A tan bathrobe with T-shirt and jeans underneath, and a circle of plastic dime store ivy for a crown of thorns. I rolled my window down and caught his southern accent. Well, verily, verily I say to y'all. No, not even him. Not even... Oh, no. There was a fight going on in the park. It looked like some of Justin Cantwell's followers were having it out with some of Armand Harrison's. They'd been working together on that park, and now they were fighting in it. I just wanted all the more to get home, close my door... Kyle had left a note on the door and a message on my answering machine. I'm sure if I turned on my computer, I would have found an email from him, too. I called him. He said he'd call the others. And I doubled right back to the Methodist church. By now it was late afternoon. The meeting was bigger this time. Not only were Kyle and Morgan there waiting for me, we also had some guests. Nancy Behrens and Gildy Holliday. It's time we laid all our cards on the table, said Nancy. This town's in trouble. I'm ready, I said. We sat down in Morgan's office, and Morgan closed the door. On the west end of town, near the vacant lot next to Mumford's machine shop, Matt Kiley brought the big flatbed hay truck to a halt. Justin Cantwell, robed and ready, climbed out of the cab and took his place on the flatbed. Michael the Prophet, wireless microphone in hand, walked out ahead. The Virgin Mary Donovan took her place behind, and a gaggle of about thirty Macon Ranch hangers-on, arriving in cars and RVs, gathered behind her. Andy Parmenter and his wife were there. Andy looked a little bruised, but they were still believing. 
George Harding came along hoping to improve his business. Melody Blair had brought extra pins along, in case Brandon's robe needed adjusting. She just wanted to keep the Messiah happy. From where he now stood, Cantwell could look south and see the little hill with the cottonwoods near my place, where he first came eye to eye with that pitiful, burned-out former minister. Looking ahead and to the left, he could see the church that minister no longer pastored, sitting on the knoll above the highway. Let's take this town! he hollered, pointing ahead like a general commanding a charge. The band and the female vocalist had quit. Matt had a cassette player on the front seat. He hit the play button, and an old Reader's Digest collection of inspirational favorites started broadcasting from the speakers. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high. Michael stood there a moment, looking bewildered. Matt tooted his horn at him, and he jerked to life. Uh, behold, he comes forth, his power in his hand, to touch this land and bring forth new life. The procession began, and already heads of wandering pilgrims were turning. We huddled in Morgan's office, and although we were alone, we still spoke quietly, as if an enemy could be listening. I shared my Netchville experience with everyone, and if they felt concerned before that, I doubled it. Just got a call from Adrian Folsom, Kyle reported. If Elkazar left, it was on a bad note. He told us about Elkazar, Melissa, and the horrible death of Jilly. I'm going to get over there and get that whole problem prayed through. She's back in the fold, I take it? Kyle nodded, but seemed sorrowful. I'm just sorry it had to happen this way. I need to have a good long talk with Sally, said Morgan. She's afraid to be left alone, afraid her angel might show up again. Well, all of these people need to come clean with God and rebuke these things in the name of Jesus, said Kyle. That's what Bob Fisher told that member of his congregation to do, and the thing hasn't been back. Brett's still looking for the hitchhiker, said Nancy. He's convinced the man, the thing, whatever, was in his house. Then she said something to Kyle that surprised me. Looks like your little theory about demons was right. She caught us all staring at her. Well, they aren't angels. Just take a look outside. Michael kept walking ahead of the truck, staying right on the white line he helped paint down the middle of the street. He is, uh, he's... Suddenly Michael wasn't sure. He forced the words out. Come to him! All ye who are weary and are heavy leaded, are heavy laden, and he will give you best. His yoke is in his hand to separate the cows from the goats and the wheat from the flakes, and his words are a mighty wind to quake the haystocks of confusion that roll through the oceans of grief and pain and, you know, other messy stuff. His British accent was failing him. Now Matt was playing a gospel album by Elvis with the Jordanaires. Then sings my soul. And Justin Cantwell, the Messiah of Antioch, waved to the crowds, blew them kisses, made sure they could see the scars on his arms, and tossed them loaves of bread he produced out of thin air. I am he, he cried. I am he and there is no other. It was working. Cameras were flashing. Camcorders were blinking. Young and old scrambled after the loaves. People were running up to the truck, reaching for a touch and getting one. Come to me! I will hear your cries! I will give you blessing! The tone in his voice and the steely glare in his eyes would have made his daddy proud. Mary Donovan followed behind the truck, blessing the crowds waving to them, spouting any magnificent that came to mind. Magnify the Lord. Let his joy dwell in your hearts, for his time has come. He is our hope. He is our joy. The Macon Ranch hangers-on brought up the rear, waving, shaking hands, shouting greetings, passing out flyers, pointing at Cantwell. Two women sang and rattled tambourines. Now just a minute, young lady. Mary jerked her head around and saw another woman in robe, shawl, and sandals coming toward her, a nasty expression on her face. Uh, blessings and peace to you. The woman aimed an angry, shaking finger at her. Oh, blessings and peace you, you little snip. My boy was here first. Mary looked toward the real estate office and gasped. There was another Jesus standing there, or some young character in jeans and a bathrobe trying to look like him. Whoever he was, 
He was frightfully indignant. There had been a crowd around him with cameras and autograph books, but now they were all moving toward Cantwell and reaching out to catch the loaves he was tossing. The mean, old Mary stood directly in the Virgin Donovan's path. Now you can just turn around and take your big show elsewhere. This is our street. She turned and chased the flatbed, banging on the boards to get Cantwell's attention. Hey, creep! Yeah, you! Get this rig out of here! That finally spiked Mary's ire. Don't you talk to my son that way! She ran after the older Mary and grabbed her by the shawl. The mean Mary quickly showed how mean she could be. I am he! Cantwell shouted at the other Christ, who extended a finger at him and bellowed in a southern accent, Well, y'all just come down off that truck and we'll see about that. From the sidewalks, it was the most bizarre show in town. Two Christs, yelling and giving each other obscene gestures, while their two mothers scratched, tore, and screamed at each other in the middle of the street. Crowds on the sidewalks took pictures and home movies. Glory, glory, hallelujah, sang Elvis. You aren't going to believe this, said Gildy. Everybody thought Mrs. Megan had a stroke, right? This morning she got out of bed and came down for breakfast all by herself. They drugged her. The last thing she remembers is the first shot they gave her. Then she added with a note of dread. And let me tell you, she's hopping mad. The Macon estate owns half the property in this little square mile, I observed. If the corporation's legit and Cantwell's the main stockholder, he could control most of the town. Not from jail he won't, said Nancy. Did you know about the Harmons in Missoula? We all looked at her blankly. Speak on, I said. I've sat on this information long enough. Remember Nevin Sorrell? He was killed, said Morgan. He was working for me, in a way, said Nancy. After Cantwell wowed Mrs. Macon and took his job, he came to me wanting to give me some inside stuff on him. I didn't listen at first. I thought it was just gossip and mudslinging. But once I met Cantwell face to face, I thought better of it. It turns out Nevin Sorrell and the real Brandon Nichols used to be ranch hands together on the Harmon Ranch near Missoula. That's how Nevin knew that our Brandon Nichols wasn't really Brandon Nichols. Whoa, I said. You mean... We're talking about another? Brandon Nichols, as in a real one? A real one, Nancy replied. Buck and Cindy Harmon are good friends with Mrs. Macon. They knew Cephas, of course, and they did business with each other. Nevin came from the Harmons to work for the Macons, and then so did Cantwell, posing as Brandon Nichols, with a good reference from the Harmons. How in the world did he do that? Morgan wondered. Nancy opened her valise and pulled out a photograph a snapshot of some ranch hands leaning on a fence. The Harmon sent this to me. Check out the two guys in the middle. We all leaned in to study the picture. Nevin Sorrell was easy to pick out. Next to him was a young man with long black hair and dark skin, apparently of Hispanic or Native American descent. Meet the real Brandon Nichols. Kyle, I said. Remember Hattie in Missoula? She said Herb Johnson used to ride horses on a ranch around there. Herb Johnson? Nancy asked. Justin Cantwell, I explained, before he became Brandon Nichols. Oh, great. Nancy shook her head in dismay. Another name. She continued. Anyway, piecing it together from what Nevin told me, Justin Cantwell, alias Herb Johnson, visited the ranch a few times to ride horses and met the real Brandon Nichols. They even joked about how they could be mistaken for each other. We looked at the photograph again. It was possible. If Cantwell wanted to call himself Brandon Nichols and get a Washington State driver's license, it's conceivable he could have done it. So Cantwell came to Antioch, posed as Brandon Nichols, introduced himself to the widow, and he had a job. Mrs. Macon called the Harmons for a reference, and they gave her a glowing report of what a great worker Brandon was. And the description was the same. Dark-skinned, long black hair, medium build. Nancy smiled whimsically. The Harmons were a little amazed to learn their former ranch hand was such a spiritual man and miracle worker. They'd never seen him do anything of the kind. No cameras, Kyle mused. Cantwell never allowed cameras on the ranch. The Harmons had never met Cantwell, and the widow had never met Nichols. It was a perfect switch. Nancy shrugged. But I sneaked a camera onto the ranch and got a shot of Cantwell, just as you did. I sent it to the Harmons, and they confirmed. Cantwell isn't Nichols. No way which raises a dark question, 
I said. What happened to the real Brandon Nichols? Brandon Nichols was unknown, with no family, and had no address other than the Harmon Ranch where he worked. He was transient, and moved from place to place, job to job. If someone wanted to slip into his shoes and carry on his life in his place? And use his driver's license and social security number? Added Morgan. You're saying Cantwell killed Brandon Nichols? Nancy returned my gaze. From what you've told us about Cantwell? He may have done more than that. 28. Brett Henkel stood on the front steps of Our Lady of the Fields, notepad in hand, trying to find out what made so many people go so wild. The way Arnold Kowalski was carrying on, you'd think the mob had murdered his mother. It's all my fault, Arnold wept, sitting on the steps with his face in his hands. Father Vendetti sat beside him, his arm around his faithful old maintenance man. Arnold, no, not with this bunch. They were different. They were... Words failed him. Can you name any of them? Brett asked, notepad ready. He'd managed to nab five people carrying various pieces of what used to be Our Lady's crucifix, but the rest of the mob and the rest of the pieces were quickly scattering. Al Vendetti only shook his head. We want no vengeance here. What's done is done. Brett wasn't ready to accept that. Father, they destroyed church property. They made a mess of your sanctuary. And they chopped up the Savior. Arnold lamented. What will we do without him? Arnold. Al patted his shoulder with his free hand. They were the same as you. They thought they could take a little bit of Jesus with them. Well, he's gone now. No, Arnold. We can always buy another one. The handheld radio clipped to Brett's belt squawked. Car one, car one. Brett, you there? Brett tweaked the talk button and spoke into the mic clipped to his shoulder. Yeah, go ahead. Mrs. Fisk called. There's some unknown character lurking around the Sundowner Motel. Might be a peeping Tom. Brett winced. Brother, what more do we need? Then it hit him. The hitchhiker. He hit the talk button. Rod, let's get over there. It might be our man from the other night. Rod came back. I'm trying to break up a fight right now. Brett was already heading for his car. Rod, I want this guy. Okay, I'm rolling. Jim Baylor burst through his front door. D! No answer. D! The other car was in the driveway. She had to be here. He ran into the kitchen. Her purse was on the table. She was home all right. D! I'm in the bedroom. She finally replied. Her voice sounded low and strange. He hurried down the hall. You okay? Mark Peterson says he saw you ripping through town. She was sitting on the end of the bed with his three fifty seven Magnum revolver in her hand. He froze in the doorway. He tried to smile. Hey, D, what's, what's up? Ichabod, she said, her eyes cold and brooding. My life is Ichabod. Our house is Ichabod, and it's all your fault. Ichabod? Who's that? The clouds never came, and the blessing is gone. And it's because you drove them away. You and your spirit of unbelief. Uh, D, why don't you just put that gun down? If thine right eye offend thee, pluck it out. She pointed the gun in his direction, and... He was already on the floor when it fired, and a slug punctured the wall behind him. D! She jumped to her feet, clasping the gun in both hands. Purge out the old leaven and let there be a new lump. Should he wrestle her, try to take the gun? She was aiming again. He scurried, half crawling, out of the doorway as the gun fired and another slug hit the wall. Bang. She was in the hall now, and the bullet went right over his head. He ran. Nancy leaned toward us, her voice hushed and intense. I talked to Pete Jameson, the county health inspector. He never required an additional source of water for Cantwell's building project, so Cantwell never had to develop that spring up in the Willow Draw. But he had Nevin dig a huge hole up there, bigger than was needed. Nevin thought there had to be something else going on besides a water development. But then he had that riding accident and came back dead. I turned to Kyle the same time he turned to me. The car, I said. 
The car, he echoed. What car? Nancy asked. The car that might be buried in that big hole. I answered. Let's go, said Kyle, jumping to his feet. Let's plan, I said. And he sat down again. Rod took the highway. Brett took the back road behind the grain elevators. No sirens, no lights. They were hoping they could surprise. Got him! Rod hollered into his radio. He's behind the building right now! He screeched and fishtailed off the highway, rolling and bouncing through a yard and a flower bed, and finally into the overgrown field behind the Sundowner Motel. Brett came the other way, hitting his brakes on the gravel road and sending up a cloud of dust. The Sundowner Motel was a long one-story building with ten units and plain, evenly spaced rear windows. Their man, wearing sunglasses and a low hat, was standing just outside the ninth window when they converged on the scene. Now he took off, running. Rod and Brett were out of their cars in an instant, Brett closest to the suspect, about to head him off. But Brett was limping on that leg of his. The suspect got by him and headed up the road toward the grain elevators. Don't lose him! Rod hollered, then got back in his car and rolled like a tank through the field and onto the gravel road. He turned left, heading around the block, hoping to block the suspect's route of escape. Don Anderson crouched behind the counter like a soldier under siege, eyes darting about, fists clenched, looking for his next move, his way of escape. The washing machines were rumbling like Patton's tanks, mobilizing, marching, forming a blockade to trap him. The CD players were screaming and cheering, and the televisions with their big gray eyes were watching his every move and giving away his location. Of course, the customers in the store had no idea what Don was so agitated about. Was he just kidding around, or what? No, no way, Don whispered. Not today. The CDs on the rack were scraping and scratching like little flat rats, trying to dig and gnaw their way out of their shrink-wrapped boxes. They wanted him. He was their jailer. The radios were blaring like an angry mob, hopping, rocking, and rattling on their shelves as their ringleader, a Sony surround stereo, bellowed in a deep, slow-speed voice. When Don Anderson screams his last, hear it first on K-I-L-L. -L. You want death? We've got it. We're bad, we're bad, we're bad, we're bad, sang the others. Radio K-I-L-L. Don feared it would come to this. He had brought a baseball bat to the store just in case. Now he intended to use it. A million angry bees swarmed through every wire in the place, fighting to get out, to get to him. The radio-controlled race cars were spinning their wheels, wearing their way out of their boxes, wanting to run over him. The metal detector on the wall was beeping, probing, bending, and weaving like the head of a cobra, trying to send a signal that would fry his fillings. The microwaves were inviting him in. The flashlights were looking for him. The international power converters were trying to step down his nervous system. The remote controls were jamming his brain. And the washers and dryers kept marching, marching, rumbling and rocking, getting closer and closer, closer and closer. Yeah! He leaped over the counter with his baseball bat and pulverized a radio control car. Crunch! Smash! Radio after radio went flying from the shelves. Rattle, crack, crinkle. The CDs flew like frisbees and fluttered like snowflakes. Yeah! The customers cleared out as Don started discounting all the washing machines. Off went a lid. Off went a door. A stacked washer and dryer toppled like a crumbling tower. He smashed away a shelf, then a row of TVs. And then his bat went through the gas line feeding the store's furnace. He smelled the stench of leaking gas. Try to poison me, will you? He screamed, and dispatched a row of clock radios. Michael kept marching along that white line, prophesying to the point of pitiful fabrication. Though an army of evil rises against him, still the goods of his hands and the fire of his mouth will be felt and seen, beginning here and spreading there, and waking people up from their slumber of unbelief, and making them, uh, pay attention to what's going on, for he has come to 
to, uh, do good works in the earth. Brother, what am I saying? What am I doing? Suddenly he heard a vicious, villainous laugh from somewhere behind him, so wicked that he spun around, looking for danger. It was the Messiah. He was leaning over the side rail of the flatbed, pointing and laughing, his teeth bared in a snarling grin. The mean old Mary had come out second best to Virgin Mary Donovan. With her shawl in tatters, her face scratched and her nose bleeding, she lay on the sidewalk as her son in the bathrobe comforted her, and the tourists took more pictures. I am he! the Messiah bellowed tauntingly, his eyes crazy, his hair flailing. Hey, Cracker! he hollered to the cowering Christ in the bathrobe. You're next! Any time, Cracker! Any time! Then he materialized some more loaves and tossed them to the crowds. Come and get it, my children! Come to me! Matt kept driving as another Reader's Digest inspirational favorite played over the loudspeakers. Who made the mountains? Who made the trees? Uninvited, maybe even unseen by Cantwell, big, blustery Armand Harrison got a leg up from some of his men and climbed onto the flatbed. As his followers cheered and the crowd snapped pictures, he smiled, waved back, then held up the Messiah's hand like a referee announcing the winner of a boxing match. We're standing with you, Brandon, all of us. Harrison's people let out one big organic whoop. Justin Cantwell smiled, waved, and eased Harrison toward the edge of the flatbed. Then Cantwell shoved him off, right on top of Harrison's followers, who collapsed like a house of cards under his weight. I am he, Cantwell reminded him, and there is no other. He returned his attention to the crowds. Come to me. Whatever you need, I will give it. I am the one and only Messiah in your future. Matt stuck his head out the truck window. Michael, I don't hear any prophesying out there. Michael turned his eyes forward again. He kept walking, but not a word would come to his lips. Here came a vendor selling picture postcards of Jesus in the clouds and bumper stickers that read, I saw him in Antioch, Washington, or I saw her in Antioch, Washington. They passed a booth where a man sold Antioch build caps and T-shirts that boasted, I saw Jesus in Antioch, Washington. You had your choice, a picture of a farmer Jesus driving a combine or a jazzy comic art face of Jesus between two sheaves. The virgin got a T-shirt, too a more reverent pose of her standing on the curve of the earth, arms outstretched over the wheat fields of Antioch. A barbecue on wheels had come to town, selling ribs and hot dogs, and right next to that was an out-of-nowhere artsy booth featuring little crosses, bookends, napkin holders, jewelry, and even Bible covers made from used lumber from Antioch, Washington? Sirens and screams broke through the din. People started running out of the way, and Michael stopped dead in his tracks. Matt jammed on the brakes. Here came Rod Stanton in his squad car, blowing his siren, flashing his lights, easing from a side street onto the main highway as the crowds scurried aside. He stopped in the middle of the street, jumped out of his car, searched through the crowd, then got back in and kept going. And now here came another Christ. A blonde one, carrying a whip and yelling something about pollution, filth, and greed. He tried to overturn the barbecue on wheels in righteous rage, but it was too hot to handle and too heavy to upend. The owner scurried around and slapped him a few times, this way and that, and he moved on, dragging his whip. He had a mother, too, who followed him, sharing bites of pocket bread filled with sprouts. A skinny pilgrim in a straw hat stepped up to Michael, munching on a hot dog and grinning as if something was funny. Michael, I'm confused. Which Christ is the real one? Do you have a word on that? Michael had no word. No word at all. Then a gunshot rang out, and Jim Baylor ran onto the highway from a side street, scrambling in circles, screaming something about his crazy wife. Behind him came D, waving a gun in the air and prophesying, Thou art a robber and a jerk, and thy time has come! People scattered like frightened rats as she fired the gun and ran by. But then they laughed and took pictures. The sight was so ridiculous, it had to be a show. But wait. A young girl had fallen to the street, her shoulder bleeding. There were screams. 
This was no show. The Messiah was laughing again. Amid screams, running, and ruckus, Don Anderson came swinging and shattering his way out the front door of his store, yelling like a warrior, swinging and battling unseen enemies on every side. A teenager wearing a Walkman happened to be nearby, and Don went after the Walkman. Take that! He shattered the Walkman, breaking the kid's pelvis. Don't let them get you. Take them out. It's every man for himself! The kid's father tried to grab the bat away, and Don opened his skull. A lady in a sun hat got it next, collapsing to the street. Her camera and the wrist that held it shattered. The front door of Don's store was broken and hanging open. Penny Adams saw that as an invitation and stepped inside to help herself. Her life ended three seconds later. Some say she did something to cause a spark. Some say it was Dee Baylor's last bullet that missed Jim and went through the store's front window. The explosion and fireball incinerated any way of knowing for sure, blowing out the store's front windows. Flame and shards shot out, killing fourteen people on that side of the street setting four parked cars on fire, and breaking the windows out of a plumber's supply and beauty shop directly opposite. The Messiah looked behind him to see the conflagration, the burning cars, the screaming people, the flaming bodies. He raised his hands heavenward and rejoiced. Don Anderson, now a block away, saw his own store go up in a fireball and shouted, Yes! Then he saw a hairdryer in the front window of the pharmacy and promptly broke the glass. Roast me, will you? Let me handle it, said an RV lady from the Macon Ranch, who quickly helped herself to the hairdryer. Partake, my people, the Messiah cried, his wounded arms outstretched. The bounty of the earth is yours. Partake. Even as the appliance store and the adjacent structures went up in flames, Windows began to break all over town, some with stones, some with boots, some with tire irons. The people began to partake. Her eyes blinded and stinging from smoke, her hair singed by heat. Dee fled from the inferno, stumbling, bumping into other frantic bodies, trying to run, trying to see. She bowled headlong into another woman, and they both went sprawling. A stolen box of hot curlers broke open, the rollers tumbling and scurrying along the gutter. Now look what you've done, the woman yelled. At that moment, Dee realized she no longer had the gun in her hand. Across the street, another window shattered. Folks started helping themselves to paper, pens, and office supplies from the Antioch Harvester office, while Kim Staples, shrieking in anger and terror, tried to fend them off with reams of paper and boxes of pens. The souvenirs, art, and trinkets fashioned from used lumber from Antioch went next, and there was nothing the poor woodcarver could do about it. The ribs and hot dogs were too hot to steal, and the vendor too tough. The blonde Christ with the whip had encountered the southern Christ in the bathrobe, and now they were duking it out, rolling, kicking, and biting in the street. The Messiah's prophet was cringing and tongue-tied, and the virgin mother was clinging to the back bumper of the truck, towering like a frightened child. Unflustered, even ecstatic, Justin Cantwell threw out some more loaves. Come and partake! He began singing along with the recorded music. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain. The loaves landed on the pavement, ignored. His sheep weren't interested in bread anymore. They wanted toys. No matter. The flatbed kept rolling, the music kept blaring, and Justin Cantwell kept right on singing as the town came apart all around him. Rod floored the gas pedal. After losing his man between houses and trees, he spotted the suspect again and shouted into his radio, He's heading up Maple, the 300 block! The suspect ducked down an alley and through a yard. Rod drove down the alley. He's running through the Wimbley's yard. Should come out right in front. I'm going on foot. He stopped his car, leaped out and started running through the yard as a German shepherd chased and snapped at him, and a cat in his path panicked and ran up a tree. The suspect ran into the street. Rod bolted into the street to cut him off. Screech! A hard steel bumper clipped Rod at the knees, flipping him onto the hood of squad car one. 
he tumbled against the windshield and then rolled off onto the pavement, dazed and bruised, with one knee snapped sideways. Brett jumped out of car one and limped after the suspect. Halt! Halt or I'll shoot! The suspect ran. Brett grabbed his leg, then crumpled to the sidewalk. He pulled his gun, aimed. The suspect was looking back. Mark Peterson darted out of an alley and collided with the man, tackling him to the ground. With a knee in the man's back, he slapped on the cuffs. Brett hobbled up the sidewalk, gun in hand. Mark, what timing? Heard the radio? He answered, yanking off the suspect's hat and sunglasses. Then he backed one step away, surprise all over his face. The suspect was Norman Dillard. Our hushed closed-door meeting broke up the moment we heard the gas explosion. We ran out on the front steps of the church to see what had happened. Several blocks up the street, flames were billowing out of the appliance store, making black silhouettes of the scurrying mobs. The town looked like an anthill set on fire. It's Armageddon, said Kyle. Nancy was down the steps in an instant, obviously concerned for her newspaper office and store. The siren atop the volunteer fire department began to wail. Five volunteers were already rolling out the fire trucks. Oh, Lord, Morgan groaned. Oh, precious Lord, that's Michael. We all spotted him, walking out in front of the big flatbed truck. There was no question who the character riding on the flatbed was. What are we going to do? Kyle asked. Same plan, everybody, I said. Kyle, meet me at my place. I turned to Morgan. You have to go to that engagement dinner. Try to act normal. We'll call your cell phone. Then I dashed to my trooper. I drove right up the center line of the highway and then slowed to a careful, deliberate crawl, weaving my way through the looters with my windows rolled up and my doors locked. I had an appointment with that flatbed, that ludicrous one-vehicle parade with Justin Cantwell waving to the crowds, and the voice of Elvis singing about believing that, for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. Michael Elliott was walking in front of the truck a microphone in his dangling hand, and I could tell from his face and posture that he was having the same woeful awakening I once had. It was time to grab that kid. I pushed forward, braking as a lady ran by with a lamp and two kids ran by with computer games still in the boxes. Broken glass littered the street and crunched under my tires. The whole town was cast in a flickering orange glow. When I was within two blocks of the flatbed, Justin Cantwell's eyes locked on me with radar precision and remained there. I stared right back and kept rolling, not straying from the center line. After one block for each of us, his truck and my trooper came bumper to bumper in the middle of the street, and Cantwell's parade came to a halt. Matt Kiley leaned on the horn. I put my gear shift in park. I had the Messiah of Antioch's undivided attention, and I was going to seize the moment. I wanted him to read in my eyes that he no longer had advantage. I'd been to Texas, and now I knew him the same as he knew me. I understood those scars he was trying to show off. I could clearly imagine the fence in his backyard on that blistering day in Texas. I could see how the galvanized spikes went through those arms and into the fence rail, and how they tore his flesh as he struggled. I could imagine the pain, the terror, the horrible bewilderment of a fifteen-year-old accused of being full of the devil, an embarrassment that needed to be corralled. I understood, and I wanted him to know. He knew, all right. He turned away quickly, but I caught it in those crazed eyes, in that sweating, wild-haired visage backlit by orange fire. I had breached his mystique and, by doing so, deflected his power. That could make me his closest confidant, or his most dangerous enemy. Enough. I turned my eyes away and searched for Michael. He was standing beside my rig, staring as if he couldn't believe what was happening. I lowered the power window on his side. Michael, hop in! He came closer, looking at me, puzzled. I'm Travis Jordan. I know your mom. That turned a light on. Oh, climb in. He climbed in. A loaf of bread landed on my hood. I saw other loaves flying through the air, bounding off the big truck, bouncing off my rig. The loaf on my hood had been bitten into, 
and now green worms were crawling out of the bite. So Justin's product quality had gone south, and people were finding out. I knew that would be the script from now on. It was time to get out of there. I slammed the trooper into reverse and left Cantwell with his public. At the first cross street, I got off the highway just as Brett Henkel and Mark Peterson came on the scene in Antioch's two squad cars, sirens wailing and lights flashing. Was that Norman Dillard in the back of car one? In my mirror, I could see Antioch's two fire trucks arriving on the scene, and two volunteer firemen raced by me in their private vehicles. Crossing Elm Street, I stopped to let an ambulance roll by with its lights flashing. I found out later it was carrying Rod Stanton. The folks along Myrtle Street were out in their yards, clustering with their neighbors, looking up at the black plume of smoke rising only blocks away. I kept driving toward my place, glad it was as far away from the war zone as a home in Antioch could be. I noticed Michael was fighting back tears. When he lost it completely, I put a hand on his shoulder. Michael, let me tell you about the time I took a trip to Minneapolis. Jim Baylor peeked out from the alley near Florence Lynch's boutique. The fire trucks were getting water on the blaze. Brett Henkel and one of his deputies were fanning out, nightsticks in hand and whistles in their mouths. Loot thudded, crashed, plopped and tinkled to the street as the looters emptied their hands and ran for cover. The two scrapping Christs suddenly found they had something in common, their fear of cops, and slunk off in different directions. Jim tried to see Dee through all the smoke, steam and confusion, and finally spotted her. No, no, no. She was joining up with that crowd of Nichols nuts around Brandon Nichols' big truck. They were clambering onto the truck as Nichols and anyone else already aboard reached down to pull them up. They were clearing out, and Dee was going with them. Jim ran out of hiding. Dee! She didn't hear him. Maybe she was ignoring him. Dee! A gray-haired executive in lemon-yellow shorts offered his hand and pulled her up. Jim broke into a run. He couldn't let her go with his bunch. Dee! Wait a minute! Stop! Nichols banged on the roof of the truck cab, and Matt Kiley got rolling, turning off at the closest cross street and roaring away from the trouble. Jim almost tripped over his gun, lying on the sidewalk. He checked which way the cops were looking, timed his move carefully, and recovered it. It was empty now, but he could remedy that. He tucked the gun in his belt, draped his shirt tail over it, and got out of there. Michael called his mother from my place to tell her he was okay and with me, and then we sat at my kitchen table eating microwave pizza. I recounted my story about Minneapolis, and then for good measure told him about my Nashville trip. Hearing my accounts brought him as much enjoyment as a stomach cramp, but it was medicine he needed at the time, and he hung on every word. I threw in some sweetener as often as I could, telling him in dozens of ways that there really was a savior. He just wasn't Justin Cantwell. For one thing, Justin Cantwell was too small. The real Jesus was greater than the best show any man could put on. He was greater than any building you could put him in, or any tradition you could wrap around him, or any expectations you could impose on him. Throughout my life, in a variety of ways, I'd tried to do all four of those things. But now I was learning, again, that it's only when you're willing to know him on his terms, for who he is, that you really start to know him at all. I could see some light bulbs coming on in his head. They were dim, but they were coming on. I was thankful just to have him in my house, quiet and sitting still, so I could work him through all this. When the daylight began to fade, I checked the clock on the wall. Kyle was due at any time, and we still needed a map. Michael, I need to ask you a favor. By now he was ready to tackle the job as a moral duty. Here's the ranch house, he explained as he drew, and the main driveway, but you can't go in that way if you don't want to be discovered. The spring development is in the willow draw, way up and back. It took both cops to contain Don Anderson's one-man war against the great technology takeover. He thought the handcuffs held a personal grudge against him. The squad car meant to slam his leg in the door. The speed radar was aiming at him, 
He could feel it homogenizing his brain. Mark found one fleeting moment when either Don's head, arm, or leg wasn't protruding and got the door shut. Oof! What's gotten into him, anyway? Brett was somber, staring as the crazed appliance dealer screamed and pounded against the car window. He has a bad case of Brandon Nichols. Just like the whole town. Mark surveyed the damaged storefronts and littered streets. They wouldn't know the extent of the fire damage until the flames were out and the smoke cleared. Guess the honeymoon's over. Then he had to ask. But what about your leg? I mean, I'm taking it back. Brett felt his leg, then flexed his knee. It's just about normal. I mean, the way it was before Nichols messed with it. And it can stay that way. Don was still hollering something about the squad car having indigestion in its fuel line. You better get Don to the clinic. He needs a shot or something. I'll lock up the window, peeper, and then I'm going to call the county sheriff and get us some help. Michael sketched everything out, showing me how the willow draw was a small valley between rows of hills two miles north of the ranch house. The hills could be seen from the house, he said, but not the valley between them. Cantwell could have been doing most anything up there without being discovered. Hopefully, Kyle and I would have the same advantage. The disadvantage was the ranch's backhoe. Michael couldn't be sure where it was. The last time I saw it, it was in the low red barn, but the tractor might not have the backhoe attachment on it. They don't have that hooked up when they're stacking hay. Oh, brother. But here's the other way to get in. He went to the opposite edge of the paper. Figure on about six miles across here. He drew the north highway, then a road entering the ranch from the north side. There's a gate, but you can just open it. Make sure you close it behind you, or the cattle will get out. Then you follow this road. The road penetrated vast rangeland, then forked. The north fork led into the hills and the willow draw between them. The south fork led back to the house. What are the chances of navigating that road in the dark? Michael seemed hesitant to answer. Physically speaking? I knew more was coming. Right. There's nothing out there to bump into, except maybe a cow. There, uh, might be another problem, though. Go ahead. It embarrassed Michael to be afraid, but his fear was real, and it showed. When you're up at the ranch, you can feel it. He struggled for words, got flustered, then tried. Have you ever had somebody sneak up on you from behind, and something told you they were right there before they jumped you? That's the way it always feels up at the ranch. Like somebody's there, just out of your field of vision. You can turn your head, but you still won't see them. They don't jump out and scare you or anything. But they're around. And that's why Cantwell always seems to know everything. He has other eyes working for him. I used to think they were angels. He stared into space. And maybe some terrifying memories. I wouldn't go up there in the dark. A knock at the door made me jump. The door creaked open. Hello? Yeah, Kyle, come on in. Michael, have you met Kyle? Kyle strode directly to the kitchen table and gave Michael his best pastor's handshake. Praise God! It's great to see you free of that mess up there. Michael didn't know how to reply to that, but I just indicated the map he was drawing. He didn't actually see them dig the spring, but he knows where it is. I've got two shovels in my car. Grave robbers, I thought grimly. Uh, okay, but what we really need is a backhoe. We aren't going to have all night. Another knock at the door. Travis? Jim Baylor. This was no casual visit. Jim was breathing hard, sweating and agitated, and he was wearing a sidearm. I didn't even have to guess the source of the trouble before he said it. He's got D. He told us his story and we told them ours. Hey, I've got a backhoe, he said. I know, I replied, nodding a strong hint at him. By the look in his eye, you'd think I'd invited him to help us sneak under a farmer's fence to steal some corn. Michael did not look so gleeful. Let's have a word of prayer here, I suggested, and then we'll get started. We gripped hands in a circle, and yes, we all prayed. I got my cell phone and called Morgan. 
She was still at the engagement dinner, but would be heading home soon. Be very careful, she said. I want to see you again. Talk to you soon. I put the cell phone in my coat pocket. By the time Kyle and I reached the north gate to the Macon Ranch, there was barely enough light to see it. The sun had set and only a thin band of pink remained on the horizon. Overhead, the sky was shifting from indigo to black, and the stars were coming out. Jim Baylor got there five minutes after we did, chugging up the shallow rise in his big dump truck, headlights blazing, his backhoe on a trailer. Michael said he'd rather wait at my place, so it would be the three of us. He was right about the gate, though. All we had to do was swing it open. We moved quickly and got inside the fence before any other traffic came by. I felt like I was doing an Isuzu Trooper commercial, taking my trusty rig into the rugged outback over rough roads and uneven terrain, and doing it in the dark, no less. Kyle kept studying Michael's map with a penlight and peering out through the windshield, trying to find the landmarks Michael had noted. The dirt road, still rutted and soft in places, weaved and wound, rose and fell, went on and on. We often passed small, idle bunchings of the Macon herd, resting by the road, grazing in the fields, paying us little mind. Jim stayed right with us, his headlights bright in my mirrors. After five miles, I could make out the soft, roundish lines of the hills that sheltered the willow draw. We came to the grade, climbed, bumped, and wound our way upward, then dropped into a valley on the other side. I saw a distant, vague form in my headlights. I think I see the dead tree. Uh, Kyle checked the map. It should have a feeder on the south side. I slowed and swerved the trooper that direction. The headlights finally caught a white planked cattle feeder with a dozen head of cattle dozing or munching. Okay, said Kyle. Straight on for another mile, then left where you see the willow grove. A mile later, we found the grove and turned left. There had been some work here. The road was wider. It had been scraped and spread with coarse gravel. We came to a wide, flat area. Here's the turnaround, said Kyle. And there's the fence, I said. Michael had come through. I drove into the turnaround and circled to where I'd be out of Jim's way. He rolled in, found a good spot, and shut down his engine. When his headlights winked out, the darkness moved in like a presence on every side, heavy and close almost a liquid we could feel between our fingers. Our flashlight beams seemed pitifully weak in opposing it, like three tiny fireflies in a vast cavern. While Jim set about unchaining his backhoe, Kyle and I went to scout out the gully on the other side of the fence. There wasn't much to see. Apparently this used to be a boggy area filled with weeds and willow saplings. Now it was cleaned and carved out, filled with washed rock and dammed with pressure-treated timbers. A pipe ran out under the dam, with a large gate valve to control flow. It was neat and simple. Clean, too. What are we looking for? Kyle asked. A car. Well, I mean, you know, how do we... I was shaking my head. I don't know. All we could see in our roving cones of light were the wide, graveled turnaround the post and wire fence to keep cattle out of the gully, a little bit of bare brown soil where the gully had been scraped out, and a thin green mantle of grass just coming up wherever the original soil had been disturbed. One fresh, car-sized hole recently dug and then covered over would have been nice. Beyond our little circle of light, coyotes yowled and yapped somewhere in the same valley and shadows, only shadows, provided cover and hiding for any kind of beast or spirit to come close. Was it just Michael's paranoia creeping into me? No. I had some of my own. I'd dealt with Justin Cantwell myself. I knew what it was to be watched by eyes that were somewhere, but not really there. Clang! I jumped. It was Jim dropping a come-along on the deck of his backhoe trailer. He was working efficiently, but for me it wasn't fast enough. I kept my light moving, both to search and to cut through the shadows to make sure they were empty. I could hear Kyle muttering little Pentecostal prayers. It wasn't paranoia. He was feeling it too. 
Jim started up the backhoe, and its headlights and floodlights chased the shadows from a sizable piece of ground, a precious piece of illuminated real estate we could stand and defend. While the engine warmed up and the lights consoled us, he walked along the fence line, eyeing the ground, digging in his heel here and there. What do you think, Jim? The sound of my own voice startled me. He leaned over the fence at the lower end of the turnaround and pointed his floodlight into the gully. This here is fill dirt, fill gravel. He came to where we stood and studied the dam and catch basin. Eh, they didn't work those banks much, just filled in between them with the rock. But lower down? They put some dirt in there. He went to his truck and grabbed a shovel from the cab. Somebody hold my light. I held his flashlight while he went along the fence, stomping the shovel in and spooning up soil every few feet. Eh, uh, yeah, you see that? This stuff here is new. It's Phil. Kyle and I looked at him like two disciples of digging, awaiting wisdom from the master. This shoulder's new. It's all Phil. Let's give it a scratch. He climbed into his backhoe and backed up to the lower corner of the turnaround overlooking the gully, his floodlights illuminating the work area. He lowered the first outrigger, a big hydraulic foot to stabilize the machine for digging. The backhoe tilted as the outrigger contacted the ground. He lowered the opposite outrigger. It contacted the ground and kept sinking, breaking through. We heard something crinkle. Jim cut the throttle on the backhoe and hopped out. We ran up, our lights searching the broken ground around the foot of the outrigger. There was broken glass down there, and beyond that, a dark cavity. Kyle had Jim's shovel. He reached into the hole and scraped out some dirt and gravel. I recognized the chrome around the doorpost and the vinyl roof. That's it? My voice squeaked a little, but I hardly noticed. Jim said nothing. He just climbed into the cab again, repositioned the machine, gunned the throttle, and started digging. Kyle and I stood as close as safety allowed, our lights and eyes following every scoop of dirt he took from atop and around that car. In no more than ten minutes, he'd cleaned out a ditch along the car's right side. Kyle and I jumped in with our shovels to do the delicate unearthing and the wash of his floodlights. Jim's outrigger had shattered and broken a hole through the front passenger window. We cleared away the dirt and then broke out the rest of the window so we could search the car's interior with our lights. We saw nothing but the run-down interior, the seats, steering wheel, dashboard, and ashtrays, still coated with brown slime and river mud. It still smelled like the river. And maybe something dead. We crawled out of the hole and hollered up to Jim. Let's get into the trunk! He jogged the backhoe a few feet sideways and started scooping again, lifting the dirt and gravel out of the hole like big scoops of flour. The car was sitting level and upright, the roof no more than a foot below the graveled surface of the turnaround. Jim moved his big bucket deftly over the rear end of the car, pulling loads of dirt from the trunk lid. The bucket's teeth creased the metal a few times, but we didn't care. We figured the trunk lid was going to receive far worse as soon as the dirt was gone. As soon as Jim took out his last scoop, Kyle and I hopped into the hole to finish the job, scraping and hurling the wet clay. We got the trunk clear, and just to take a crack at it, pried on the trunk lid with our shovel blades. It was jammed tight. I couldn't see Jim behind those bright floodlights, but I knew he was watching. We got out of the hole so he could take his turn. He drove around to the side of the hole so we could get the bucket teeth up under the lid from behind. Kyle and I stood opposite, light beams fixed on that seam. Jim curled the bucket, and the trunk popped open. There was something in there. Jim swung the boom aside and set the bucket on the ground. He reduced his throttle to idle and centered the floodlights. Kyle and I stepped into the hole again, the soft, wet clay slewing and sliding under our feet, our flashlights aimed at the object in the trunk as if they were protective weapons. Now we didn't just smell something. The stench, the thick, nauseating atmosphere came at us like a wave, worse than a dead rat in the attic or a cat's corpse under a back porch, or a run-over possum in the road ditch. I turned away for some fresh air. Kyle was ahead of me. We hadn't even seen what it was. I breathed a moment, 
then tried again, my mouth and nose buried in the crook of my arm. What is it? Jim called. We had only told him about possibly finding a buried car. We hadn't told him what might be inside. Every surface in the trunk was brown with river silt. I discerned the shape of a blanket, silty brown with something underneath. With my free arm, I extended my shovel, dipped the blade under the blanket, and lifted it aside. Ah! I know Kyle didn't mean to holler. It just happened. Jim found words, but I can't repeat them. The remains of a face glistened wet and brown in the floodlights. The eyelids crinkled and sunken into the sockets. The decaying lips shrunk back from crooked teeth. Shoulder-length hair lay matted on the trunk floor, patches of black showing through the brown. Under the mud coating, we could recognize jeans, a denim jacket, and cowboy boots. The throat was sliced open. Kyle had already cleared the hole and was gasping for fresh air topside. I followed, coughing, clawing with my hands, acid rising in my throat. I slipped in the wet clay and fell against the side of the excavation. The cell phone in my coat pocket shrieked and stopped my heart. I rolled onto my back, the rotting corpse before my eyes. It bleeped again. Answer me, answer me. I pulled it out, could barely get my shaking fingers around the antenna to extend it, and flipped it open. Yeah, I gasped. Morgan? Surprise! Terror nodded my stomach, and I fought for air. The eyes were here. By reflex, I searched for them, trying to see into the darkness beyond that pit. Finding nothing, my gaze could only return to that rotting, muddy mask grinning in the floodlights. Cantwell spoke for the corpse, his voice low and taunting. Looks like you found me. I couldn't speak. I could only stare. He became himself. Come on, Travis, say something. Tell me how it feels to know so much. I tried to form a word. It wouldn't come. Maybe you should climb out of there and get some air. The word came. Better. It feels better. He laughed at me. I'm... I'm looking at your bottom line, Justin. I'm looking at what you produce. I've got my answer. His voice went cold. You've got nothing. I am he, and I hold the keys of life and death. Oh, no. You're... You're dreaming, Justin, but it's over. This is the end of the dream, right here. We are not finished with our discussion, Travis. We're not? What could you possibly have to say after this? You mean you still don't get it? His voice was so loud it distorted in the phone. What's it going to take to get through to you? Life and death are in my hands now, and it's my call. I'm not nailed to the fence anymore, Travis, or haven't you noticed? Justin, it's over. No, we're not finished. Take a good look in front of you, Travis. I give life, and I take it away. That means I can bargain with it, so it's not over. I'm not alone up here, remember? That twisted my stomach another turn. Justin? Don't make things worse for yourself. That would be impossible. Don't, don't make it worse. Please, those people trust you. I trusted God. Now give me another reason. 29. I folded the cell phone shut and fumbled to get it back in my pocket as I clambered, stumbling and slipping out of the hole. Kyle and Jim grabbed my hands and yanked me to the top. That was Cantwell, I said. He's got Morgan. Oh, Jesus, Kyle prayed. Oh, Jesus, help us. He's got Morgan, said Jim. What's he doing, taking hostages? Come on. I urged them toward my trooper. There's somebody watching us, and I don't know if it's spirits or... We rebuke them in Jesus' name, said Kyle. Jim drew his gun. What about D? He must have her, too. He'll have us if we don't move. My machine. I don't think they'll shoot your backhoe. It's us I'm worried about. Jim scanned the darkness and saw my point. He ran with us. We jumped in my trooper and I threw gravel getting out of there. The road dipped, jolted, shook us this way and that. 
I tried to steer around the bigger holes and ruts, but I didn't take my time. I didn't have any. I tossed my cell phone to Kyle. Call 911. Tell them about Brandon Nichols in the trunk of that car. Tell them about Morgan and D. Kyle's finger hesitated over the nine button. They're going to give this to Brett Henkel. Tell them it's a... a cult thing. It's big. We need the county sheriff, the state police, lots of help. Cantwell's at the ranch right now with hostages, and he's a killer. We've all seen that. Why is he holed up at the ranch? Jim wondered. If I was him, I'd run. Kyle pressed in the number and put the phone to his ear. He pulled it away. I could hear the crackle and static from where I sat. No reception here, he said. I hit the gas. Well, thought County Sheriff John Parker, I knew it would come to this sooner or later. We should have had a betting pool on when I'd get the call. He was no stranger to the religious movement in Antioch. He and his deputies drove through Antioch regularly. They'd seen the pilgrims, noise, and hubbub. They'd watched it building for months. They didn't interfere. This was Brett Henkel's jurisdiction, his turf, his problem. But now Parker was driving his own squad car behind Brett Henkel's, rumbling slowly up the Macon driveway in the dark. Henkel said he needed at least two cars to show up at the ranch to make the arrest. He needed a strong presence, he said, so Brandon Nichols would know they meant business. No lights or sirens, just presence. Okay, Parker could do that. He'd already sent four deputies into Antioch to help the town's one remaining cop restore order. If things got stickier, Parker was ready to bring in still more backup, even the state patrol if he had to. This cult stuff could get complicated very quickly. Weird, too. Henkel had said, Don't let him touch you, whatever you do. It would be interesting to see how Henkel planned to arrest this guy without touching him. They came over a rise, and Parker saw the ranch house. There were some exterior lights on in front and a few lamps in the windows, but other than that, the place was dark. To the left of the house, dimly lit by some yard lights, were two huge circus tents joined together, and in front of them, a small block building. It could have been restrooms, under construction. To his left was a ramshackle community of recreational vehicles, campers, and tents, gas lanterns burning, some campfires flickering. By the looks of it, this messiah could be booked on health code violations if the other charges didn't stick. Parker smiled sardonically. Yeah getting the charges to stick. That was the rub. Domestic violence, assault and battery, inciting a riot, malicious mischief, holding a parade without a permit, and, this was the best part, littering. The other charges were more serious, but the littering charge had the better story behind it. Henkel and Nichols had tossed hundreds of loaves of wormy bread all over the street in Antioch and just left them there. And where did he get the loaves? Great story. Great story. Henkel followed the paved circular driveway to the front of the house, and Parker followed Henkel. Some curtains moved, shadows hurrying behind them, and Parker quit smiling. With a glance, he checked the shotgun mounted against the dash. This wasn't a high-crime district. They weren't busting this guy for weapons violations, crack cocaine, or bank robbery. Even so, Nichols had plenty of friends up here. It was dark, and as yet, Parker hadn't seen a face, friendly or otherwise. If these people were armed... Without warning, the rear window of his car shattered. He saw the flash of a muzzle from a living room window. He flopped down for cover, his hand wrapping around the shotgun. Another shot, breaking glass. That had to have been Henkel's car. Parker stole a look. There was a shadow in the window, the outline of someone's head. He saw a flash and heard three shots. The right side of Parker's windshield shattered. Another shot pinged off his fender. The situation. An armed assailant in the house in front, a whole community of hostile campers behind. Not workable. Henkel, let's get out of here! Henkel's engine roared and his tires squealed. Parker jammed his own car into gear, his head just high enough to follow Henkel's in a tight 180 away from the house and down the driveway. Two more shots just missed as he went over the rise. His radio squawked, and the dispatcher came on. Something about a body being found on the Macon Ranch.
I was back on the highway, racing toward town and just coming by the main entrance to the ranch, when I saw the lights of two vehicles speeding down the driveway. When they reached the highway, they spun around, halted, and lit up all the lights they had. I slowed. Cops. Just what we needed. Kyle got reception. He was talking to the 911 operator. Yeah, Macon Ranch. He has followers up there and... Looks like Henkel, I said. And the sheriff. I pulled up and stopped. Sheriff Parker ran up to my window. Get out of here, you're in a crime scene. We're at the entrance now, Kyle said into the phone. The caller is at the entrance now, said Parker's radio. We're the ones who called in, I said. My wife is up there, Jim yelled. Parker turned from us and replied to his shoulder mic. Say again? I think we're talking to the sheriff now, said Kyle. The caller says he's talking to a sheriff right now, said Parker's radio. Parker's smirk showed the extent of his amusement. Okay, I got him. They're right in front of me. How's that backup? En route. He turned to us. All right. What have you got? Both Parker and Henkel were ready to listen. We tumbled out of the trooper and then stumbled over each other's sentences trying to tell our story. Morgan slash D slash hostages slash buried car slash dead Brandon slash cult situation slash dangerous. Henkel sniffed a bitter chuckle. We came up here to arrest him for assault. The Sally Fordyce thing. He's got Morgan, I repeated. And he's got D, Jim hollered. So we've got problems, said Parker. We need to contain the area. Where's that other road under the ranch? Kyle pulled out Michael's map of the ranch, and Parker studied it with his flashlight, speaking into his shoulder mic. North 102, mile marker 20, look for a gate, he asked us. How far does this road penetrate before it splits? About three miles, I replied. How far to the ranch house from there? I had to admit I didn't know. Michael didn't tell us. Brett Henkel had a cell phone of his own. He was flipping through his notepad. I've got the ranch's number here somewhere. I saw flashing lights come around the distant corner to the south and more coming over the horizon to the north. Parker was getting his back up. Kyle. I reached for my phone, still in Kyle's hand. I punched in my home number. I'll get Michael on the phone. Maybe he can tell us some of the distances on that map. Brett Henkel got through. Hello? This is Henkel, Antioch Police. Who am I speaking to? Matt? We looked at each other. Matt Kiley. Matt, this is Brett Henkel. Somebody just shot at us. Brett crinkled his forehead. He was hearing a bad response. Now just calm down. You don't have to shoot anybody. Nobody's going to do anything that stupid. We're going to talk about it, that's all. I wasn't getting an answer at home. I ended the call. Is Morgan up there? What about D? Asked Jim. Put your sidearm in your vehicle and leave it there, Parker warned. Is Morgan Elliot up there with you? Brett asked. Travis Jordan wants to know. He heard an answer, then handed me the phone. He wants to talk to you? Hello, Matt? Matt's voice was agitated, his words rapid, as if he were back in the foxholes of Vietnam. They aren't coming anywhere near Brandon Travis. If they come up here, I'll shoot them. Okay, okay, listen. Nobody's moving right now. We're just sitting down here trying to figure out what to do. They're not going to arrest him. That man gave me my legs. Okay, message received. Matt, can I... can I talk to, uh... Brandon? Can you get him for me? He's here. He's here in the house. Well, can I talk to him? He's on the other line. What other line? You know the other line. Line two. We've got two lines up here. Who in the world could he be talking to? What's he saying? Brett Henkel wanted to know. I waved to Brett and the others to stand by. Uh, Matt, have you seen Morgan? Is she all right? D. Jim whispered at me. How should I know? Matt came back. Well, is she there? D. Jim hissed. No, she's not here. Dee's here. She's there, I told Jim. Jim tried to grab the phone, yelling at it. She'd better be all right, you hear me? You touch her and I'll kill you, so help me God. With Kyle's gentle help, I got the phone back. Sorry, Matt. You've got some folks really upset down here. Dee's okay, said Matt. Tell Jim she's okay. She's okay, I told him. But I'm going to do what I got to do, Trav. I mean, I lost my legs once trying to fix the world, and I can do it again. 
I understand. Brett took the phone back. Yeah, Matt, this is Henkel. Listen, we've got no gripe with you, but Nichols has some really terrible things to answer for, some things you don't know about. No, I'm not lying. Matt, come on, you don't want to be an accessory. All you have to do is put your gun down and walk out of there. Why aren't we talking to Nichols? Parker asked. He's on another line, I said. The ranch has two lines. Well, let's get the number. He started signaling Brett. Other cars were arriving, lining the highway shoulder with lights flashing. State police and sheriff's deputies were blocking off the highway, working the airwaves, scrambling for containment. I got my own phone out, praying that Morgan would be at home. How many hostages are up there? A patrolman asked me. Well, I had to turn my phone off in the middle of Morgan's number. It's a religious group. There are hostages and there are followers. I don't know how many of each, how many are being held there, and how many want to be there. Oh, great. There could be as many as a hundred followers. There's a whole RV park up there. Jonestown all over again. Maybe. The patrolman moved on, barking orders to subordinates. I'd never seen so many cops appear so suddenly in the middle of the prairie. I punched in Morgan's number again. Travis? I almost collapsed from relief. Morgan, are you all right? I'm fine. I just came in the door. How are you? Where are you? That conniving liar, I thought. Sheriff Parker butted in. Where's the guy who drew the map? Hang on, Morgan, to Parker. Uh, I've got his mother on the phone right now. Does he know the layout of the house and grounds? If he does, we need to get him up here. We'll send a squad car if he needs a ride. All right. Morgan? Yes, Travis. She sounded impatient. I'm at the ranch. Well, down on the highway in front of it. More sheriff's deputies arrived. Then some formidable police vans. I could see police officers in flak vests and helmets hustling up the hill in the dark, fanning out to contain the house and the RV village. The place is swarming with cops. Are you all right? I'm okay. I'm shaking a bit, but I'm okay. Morgan dropped into the chair nearest the door, not bothering to take off her coat, a flurry of dark possibilities at the threshold of her imagination. Tell me what happened. She heard a quick recap of our excavation, what we found, and how all hell was breaking loose at the ranch even as we spoke. She didn't hear about Cantwell's boast regarding her. Travis, can you leave? I want you to come home. I mean, go home. I just want you out of there and safe. I'm safe, Morgan. I want to see you safe. We need Michael. Travis, we are not talking about Michael. We are talking about you and where you are and how I feel about where you are. The police need to know the layout of the house. You know, rooms, hallways, how to get in and out. Michael would know that, and he's good at drawing maps. Take a breath, Morgan, take a breath. I'm not sure where he is. What do you mean? I called your house, but he didn't answer. Oh, brother. I tried calling him, too. No answer. She was trying not to worry. She was failing. I'm going over there. He might be asleep. He's a sound sleeper. Hey, that's what we can do. Swing by there and get him, and then both of you come up here. You can't be serious. Parker was standing right by me, waiting. Morgan? I still had Cantwell's vicious boast in my mind. I'd feel better if you were here. I mean, I'm surrounded by police, and right now I'd rather you and Michael were too. You got him? Parker wanted to know. Morgan? She gave in reluctantly. The Macon Ranch? Just head out a highway. You'll see the cop cars, believe me. And listen, I told Parker. Uh, Sheriff, I'd count it a great favor if you could send somebody down to my place and make sure everybody's okay, that they get here all right. Where do you live? Parker didn't wait for an answer, but hollered around. Anybody know where this man lives? Hello, Morgan. I'm listening, Travis. I'm still listening. Uh, hold on. Brett Henkel hurried forward, got a quick briefing, and volunteered. Uh, it'll be Morgan Elliot. You know, the minister lady and her son. He used to be that radical prophet. Don't worry. Then he touched my shoulder. By the way, you were right. He ran to his car. Morgan, Brett Hankel's going to meet you at my place to make sure you get up here okay. So just wait for him, all right? Brett Hankel, Travis, were you present when we discussed him? 
He's snapped out of it. He's talked to Sally Fordyce. He's had to quell a riot. He's had to clean up wormy loaves of bread. And now he has a homicide on his hands. He's with us now. Really. Everything was happening very fast, and not at all sensibly. She put on the brakes, took a deep breath, and regrouped. Like it or not, it was time to rise to the occasion and take charge of her part in it. All right, Travis. I'll get Michael and wait for Brett Henkel, and we will meet you up at the Macon Ranch. Love you. Goodbye. She ended the call, then replayed the last few lines in her mind. Oh! Now she wanted to kick herself. Love ya? Love ya? And all she said was goodbye? Travis, how could you do this to me? She turned on her heel and went out the door. She didn't mean to slam it. At least, that's what she told herself. What do you know about this Matt character? Parker asked me. He's a decorated Vietnam vet. He's intensely loyal. He held off the Viet Cong by himself so his buddies could make it out in a chopper. Parker looked toward the ranch with regret in his eyes. Don't. Don't hurt him, please. Parker didn't get a chance to reply. Another deputy was handing him a cell phone. Sheriff, we got him on the line. Nichols? It's him. Parker pushed the phone at me. I understand you know him better than anyone. Talk to him. Calm him down. I hesitated. Just get him talking. Get things on an even keel. I took the phone and gingerly held it to my ear. Hello? This is Travis. My, 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 what a gathering. Yeah, they're throwing quite a party down here. Parker isn't smiling. I glanced at Parker. No, he sure isn't. Not too many of them are. So how are you doing? Oh, well enough. I have my own little family up here, ready to stand with me and go out in a flame of glory. This is the new Jerusalem. We can't let it fall to the infidels. Do they all feel that way? Well, just the ones that matter. Matt, Mary, Melody. What about Morgan? He laughed. Rest easy, my friend. She's not here. Who else, Justin? Who's in there with you? He only sighed. Why don't you go home, Travis? You can't do any good up here. I'm supposed to be the negotiator. You and I are supposed to talk things out. Oh, right! I give you a list of my demands. They say they'll think about it. They cut off our water and power and blast us with loud music for a few days. And then they storm in and shoot all of us. That is what we're talking about, isn't it? Hey, it's your call, right? I told you not to make things worse for yourself. Go home, Travis. What about our discussion? It's hard to speak freely and openly when there are a million cops around. We may not get another chance. Oh, we will. You can count on that. Hey, gotta go. I met your father, Justin. Boy, now there's something we can talk about. Travis! Go home. He hung up. I let Parker know. Parker signaled the men standing by him. Okay, let's cut the power and water. Have those floodlights arrived? On their way, said a cop with police emblazoned on the back of his jacket. Let's get a better phone system going here. Something we can monitor? He addressed me. Can you get him on the line again? I shrugged. I can always ring the number. I don't know if he'll answer. A deputy with a handheld radio had gotten the word. The RV village is secure. He listened further. There's no resistance, and a lot of them want to leave. Parker sniffed a sneering chuckle. Loyal followers, he ordered. Okay, search and screen each vehicle and roll it out of there. The whole village, one by one. We'll eliminate the hiding places and tighten the perimeter. Morgan had never been inside the house, but she knew where it was, and thankfully, she didn't have to navigate the main street through town to get there. The local fire department was out, lights flashing. The ambulance was deployed, lights flashing. Antioch's second squad car was blocking access to the damage zone, lights flashing. And some county sheriff's vehicles were on the scene as well, lights flashing. The center of town had become a major wreck on the highway. Myrtle Street, on the other hand, had quieted down. The porch lights were on up and down the block, and an occasional TV screen glowed blue through a front window. She drove as far as the highway barrier at the west border of the town, and there, on the right, was my little bungalow. The porch light was on there, too, and lights were on inside. The shades were drawn. She went through the front gate, up the short walk, and onto the porch. 
The front door was unlocked. She knocked, cracked it open, and called. Michael? Michael, it's Mom. No answer. She looked over her shoulder for the approach of Brett Henkel, but realized she had to be well ahead of him. The ranch was several miles out of town, and he'd have to drive through some of that chaos on the main street before he could turn off to get here. She went inside to wait, and immediately, unintentionally began to acquaint herself with how Travis Jordan lived and kept house. The living room wasn't too bad. A model airplane, still in progress, lay on a table on the back porch. The kitchen was a mess, with empty root beer bottles on the table, and two pieces of cold Canadian bacon pizza on a plate. The bedroom was just off the dining room, and the door was open. She debated for just a moment, and then stole quietly in to have just a quick look. The bed was made, and that pleased her. The stuffed lion and lamb posed against the pillows made her smile. Books were neatly perched on the shelves, and an aquarium, home to four tropical fish and one tiny frog, gurgled peacefully. She heard a noise and turned. Nothing there but the messy kitchen and two pieces of cold pizza. The bedroom closet was along the wall to her immediate right, closed off with bifold doors. She was tempted to take a peek in there as well, but drew the line right where she should. Privacy was privacy. Besides, there was a smell in here, like body odor. He has some dirty T-shirts hiding somewhere, she thought, and I don't want to find them. Then she saw the picture beside the bed and paused. It was Marion, looking the best she'd ever looked in one of those perfect hair, hand-to-chin studio poses. She walked quietly, even respectfully, around the bed and to the nightstand to take a closer look. This was Marion in her prime before the cancer and chemotherapy. Morgan couldn't resist. She had to touch it, then pick it up, charmed by Marion's smile, saddened by the loss. She could identify. She had a picture of Gabe by her bed. She looked over her shoulder. Nothing there but shelves, a banjo, and the door to the kitchen. Sometimes light reflected off the inside of her glasses and made her think she was seeing something. That must have been what it was plus the fact that she was nervous and still hadn't found her son. And afraid, maybe. Just a little afraid. Not that there was any reason to feel fear, not in this place, not in Travis Jordan's house. She turned her back to the wall and looked all around the bedroom. The only sound was the gurgling of the aquarium. Everything looked fine. It didn't smell fine. But she didn't know what was in that closet, did she? She hadn't looked in there. Well, she hadn't looked under the bed, either. Every child's silly fear. Monsters in the closet and a boogeyman under the bed. Fear for no reason. Enough. Michael? No answer. He simply wasn't here. She walked out of the bedroom. Front door opened. She jolted. Hello, Reverend Elliot? It was Brett Henkel. She wilted. She found some air, drew it in deeply, and sighed it out her hand over her heart. Officer Henkel, you scared me to death. He smiled, embarrassed. Whoa, sorry. Do you know why I'm here? She managed to smile, although she was still trembling. I think we're both here to get Michael, only he isn't here. He immediately turned grim. Where is he? I, I don't know. He's been gone a while, I think. Travis and I have both called him, but there's been no answer. Her legs felt wobbly. She shook her head, trying to clear it. You okay? She pulled the chair from the kitchen table, sat down, and didn't answer until her head was between her knees. A little overwrought, I guess. Too much excitement. I'll get you a glass of water. She didn't trust him enough not to raise her head and watch him go to the sink. He no longer stood between her and the front door. She thought of running. Control, Morgan, come on. Nancy Behrens and Kim Staples made it to the ranch after news hounding and shooting several rolls of film in town. With a word to the police from Kyle and me, they were permitted under the yellow barrier tape and into the thick of the action. The main attraction right now was the slow, relentless parade of campers and motorhomes coming down the driveway, each one bearing a red tag indicating it had been searched. The end of Cantwell's heyday, 
Nancy commented. We don't know how many are still with him in the house, I replied, but he's keeping hostages. Kyle? Yeah? I'll be writing another editorial, something I hope will bring some balance to the first one. Sorry for the trouble. Kyle smiled. Well, praise God. Kyle! Someone shouted from beyond the yellow tape. Travis! It was Bob Fisher, the Baptist minister. He was standing out there with Howard Munson, the independent Pentecostal, Sid Maher, the Lutheran, and Paul Daly, the Episcopalian. We hurried down to the tape and ducked under to their side. They were full of questions and concern. Could they help? Was there anything they could do? Pray, said Kyle. Just pray that no one gets hurt, that somehow the Lord will open the eyes of Cantwell's followers and bring freedom to the hostages. Cantwell? Paul Daly asked. Who's Cantwell? Explaining the new name meant telling a lot of the story. While Kyle began the account, I stepped aside to watch the police setting up floodlights and loudspeakers along the brow of the hill. No doubt they were setting up speakers and lights all around the house. He's not going to like being surrounded, I said. What was that? Nancy asked. I'm not too sure how he's going to respond to being surrounded by all the authority figures. It might be too much like the fence. Nancy moaned. I think you're right. If he feels corralled. Feeling better? Brett asked. Morgan had downed most of the glass of water he'd brought her and was sitting upright. She nodded. I'm with you. Just needed some time to steal my nerves. Her heart was still racing. We'd better find Michael. He probably decided to walk home, to my place. You may have noticed he likes to walk. She saw my telephone next to the couch in the living room and crossed over to it. I'll see if I can reach. Hold it! Hold it right there! She jumped and then she froze, hands half-raised and trembling. She turned her head. Brett Henkel wasn't talking to her. He was looking into the bedroom, sighting down the barrel of his gun. He motioned to her, get back. Turn around slowly and put your hands against the wall. She ducked behind the far end of the couch, her heart pounding. She managed a prayer, only three or four words, then concentrated on breathing. Brett advanced on the bedroom, gun extended. He disappeared through the door. Against the wall! Spread them! Something jingled. His handcuffs? She thought. Morgan heard sounds of scuffling and blows. Books thudded and crashed to the floor. A body hit the wall. She half rose from her hiding place, longing to help. The shots went off. She dropped behind the couch again. A sound like tearing cloth, the impact of a punch. Brett cried out in pain. More scuffling. Quiet. Then feet stumbling, dragging. A hand came through the door, grabbing the doorpost, streaking the paint with blood. Brett's face appeared, twisted, shaken, pale. He stared at her, trying to form words. He gagged and drooled red. She jumped up to help him. He had prevailed, but he was hurt. He... His body lurched forward, and his torso slipped from around a bloodied blade that remained poised in the air the handle invisible within the doorway. He collapsed, coming down on his knees, then buckling forward, his head thumping on the vinyl flooring. The knife entered the room, followed by the hand that held it. The bloodied hand of Justin Cantwell. To the rhythms of peace Today we celebrate Keeps the Christmas spirit alive Let's show those around us some kindness We all need to feel someone's trust Make a wish to shine light in the darkness Say a prayer to find hope, joy, and love This is a time to look back on your life See the world through the eyes of a child Fears disappear into magical dreams That keeps the Christmas spirit alive 
30. Dressed in white, but bloody as raw meat, Cantwell leaned against the doorpost and gazed at her, eyes crazed, knife ready. Morgan ran for the door. A man stood there, near eastern in appearance, olive skin, black curly hair, a wicked gaze. He reached for her. She spun away. The hitchhiker was right behind her, looking pale and dead, his blonde hair hanging limply to his shoulders. He didn't grab for her. He just stood in her path, smiling a toothy grin. She went for his face with the heel of her hand. He wasn't there. She fell forward, off balance. Justin Cantwell caught her, clamping his bloodied hands around her wrists. His hands were cold like steel, their grip unbreakable. He reeked of sweat, the smell from the bedroom, and blood. She struggled and kicked, twisted, but he got behind her and twisted her arm behind her back. His knife went to her throat. Uncle? His tone was mocking and patronizing. The hitchhiker was back, right in front of her. Near Eastern approached from the front door, taking his time, his eyes menacing. She squirmed and pulled, and the tip of the knife poked her neck like a hot needle. She cried out. Uncle? She held still, gasping, whimpering. The knife had to be cutting her. She was going to die. I can't hear you. She formed the word several times before she could finally utter it in a quaking whisper. Uncle? The tip receded. That's better. A third figure appeared from nowhere, dressed in white and looking like an angel. The three came close, lining up like a wall before her. You saw what I did to Officer Henkel? Father, receive my spirit. She swallowed, then nodded. And you see my friends? She couldn't believe it even as she nodded again. So you know your options are limited. As a matter of fact, you don't have any. Oh, Jesus. The knife jabbed her neck. Say that name again and I will surgically remove it. His friends were a vision she could not blink away. Who are they? They came to my rescue and God didn't. We've been a team ever since. Are they? He snickered. Who do you want them to be? Near Eastern suddenly gained weight, turned pale and gray, and stared at her through the sunken eyes of an old man. Louis Lynch, Florence's dead husband. The man in white suddenly wore a dark suit and turtleneck, the same as... His face changed, shifted, became... Gabe Elliot. He smiled and nodded to her. No greater pain could have gone through her heart. No! The police were still waiting for a van from the phone company that would provide extra phones and monitoring equipment. I had to use their cell phone to call the ranch's second line one more time. Hello? It was Cantwell. Justin, this is Travis. I thought I told you to go home. I have to know. Click. Cantwell tossed his cell phone on the kitchen table so he could finish duct-taping Morgan to a chair. The miracle of call forwarding, he explained. But he's going to figure it out. We'll have to be ready when he does. You could have escaped. Morgan said it in a very quiet voice. She had agreed to his offer. If she kept her voice quiet, he wouldn't tape her mouth shut. If she cried out, he would slit her throat. It was a solid offer. The body of Brett Henkel lying in a pool of blood at her feet convinced her. My loyal followers think I did. They're buying me precious time. Then why don't you? He cinched down the last strip of tape around her wrists and stood back to admire her helplessness. I still have to settle my dispute with your boyfriend. If he ever gets here, I was waiting for him, not you and Henkel. What about my son? She thought he would strike her. Your son? The traitor? The turncoat? The coward? Where is he? His anger cost him some strength. His face paled, then he dropped into another chair. 
Don't worry about him. It won't do him any good. I called the ranch's first line. Matt answered. Yeah. Matt, can you tell me how many are in the house with you? About twenty. I got ready to write. I need to know their names. I don't know all their names. I could feel Sheriff Parker's eyes on me. Matt, the police need to know who's up there. You have to give them a good reason not to come storming in there right now. Mary Donovan. I wrote her name down. All right. Who else? D. Baylor. All right. He went silent. Who else, Matt? Brandon's here. Yeah. And there are twenty others. I heard a commotion behind me and turned. A motorhome had come to a stop at the bottom of the driveway, and the door was opening. Jim Baylor stood right below that door and let out a whoop when his wife, Dee, appeared, hopping out and embracing him. They started kissing, explaining, apologizing. The scene should have had music. Um, Matt? Jim Baylor would very much like to talk with his wife. Would that be possible? No. She's with the others. We have them all confined. Jim waved at me as he led his wife away. She was crying, clinging to him. I told Matt. Okay. Then how about some more names? I told you I don't know their names. Then how about getting Brandon on the phone? You have to call the other line, that's what he says. Well, he can't be that far. I felt a turn in the gut. Just call him on the other line. Well, I didn't want Matt to know my own thoughts were running me over, so I forced myself to say, Okay, I'll call on the other line. I ended the call. Parker was muttering something, but I didn't hear it. Cantwell had eyes. He didn't need to be here to know what the cops were doing, or whether Sheriff Parker was smiling. Parker asked me, Well, Matt won't, uh, I'll give it another whirl. No. Cantwell wouldn't want to be surrounded or fenced in. Fences were a big issue in his life. So he wouldn't hole up at the ranch, would he? Are you going to dial that thing? Parker demanded. I dialed the ranch's second line. It rang repeatedly without an answer. And then a recording came on. The cellular phone you called is not answering. Please try your call again later. No answer? Parker asked. I have to talk to Dee, I said handing in the cell phone. Jim, hold up! Jim and Dee waited near the front gate. The loudspeakers on the hill were playing Jimi Hendrix, and the floodlights made it look like a night baseball game was in progress. Television reporters were standing just on the other side of the yellow tape, talking into their microphones and looking back at their cameras. The whole landscape was flickering with white, blue, red, and amber sweeps from the police vehicles. We hadn't finished our discussion, he said, but we would. I could count on it. Go home, Travis. Go home. D? I asked, ducking under the yellow tape to get to them. Is Brandon Nichols up there? She was still wiping tears from her eyes. I don't want to see him. Not anymore. I feel like a fool. But did you see him? No. He wouldn't even come out of his room to talk to me. He wouldn't talk to anybody. People are leaving. He's just... I just want to go home. Jim gave her a squeeze and led her along. Come on, hon. We'll get you home. Thanks, Travis. Thanks for everything. You too, Jim. I took out my own cell phone and punched in Morgan's number. The cell phone you have called is not answering. Please try again later. I punched in my home phone number. My hand was shaking so much that I got it wrong. I punched it in again. I felt sick. The telephone rang. And then, okay, we are ready to talk, said Justin Cantwell. Before I had time to think it, he added, Don't look around, Travis. Don't say anything. Don't signal anyone. I have someone here who'd like to speak with you. Travis? It was Morgan's voice, trembling with emotion, her little rasp unmistakable. Travis, I love you too. The end of her sentence broke apart as she started to cry. So I wasn't lying the first time, said Cantwell. I was just a little early. Do we have an understanding? Not far from me, 
Kyle and the other ministers continued to pray in a circle. I knew I had help. We still have to have our discussion, I said. So come home, Travis. Alone. I'll be right there. I came up with some lame excuse I can hardly remember. Something about being sick, tired, or incompetent, I don't know. But I told Parker I was leaving for a while and ran to my trooper. I climbed in, closed the door, started the engine, then bowed my head to pray, gripping the steering wheel tightly enough to reshape it. I intended to burst into desperate prayer. I was going to tackle, wrestle, and grapple with God, crying out in earnest supplication for Morgan's life and my own and for the tattered soul of Justin Cantwell. I was going to bind and rebuke the powers of darkness and cast them out. I would be waging holy warfare in the heavenlies. It was going to be a struggle. Before you pray, said the Lord. I looked up. It was quiet inside the trooper, and suddenly strangely quiet in my heart. It threw me. What happened? One moment I was ready to leap into the fires of hell and whip in the spirit whatever evil forces might come my way. And the next moment, well, I felt as if I were sitting in heaven. I saw nothing unusual, no visions, no angels, no lightning bolts or faces in the sky. The same cruel, crazy world was in full swing outside my windshield. The lights were still flashing. The cops were still running around, and the floodlights were still there along with the TV cameras. But I felt as if I were somewhere else. How can I describe it? Jesus was in the trooper with me. I would never presume to put words in his mouth, but I felt him saying, Could we take a moment to review? I let go of the steering wheel and listened. Morgan sat quietly, praying only in her mind, her wrists anchored to the arms of the chair, her ankles taped together and immobile between the chair legs. Cantwell was sitting at the table, leaning on his left elbow, breathing hard, the knife dangling in his right hand. Though he looked fatigued, the vicious, animal expression never left his eyes. He had made no effort to clean any of the blood off himself. If anything, there seemed to be more blood than before. A pool of red was gathering in his chair, and he was sitting in it. So you're one of them, aren't you? he asked. One of whom? He leaned forward and held the knife under her chin. You're a church lady, aren't you? One of the reverends. Did Travis tell you what I did to a reverend? His raging eyes were only a foot away. She could smell his breath, his sweat, the blood now spoiling like meat left out too long. Near Eastern, the angel and the hitchhiker were hovering, lingering, present in the room, sometimes visible, always felt. The house had become an outpost of hell. It made the peace she felt all the stranger to understand. She never would have expected this enveloping sensation of rest, as if she were somehow separated by a holy capsule from all that was occurring around her. It settled over her the moment her struggle was over and her options gone, the moment Cantwell's last strip of tape went around her wrist, and there was nothing more she could do but trust. Her voice was steady and gentle as she replied. He mostly told me what the reverend in your life did to you. He leaned back, letting the knife rest in his lap. Maybe he did find out everything. He looked down at Henkel's body. Did he tell you who else was there? Morgan thanked God as she recalled the name. Ah, uh, I think the name was Gallippo. Cantwell looked pleased. Conway Gallippo, Netchville's permanent chief of police. Very good. Travis pieced it together, the part about Gallippo. He figured it would take two people, one to hold your arms, the other to drive the nails. He waved his knife in her face as he lectured. That should tell you a lot about me and why we're sitting here right now. Victoriously, he placed his foot on Henkel's back. This little act of God was for Gallippo's sake. He saw her grimace. Hey, come on. You didn't trust Henkel either. He straightened, 
and looked around the room like a guard dog alerted by a noise. Morgan felt a stirring in the room, a cold flutter in the air, a sense of alarm on their part. Then she heard the slam of a car door. The bungalow looked cozy and inviting. The porch light was on, and warm lamplight created a glow behind the drapes. But it felt cold and sinister, and I knew the devils were inside. I stood by the gate for just a moment, gathering my thoughts and reviewing what the Lord and I had discussed all the way down here, that he and history were on my side. There was never a moment or aspect of my life God didn't have his hand on, and this little adventure was no exception. All I had to do was walk into the house and let him take it from there. I knew Kyle and the others were still praying. I said a last prayer of my own and stepped through the gate. I had never regarded myself as a man of keen spiritual discernment. Sure, I could usually get an inkling that something or someone wasn't quite right. But it was Marion who could sense the presence of a demon and be correct every time. I used to wonder and even ask her how she did it and what it felt like. Tonight I didn't have to wonder. I could feel the presence in my house as directly, as pungently as any man could feel a hateful stare or a poisonous taunt. I gazed at the drawn drapes as if the spirits might be looking back at me from behind them. I glanced into the tops of the trees, a little surprised not to see some shadowy creature perched in the limbs. They were watching me, waiting for me, expecting to play the game by their rules. Come on in, they dared me. I continued down the walkway and stepped onto the porch. I heard some movement inside, the scraping of a chair, Morgan gasping, a muttered threat. I called through the door. Justin, it's Travis. I'm coming in. There was no reply, although I did feel a painful twist in my gut as if I were stepping off a cliff. I took hold of the doorknob. We're ready, they seemed to say. Come on in. Well, I'm ready too, I thought. And we're coming in. I turned the knob and opened the door slowly. The first thing I saw was Justin Cantwell in my dining room, streaked and stained with red, gripping Morgan by the hair and holding a knife to her throat. The second thing I saw was the tape that bound her to the chair. The third thing was Brett Henkel, dead on the floor. I was sickened, but not shocked. I remained still. Cantwell was breathing hard, shaking, and desperate. Hi there. I thought my voice would crack or quiver, but it didn't. It's me. Close the door, he hissed. I closed the door. You weren't here for the first part of our meeting, he said, nodding at Henkel's body. But you can see who's in charge. I raised my hands so he could see them, then went slowly to the chair by the door and sat down. I'm all ears. The ceiling felt low, as if the joists were supporting a mountain. Breathable air seemed scarce. Though I had just come through the front door, I felt it would not open again. The house, with only three living people in it, felt suffocatingly crowded. Cantwell released his grip on Morgan's hair, and she shook the kink out of her neck. By leaning shakily on the back of her chair, he made it to the table. By steadying himself against the table, he worked his way back to his own chair and sat down. Justin, I said, you're hurt. He ignored me. You see, Travis? His voice was weak. I've played a better game. I've healed more sick, fed more hungry, brought hope to more hopeless. And now, I even decide who lives and who dies. People are afraid of me. He slumped forward, his elbow on his knee, his head drooping. And that makes me God. I shrugged. If you can't trust him, be him. Is that how it works? It works. So I see. I can also see you need a doctor. He raised his head and grinned at me. I got what I wanted ever since my backyard. What was that, Justin? 
His head sank again, and he spoke to the floor. Not to be nailed to the fence anymore. I hurt for him, even in the midst of the terror. I hear you. You've been there. You know what I'm talking about. I had to set the record straight. Justin, I haven't been hurt nearly as much as you have. I was discouraged. I was fed up. But you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I do. So where do you stand? Justin, I said, staring at his abdomen. You're bleeding. He leans toward Morgan, brandishing the knife. Don't change the subject, Travis. Okay, easy. He relaxed and I continued. Listen, we were both angry. We were both fed up. We both had wounds and questions. But Justin, my problem was with the church, with all the church stuff. Your problem was with God. There's a difference. His eyes bored into me as he displayed the scars on his arms. I'm perfectly willing to blame them both. I pressed it, hoping I wouldn't set him off. But your father wasn't speaking for God, and Jesus didn't nail you to that fence. He grimaced as if feeling the pain again, then wagged his head. The point is past arguing. I argued anyway. Remember when your mother came home and got the hammer and pulled the nails out? Remember when she held you and sang to you? That was Jesus. He took the nails. He doesn't drive them. For the briefest moment, his face softened, as if he were recalling the moment. I met your mom. I can see Jesus in her. The hardness and loathing flowed into his face again. She's the one who got beaten, torn down, and pushed around every day of her life. It wasn't Jesus who... It was Jesus who let it happen. Don't tell me you can't see that. You've had forty years to see it. I wasn't going to lie. Justin, after forty years of knowing Jesus, and just a few months watching you, I decided I can trust him. He absorbed the blow, then snickered and shook his head. You're just like Mom. You love losing. No, I love winning. It just takes longer. He jolted, his eyes darting about the room, as if watching a frightful vision. I figured his invisible henchmen weren't too happy by now. When his gaze finally returned to me, he was weaker. Well, I love winning, too. Daddy found that out. He waved his knife at the body on the floor. And... And Gallippo? He found out. And God's finding out. He stared at me a long moment, his body swaying like a drunkard. And you're going to find out too, Travis. Just you wait. Oh, I'm waiting, all right. After forty years of serving the Lord, you learn to do that. I relaxed and slouched in my chair. But if we wait much longer, it'll be too late to help you. Let me call the paramedics. I didn't get out of my chair. I only leaned toward the telephone. He held the knife out, showing it to me, sending me a message. Blood was dripping steadily from his chair to the floor. You should have joined up with me when you could. I could barely hear him. You could have beaten God, just like me. His hand went to his abdomen, and he winced in pain as fresh blood oozed through his fingers. I am he. I'm the one. He pitched forward suddenly, sooner than I expected, one hand on his stomach and the other still holding the knife. For a long moment, he lingered there, head close to his knees. Justin, I got up. With a groan, and before I could catch him, he slid off the chair and flopped over Hankel's body, his head hanging loosely above the floor. He still held the knife. Morgan cautioned. Wait, Travis. I stopped a few feet short of Cantwell's dying body. Morgan was looking at something, or someone, across the table from her and directly in front of me. There was no fear in her eyes. Do you see them? I looked around the dining room and kitchen. I saw nothing but the walls and cabinets, 
but I could feel my skin crawling. Who are they? Morgan looked from one to the other as she named them off. The Hitchhiker, and Sally's Angel, and I suppose this one here is Elkazar, the one who appeared to Adrian Folsom. Now she appeared angry. They're laughing at him. Just as they've been doing all along, I thought. The party's over, I said. Get out of here. It felt like a puff of wind, but it wasn't. Morgan gave a little gasp, and I could sense what she was seeing. Evil was leaving the house like a receding tide. The weight I felt, the suffocating closeness of the room, lifted from me. Pain, bitterness, hatred, arrogance. They'd all had their season. But now it was over. It was time. I reached for the light switch and flipped the living room light off and on again, twice. We heard shouts and footsteps at both the front and the back door, and then Mark Peterson and four sheriff's deputies stormed in like commandos, guns drawn, fanning out, hollering to intimidate, positioning, crouching, covering Cantwell from every angle. The swarming and clatter became a silent tableau. Oh, my God, said Mark, sinking to his knees beside his fallen boss. No, no, no. I knelt by the Messiah of Antioch. His eyes were half open, half alive, but not watching me. They were looking into the distance, filled with dismay and the pain of betrayal. I knew he was watching the retreat of his minions, the evaporation of his power. I took the bloodied blade of the knife between my index finger and thumb and lifted it from his hand. By the time I stood to my feet, the eyes bore no expression at all. Two deputies moved in, checking both bodies for any sign of life. One deputy stood up, said simply, That's it. And it was over. He spoke into his radio. Sheriff, this is Jones. We have Cantwell. Repeat, we have Cantwell. He's dead from a gunshot wound. Officer Henkel is also dead. Michael! Morgan cried as I cut her loose with my pocket knife. We have to find Michael! He's outside, said Mark. We picked him up. He was walking to your place to find you. Mom? Came his voice. Mom, you okay? Morgan ran out the door. Michael! Hey, Jones said. Don't leave, you're a witness. Don't worry, I assured him, stepping around all the officers and getting out the door. Mother and son were embracing just outside the front gate. She was a small woman and he towered over her, but she was still his mother and acting like it. You had me scared to death. I thought something terrible had happened to you. Why didn't you call before you left? Are you sure you're all right? I went over to your place, he tried to explain. I guess we missed each other. I glanced back into my house. Mark Peterson and the others were just beginning to clean up what Michael had barely avoided. It made me think of Kyle Sherman and the other ministers praying in a circle. When I looked back, Morgan was finally convinced of her son's safety enough to let go of him. She looked at me. I could read in her eyes what I knew in my heart. But there was no way either of us could say it. We just ran for each other. She put her arms around me and clung to me tighter than would normally be considered a sisterly hug. I returned her embrace, and I wouldn't say I was careful or socially self-conscious either. We just had to hold each other. That's all. Epilogue The siege at Macon Ranch didn't last long enough to even justify the name. The motorhome crowds wanted no trouble, and most of them had already cleared out. The wanderers and seekers in pickups and old cars had already taken their kids and dogs and hit the highway again, looking elsewhere. The reformed and visionary work crews who spruced up the town had long since lost their vision when they ran out of money and moved on. When the police finally entered the Macon house, they encountered no resistance and found only two people inside. Matt Kiley was lying by the telephone in the living room, crestfallen to hear of Cantwell's death and unable to move his legs. Mary Donovan was in her room, still convinced she was the Blessed Virgin and praying for deliverance. They later found Melody Blair hiding in the barn.
By the following summer, Antioch was a different town. Don Anderson had a new furniture and appliance store, and this one wasn't pink. Kylie's hardware was now a true value under new ownership. Nancy Behrens had sold the Antioch Harvester and married the columnist in Spokane. Our Lady of the Fields got a whole new set of pews, a new altar, and a new crucifix. Some remnants of the previous summer remained. The white line Michael Elliott helped paint down the center of the street was still there, along with the heads of wheat to mark the intersections and the rain clouds to mark the fire hydrants. The trees planted along the street were growing quite well, and the townsfolk had pitched in to add some more. But there had been no further sightings of Jesus or Mary in the clouds, in the highway signs, in the hedges, or even in the mildew on the shower tiles, and none were expected. The townspeople had undergone a notable change of mind. They were looking forward now, and saw no need to dredge up and relive the past. I never thought I'd say that about Antioch. By the following summer, I was a different man, too. I didn't fully realize it until I set foot inside Antioch Pentecostal Mission for the first time in over a year. The place was packed, and I was deluged by the same smells, sounds, and sights that had been a regular part of my fifteen years of pastoring. I was a little worried that the old symptoms would return. The upset stomach, the scrambled thoughts, the swelling tongue, the fear of being trapped— but none of that happened. It was actually good. No, I'll say it was wondrous to be in that building again, standing before all those friends and family. When my time came to enter from the right and stand on my little axe of masking tape, I could have remained in that spot for hours, as long as it took to read back from each face a portion of my life. The mandolin player from my band, my old buddy Vern with his second wife, Al and Rose Shiradelli, my other parents, who would always love me and consider me as their son. Some of the old youth group from Northwest Mission, with their wives and husbands and children, so grown and changed that I hardly recognized them. Joe and Emily Kelmer, Joe, still healthy, and his family all saved. Bruce and Libby Hiddle, the only ones who could truly understand our shared tragedy and our shared joy. Jim. D and Darlene Baylor sitting together as a family. To my left stood my brother, Steve, living proof that a man doesn't have to enter the ministry to honor God in every aspect of his life. Behind me stood Dad, decked out in his tuxedo. Tradition did not dictate that he wear one, and he never did for the hundreds of other weddings he had performed. But when he married his own kids, he put it on. That was his tradition. From the front pew, my sister Renee winked at me, and I winked back. I used to wonder what in the world her problem was, but now I knew what she knew. It was never a problem, but a passage. We had come far, these friends and family and I. Most of the journey we'd made separately, but today we journeyed together. As a sweet lady who once sang in a rock band told me, we were what Jesus was all about. Over the years, we'd dispersed ourselves among many churches, denominations, traditions, and little things held sacred. But today, none of that mattered. Jesus mattered. We mattered. And she mattered. Everyone rose to their feet as she entered the room. Morgan's widowed father came all the way from Michigan to escort her down the aisle. Her son, Michael, had a front row seat, and her sister from Florida was her matron of honor. Both our former congregations were there to honor her. As she came down the aisle in a gown of pastel blue, her eyes shining and never leaving mine, I could hear the same voice in my heart I'd been hearing since I was in kindergarten. I carried you, Travis, just as a father carries his son, in all the way that you went until you came to this place. He was still the same old God ordering my life, and doing all things well. You've been listening to the audio production of The Visitation, text copyright 2003 by Frank Peretti, production copyright 2020 by Thomas Nelson. No portion of this recording may be reproduced without the prior written consent of the publisher. 
For more information on other books and audio products from Thomas Nelson, please visit your favorite retailer or visit us online at thomasnelson.com. The visitation was recorded by Blunder Woman Productions in Grand Rapids, Michigan.